Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to everyone joining us to hear. Welcome to Connecting the Dots. My name is Marvick Fernandez, as many call me Marv. So if you guys do need to grab a hold of me, that works as well. I am our senior partner manager here at Elixir, And today I will be just one of the co-hosts. They didn't give me the privilege to be just the only host. So, but I want to start by thanking everyone here for joining us today from all over the world. Uh, for this event today, we have roughly over 15 different countries registered today for this sole event. So thank you for joining. Um, I know COVID-19 COVID is still impacting various parts of the globe throughout, throughout the world. So I, I wanted to take some time to just hope that you and your families are safe, you guys are doing well. Um, and if there's anything the NetElixir team could do to help, you know, please, please feel free to reach out to us. So with that, I'd, I'd love to get, get right into it. You know, why this event, why does NetElixir do Connecting the Dots, and why are we all here today? So. As we start to move from a pandemic world to a post-pandemic world, we really do need to understand that data and experience are not the end all for end all and be all for growing personally and professionally. We need to take the time to learn from each other and take the knowledge that really inspires us to look forward. In today's events, we have various thought leaders from different backgrounds to help us spark one ideas, help us learn from various backgrounds, and then help us face the challenges that, that we face and, and in the end, my, my pun of the day is connect the dots. So overall, from this, we hope that you and, and your team members find something valuable in today's learnings and you practice them in, in your life or even in, into your, your professional businesses as well. Um, before we start, just some, some quick housekeeping. We do have a full team on the back end here that is monitoring the chat and within all our events or webinars or panel discussions. So our hope is to keep this as interactive and as conversational as possible. So if you guys do get a chance to send us messages, if you have any questions throughout it, please don't hesitate to stop us. Um, we'll, we'll happily jump in and address some of them as, as we go on. So with that, I, I really wanted to start off with, with who NetElixir is, right? Where do we come into play? So NetElixir, we help e-commerce brands find and engage high value customers and acquire them through game-changing insights. When we talk about game-changing insights, we want our clients or customers, whoever, to understand what's going on with your data and in the end, allow you to help you make better marketing decisions throughout. We have a slew of, of e-commerce growth solutions all the way from digital marketing strategies, paid search and shopping, paid social, Amazon marketing, search engine optimization. Um, and then the last few that we, that we really dive into is the analytics and the e-commerce tech development side or the MarTech from side of things. On the right, these are just some of the clients that we've worked with over the last 17 years, ranging from food to fashion, really. So anywhere between small business to enterprise accounts that, that we have had the opportunity to work with, we're happy to help answer any questions that you might have about today's world, about the e-commerce world in itself. So, so what is the NetElixir difference? You know, where does where does our team come into play here? Um, I mentioned we have over 17 years of experience, and we have invested millions upon millions of hours into developing the know-how of the marketing world, especially the e-commerce world. We have worked with many, many e-commerce partners, um, e-commerce retailers throughout the throughout our 17 years, and we've started to build a very strong partner ecosystem as well to help not just if you have questions on paid search, but if you need email support, if you need affiliate support, we're here to help in, in any way that we can. Uh, one of our, our one of the, the main things that, that I love about NetElixir is we create a lot of our proprietary tools in-house. One of our tools is our customer customer intelligence platform called LXR Insights, which allows you to understand who your high value shoppers are, where are they coming from, how quickly will they be, be churning, and allow you to make those decisions to retain and hold on to those customers going forward. Um, the last piece is, the last couple pieces actually, is we have a slew of international experience. I know we have a, a vast group here today, but we've had the opportunity to work with customers like Lenovo in over, in over 20 countries. So we understand the know-how about the international landscape and how to address those customers through various parts of the globe. And lastly, um, one of the, the main things here at NetElix is what we love to do is democratize digital marketing. We don't believe that holding on to all the knowledge that we have or the knowledge that we've gathered over the time is, is going to be valuable just to us. We want to make sure that we can share that with anybody so they understand how to best adapt, how to change their, their business models, and, and really grow with, with NetElixir, NetElixir throughout. So 
in, in today's agenda, um, this, this agenda has been, been carefully curated to, to take us through a flow of, of several ideas, right? A, a flow of ideas, insights, and inspiration. So I won't dig into every single piece here, but, but we're going to start off with, with Jerry Wind, and he's going to take us through this, a, a transformation in a time of crisis and, and how to handle that. Um, that's where we're going to really start with the, the ideas piece of it. Moving into then the insights with, with Natalie Zmuda from the, the Think with Google team at Google. Um, and then we'll have a quick break. So with some entertainment from Keelan Les Lesser, he is a digital digital magician. So at this point, you know, feel free to bring in if you guys are working from home, your family members, your kids, pets, if you want, if they're into magic, um, we're okay with that. So we'll have a quick break there. Um, and then following Keelan, we're going to jump right into David Bell. And David's going to talk about how to reach your direct, direct to consumer audience really and how to do that in a very very strategic way as well and then the last couple that we're going to dig into is is alex Cohn and Udain, our ceo to discuss the challenges that the the e-commerce world is going to be facing very very shortly and starting to happen now on how to fix and address this potential roadblock in terms of moving into a cookie-less world and our last piece to to wrap everything up is going to be a, a round table with a lot of our practitioners on what is going on in their changing landscape and how to address those those situations as well. So with that, I'm gonna take a quick pause. I would like to introduce our Udane Bose, our, our CEO and founder here in NetElixir, to take us through one of our nonprofits, the Udon Trust Flight Foundation. Thank you very much, Marv, uh, for the kind introduction and thanks everyone. And uh, for joining in uh, and welcome to all the team members uh, who who really have supported this event uh, and worked extremely hard over the last last couple of months uh, i really wanted to tell, start with a story the start the story of how we really built our foundation uh, we call it the udan trust or the flout foundation and uh, the, the purpose or the goal of the foundation is to help underprivileged girls uh, primarily in india pursue uh, the dreams of a better life through through education. So we essentially sponsor the high school as well as uh, the four years of college. Uh, and then uh, if they are interested, we also offer them a job at Netflix as well. Now, as we all know that uh, uh, that sometimes it becomes a little difficult for us to comprehend the amount of difficulty and challenges that these girls face and, uh, and the overall background and the families that they come up with. So I wanted to share a quick story with all of you. Uh, this is the story of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I. This is the story of uh, a girl called Swati. Uh, this girl right in front uh, with, uh, with a sort of muffler or a scarf, essentially, uh, around her. So Swati, uh, uh, Swati essentially uh, joined our first batch of the Udan Foundation in 2017, uh, 2016, actually. And uh, she comes from a background uh, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, I, I mean, I, I every time I sort of try to mention this, I just get a little emotional. Uh, her mother breaks stones, and Swati's dad passed away when she was four. And uh, she's a, she was an exceptional student even in school. Uh, but however, uh, her mother, there was no way that she could afford her education or even even to continue helping and supporting Swati. Uh, so as things stand in 2017, when Swati completed her 12th grade uh, in India, uh, she had decided, or 10th grade in India, she had decided uh, to get Swati married away. Uh, uh, thankfully, she got into the Udan Scholarship or the Udan Foundation. And uh, now she has completed, uh, after five years, about, uh, the, she is in the, the second year of college. She just completed the second year of college. And uh, what, what really makes me extremely proud is uh, Swati is in the top 1% of the entire college in terms of her performance. Now, this girl probably would have been married by this now and maybe maybe she may have had kids. So I think through the education part, as we really have sort of gotten deeper, we have tried to also uh, get a very interesting perspective or understanding of uh, how, how uh, folks who may not be as privileged as us, uh, really about their lives and so on. And uh, we have gotten to know that in many cases, we may be through education or sponsoring the education. We actually are also supporting uh, uh, supporting uh, a fight against uh, an evil called child marriage. So that's that's what the Udan scholarship was set up for. At this point in time, uh, we are sponsoring 12 girls and they come from a very similar background as Swati. And understandably, I think uh, when the COVID hit, it was a very different magnitude challenge. 
for example, uh, none of these girls really had any internet or any laptops. So I think the first part was ensure that they were all set up uh, to really operate even in a uh, in a remote only world. Uh, we also really sort of pro had to provide for uh, essentially access to free vaccination uh, uh, to all the girls. So which uh, they already have gotten their their first shot. Uh, we we partnered with a leading hospital in Hyderabad, India, to complete that. Uh, where it became even more challenging was uh, many of the girls, their their parents essentially are daily wage workers. And one of the one of the recent reports from the World Bank, I think, sort of mentions it or captures it well, that uh, this this pandemic may have driven about 150 million more people uh, into an extreme poverty situation. So many of the girls uh, come from a background uh, uh, where they are not even making about one dollar and ninety cents uh, effectively what they're living or their families don't really even make that. So understandably, with the daily wage work cut cut off because of the lockdowns, uh, there was no way for them to pay their the the, the rent of the, the the small house that they were living in, uh, and so on, and uh, buy essential items like food, medicines. So we we really sort of corralled together, and the entire entire team back in Hyderabad, uh, the Netflix team in Hyderabad, they all supported supported in terms of buying food for them, paying the the rent of many of the girls' houses, and so on. And last but not the least, uh, we also have Swati and one more girl, Anu, who would be soon getting into uh, the, the, the overall recruitment process for their colleges. So our team also is supporting that. Uh, what I would request to any one of you who may be interested in supporting the cause, you can use this link that we have shared below uh, to really go ahead and uh, make some small contribution. Even a small contribution can go a very long way, specifically in times like this when they need help. Let me uh, let me before introducing uh, one of my favorite people, Jerry Wind. Uh, let me uh, let me also start by thanking all of uh, all of the speakers, presenters, and partners. Uh, we have uh, quite a who's who list in terms of thought leaders, both from the academic world and the industry. And uh, it's it's really a privilege to have all of you here. And the way that you have supported us in doing this event is quite incredible. So thank you very much. I really wanted to call out some of our partners who have been supporting us all through. Uh, and this obviously, UPS is right there. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's a partnership that we have had since 2014 that we cherish immensely. Other than that, we have some other incredible strategic partners, Miva, Redeal, Lumio, uh, Acceleration Partners, and obviously the BWG Strategy and BWG Connect uh, effectively. Thank you guys for your help and support. Now. Uh, I don't know as to how exactly can I introduce uh, Jerry. Uh, I first met Jerry about four years back at Wharton. And uh, I I can probably sort of just give a very simple idea that every time I have had a discussion with Jerry and met with Jerry, I have come up sort of learning something new. And and just somehow there is some interaction. The, the, I don't know as to what it is. It's very difficult for me to really explain this in words. But there is something which inspires you to really think different. So it's my great privilege to introduce uh, 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 Professor Jerry Wind. Uh, he joined Wharton in 1967 and is currently the, the Lauder Professor, uh, Professor Emeritus and Professor of Marketing at Wharton. He also founded the Wharton Think Tank. And in 2017, he was also inducted in the Marketing uh, Hall of Fame. So with that, let me hand over the, the mic to Jerry. Thank you very much, everyone, again, for joining in. Welcome, Jerry. Thanks, Yudan. Um... Thanks for this nice introduction and congratulations on your initiative. I think what you're doing with the uh, Udan Trust is absolutely wonderful and uh, really something needed. So I really hope that everyone on the call will, will listen and contribute to this uh, wonderful activities. Uh, what I would like to do is discuss with you uh, the theme of uh, transformation in times of crisis uh, and post-crisis, or at least part of the crisis we say uh, we are facing has been resolved or is being resolved, unfortunately, not so much in India and other parts of the world, but at least in the U.S., it's kind of, uh, we seem to, to be at the end of this. Um, what I would like to do is um, to share with you the, some of the findings we had in our book that was just published, Transformation in Times of Crisis, uh, and suggest what are the opportunities uh, we face 
especially uh, now when at least we could start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel in some countries um, of the reopening the economy. Uh, but at the same time, we continue to have increased demand for social justice uh, and uh, other crises uh, that face society, like the uh, climate crisis or especially in the U.S., a huge crisis of um, the ideological divide. Um, we, we did succeed in um, dealing effectively with uh, the pandemic uh, in the last uh, 16 months or so. And the question that I would like us to start with is, what have we learned? Um, and I think we've learned a lot in the last 16 months that should help us in navigating our way toward capitalizing on the opportunities the crisis offers. So think about that over 4 billion people worldwide um, stayed at home and work from home became uh, the norm for so many companies, so many individuals. Uh, given the success, it's kind of hard to imagine a situation where now, after the crisis, um, people will just go back to their old uh, habits and go back to work without coming with some type of a hybrid solution of uh, work from home and work from uh, the place of work. Um, we've seen a shift to online learning by old schools and universities. And again, it's hard to imagine that universities will go back just to traditional classroom and not try to leverage the learning they've had. And we can start expecting to see uh, development such as flipped classroom 2.0s, 3.0 and beyond. Uh, we've seen closing of both retail establishments and the huge shift to e-commerce. Uh, the estimates have been that in the first three months of the pandemic of last year, uh, the progress that has been made in e-commerce would have taken like 10 years before the pandemic. Uh, social distancing became the norm. Hopefully we won't need it in the future once everyone is vaccinated. Uh, the area of digital relationship and communication uh, is upon us. Um, they just look at the Zoom that we're now experiencing. And one would expect that in the future, uh, many of the same digital communication, including even selling uh, and negotiation, will continue. So disruption of air travel, while it was uh, almost complete for a while, uh, will never go back to the old way because of the impact of the digital experience we've had. There have been disruption in global supply chain that is leading to rethinking supply chains. Uh, there have been massive unemployment and uh, I think this will actually strengthen one of the trends we're going to talk about, which is open talent. And uh, there have been closing and partial and restricted opening of all cultural institutions, sports and other public events, which have led many of them to initiate new digital experiences and engaging customers uh, digitally and suddenly they realize that their reach is not only locally, it's not only a museum in a given city, but by expanding their offering digitally, they can reach audiences globally. So it has really led to fundamental change in the scope of many of these organizations. Demand for social justice and aftermath of the killing of George Floyd continues and uh, we'll see increased demand for uh, equality, uh, and, uh, and justice. Uh, there is increased concern about climate change. There's unprecedented collaboration among competitors that led to the speedy development of vaccines and hopefully will lead to greater collaborations among companies across countries. And uh, the disturbing fact, the reluctance of so many to be vaccinated, which uh, places a huge challenge uh, to all societies of how to deal with this. So these are some of the lessons we have learned in the last few, you know, 16 months or so. Uh, so our premise is that especially given the crisis and these lessons that we face enormous opportunities. Um, the, the word crisis, uh, as you uh, probably all know, composed of two characters in Chinese, danger and opportunities. 
It was on Churchill who is believed to have said, never let the good crisis go to waste. So that's our theme here. We would like them not to waste the crisis we went through and the lessons. I would like to discuss with you what are the implications of the crisis and the lessons we had and what have we to do now. So primarily I see here three key areas of um, attention. One is coping and surviving the triple crisis. And still, you know, kind of the pandemic is still, you know, uh, a major problem in India and other countries. Uh, and we still have to, to deal with this, but we have to deal also with the other related crisis we have. Uh, the second aspect is how do we capture the opportunities the crisis offers? And that's where the focus of my discussion is going to be, even though it's obviously will have some implication to what you can do now in kind of the first area. And the third is how to anticipate and prepare for the next crisis, which I think is um, an important consideration for everyone once we address the first two issues. So the objective of our session is to encourage and inspire you to create opportunities that are offered by the crisis and the lessons we have from dealing with this. And to realize that we cannot just go back to life as we knew before the start of the crisis. Uh, our approach in the session is to propose eight principles to catch opportunities in time of crisis. These are the eight principles in the book. Uh, and I will try to do it actually pretty fast uh, to allow a lot of time to Q&A and discussion, and ideally to be able to identify potential experiments that one can take uh, to try to implement some of the ideas we're going to discuss. Uh, and we'll devote most of our time, actually, to this discussion. It's going to be an interactive session. And the reason for this is, uh, in events like this, it's nice, you, you may want to double task, you know, your head, yeah, it makes sense. You're really not gaining much from this unless you will try to apply the ideas, unless you'll try to implement it. And there's no better way of implementing than designing experiments to try to do it. The value of experimentation is that typically you design it with a control group, so it allows you to the, the, come up with causal link between what you're doing and the results that you're getting. Uh, typically, you don't want to experiment with trivial variation around what you do, so you want it will enhance uh, innovation and in coming up with more innovative ideas. And it will create an amazing corporate culture that enhances innovation. Uh, there is nothing better than experimentation and creating, insisting on experimentation throughout the operation uh, to attract the right type of talent and create an energy in the organization that's centered around innovation. Uh, it also forces you to measure the results of what you're doing. You cannot do experiments unless you are coming up with specific measures. So uh, what I really would hope we'll get out of the session is some inspiration from the first part of the discussion and then a rich discussion centered around, so what can we do with some of these ideas? And at the end, I'll take the last few minutes to ask you to reflect and identify what is the takeaway that you can take away from the session as you move forward. So let's start with uh, the principles uh, that we propose as guideline for capturing opportunities in times of crisis and beyond. The first one is the challenging and changing your mental models. Uh, the mental model, which is, let's just go back to work the way it was before. A lot of companies even calling this, get back to work. I think it's the wrong mental model. Uh, we cannot just go back to the world pre-March of last year. Uh, the world has changed, as we discussed before, we reviewed the, uh, the lessons that we had. When you have work from home, when you have the communication via Zoom and other digital devices, when you have e-commerce dominant, when you have e-learning, uh, telemedicine and the like, you cannot just ignore the experience we had with this and go back. You have to rethink the new reality. We are facing a new reality. And keep in mind that all of the really successful companies, the Google, the Microsoft, the uh, Amazon, uh, all of them 
continuously experiment. They're running thousands of experiments. Every single decision they make is based on results of experimentation. So start thinking about experimentation with new type of mental models. And when you think about the, the real the disruptive companies, you know, think about um, uh, Uber, for example, Airbnb, what have they done? All of these disruptive companies challenged and changed the mental model of their industry. So the, the first task and the most fundamental uh, that I would like you to explore is, what is your mental model? Is it still appropriate for the today's environment, for the new reality? And how can you change it? What will be the needed changes to the mental model? That how can you become not only a defensive uh, player, but actually a disruptor in your industry? So point one, let's think about your mental models. How can you challenge them? And how can you change them to try to capitalize on the opportunities facing us. The second uh, principle and suggestion is to reimagine and to reinvent your approach to the customers and to the stakeholders. So there are two components here. Customer centricity has been argued for years. There's nothing new about this. But the customers are changing continuously. The customers are much more empowered. They're much more skeptical. And as a result of the crisis, also a lot of the studies in the last few years, the last year and a half or so, show that they're very uncertain. But at the same time, they're all considering kind of basically almost to re-examine their life, to re-examine what they're doing. Is this really the right thing? Should they really continue doing, you know, kind of the, what they have been, been doing before? Um, and there is the changes in technology that we envision uh, and kind of experience all the time. The, the shift to cloud, to mobile, uh, the, the regular use of apps, the kind of the advances in AI, including emotional AI, are such that they're really in, enriching and allowing the consumers to be much more empowered uh, in the balance of the relationship between the consumer and the retailer or the manufacturer or kind of the firm in general. Uh, so the point one here is really, we have to take really seriously the consumer and design all our strategies starting with the consumer. What are their needs, expectations? Uh, how are they changing? What are kind of the evolving needs and expectations of the consumers? And even think about how can we start benefiting for co-creating experiences and with the customer. So as opposed to we doing everything and sending it to them, how can we co-create the experience with them? How can we create a platform that allow them to customize the product the way they want it? Because one of the things we know, for example, about consumers is that they are all looking in today's environment for real-time customized experience. They're really looking for a real-time personalized experiences. How can we provide it for them? What are the implications? At the same time, there is a major shift in uh, society in the move away from the traditional shareholder orientation to a stakeholder orientation. And the stakeholder orientation is uh, a significant shift. It's kind of uh, a reaction to some of the ills of society and realizing that uh, a firm, any organization, should really address the needs and evolving needs of all their stakeholders, their customers predominantly, but also their employees, their partners, uh, the shareholders being one of them. And very important is having a positive social impact on society. And that's what have led uh, recently to a lot of focus on a purpose-led organization and asking what is the purpose that drives the organization. And uh, so whatever you're doing, think about the, uh, the doing uh, good for society is not just a philanthropic activity, but how do you integrate it as part of your activities? And uh, the, the, whole, the example of the B Corporation that are moving this area is really a great example for companies that are focusing on this. Uh, the third principle that I would like to suggest is um, really divided, uh, includes uh, three components here. The one is the importance of speed. Uh, and speed is really critical in today's environment. The changes are so rapid 
that you cannot just take the kind of the time and the traditional approach of analysis uh, and then designing a strategy and moving forward. You really have to design a much more uh, rapid, agile system and uh, approach that will allow you to respond much faster to the changes in the environment. Um, the second component here is uh, the speed has to be with respect to everything you do, but especially digital transformation. And um, those organizations that had the right digital infrastructure were able to respond much faster it's much, much more effectively during the crisis to the need to change and engage the audiences uh, digitally than those who did not. Uh, in the cultural institution area, for example, in organizations such as the Barnes Foundation had a much better digital infrastructure than the Philadelphia Museum of Art. As a result, they were able to engage audiences from day one, attract new audiences globally, improve even their fundraising at a time that the Philadelphia Museum of Art was very, very slow in moving and responding and trying to engage their customers. And the same applies to any organization. And the third component here is as we design the new system, as we transform ourselves, how can we do it in a way that we can personalize um, our offering at scale. I mentioned before we talk about the consumer that one of the things consumer want today is uh, real-time personalized experience. Uh, so the question is, how do we move away from the one-size-fits-all to developing platforms that the, the digital transformation allowing us to do that allow personalization at scale uh, addressing consumer needs? Uh, the fourth area is uh, the reinvent your talent strategy and embrace open innovation and open talent. Uh, the key to this is that um, the value and benefits of open innovation and open talent uh, has been proven. Um, they, there are a number of factors contributing to this. Uh, number one is increasing number of uh, uh, people do not want to work for companies. Uh, that's what's called the gig economy. And the gig economy is increasing significantly. It's uh, estimated that it's close to one third of all the workforce in the US and it's growing. Some of the projections suggesting that in a few years it will approach almost like 50% of the workforce that does not want to work for companies. Uh, second and very important is the fact uh, that many of the challenges you face may have already been solved somewhere else in the world. So as opposed to trying to just uh, kind of struggle and try to develop it from scratch, let's try to find, you know, kind of the solutions that exist already somewhere else in the world. Uh, there have been a number of uh, recent studies that suggest that the value of open innovation compared to doing the same job internally with internal talent is uh, quite amazing. Uh, the data suggests that we have uh, four to five X, four to five times the speed of achieving the solution. And we have eight to 10 X the cost savings compared to doing it internally. And major companies, if you think about NASA, you know, kind of NASA probably does not have that much of a problem of attracting the talent they want compared to most other companies because it's a much more exotic and exciting uh, company to work for. But even NASA, that has 17,000 employees, use extensively open innovation. So whenever they have a challenge that they cannot solve internally, they set it out as a challenge to the world. And they have, when you look at the, the organizational structure of NASA, it's in a sense the 17,000 employees, but close to a million participants in the open innovation talents that they have, the network of talent that they can attract. Uh, so open innovation is uh, a real breakthrough. And when you think about this, uh, some of the most talented people are not necessarily the ones that are likely to work for your company. If you think about software development as an example, uh, average software developer is the type of person that you probably can attract to your firm. 
But the difference in productivity between the average software developer and the extreme talent, the really the top talent in this area, is well documented to be 10x. Imagine the difference when you're accessing through open innovation and open talent, the 10x capability compared to what you can hire internally. And a key factor, you're paying only for the results. So if you're establishing a open competition, uh, you're paying only for the one that came up with the results as opposed to paying for all the efforts to try to get there. That's the reason that most pharmaceutical companies, most companies are moving toward using open innovation. That's the reason that there are aggregators, companies like Top Coder or Innocentive that have over a million uh, independent gig economy in inventors part of their network and they can help you um, access them. Uh, the other rationale behind open innovation, open talent is that it's well known that most problems require an interdisciplinary perspective. And actually, Innocenti ran a study a few years back and tried to find out how come they're so successful. And they found out they were successful because the open innovation approach attracts people from different disciplines. And when you set up a challenge, the people who solve the challenge are typically from other disciplines and not the core discipline you are. So for example, if Eli Lilly, which is a frequent user of open innovation, set up a medical challenge out there, many times the solutions are coming from people from outside the medical field. In fact, recently there was a challenge given by Merck and the solution to this medical problem was solved by uh, three computer scientists from MIT. Uh, so again, showing you the, the fact of the value of external perspective. Uh, and uh, the domain of open innovation applies not only in the software development area, but in all domains, every activity you're doing. So there was a company a few years ago started like Victor and Spoils, that had, for example, over 7,000 creatives. It's an advertising agency. And when you had an advertising challenge, you send it to the creatives and you used to get like hundreds of responses. And if you've seen the commercials for Harley Davidson of no cages, this is an example of one of the ads that were developed through open innovation. Uh, so the implication for the talent strategy of the organization is, as opposed to just saying, okay, what talent do I have to hire? It's basically saying, what talent, talent can I get from the outside, from the open talent world and open innovation? And what are the implications to the type of competencies that I need internally? Perhaps I need more designers and integrators, but actually the actual work to have done outside by open innovation. The fifth area is to seize the needs for speed, which we talked about before, and design for agility, adjacencies, and adaptability. And the idea here is uh, speed and uh, agility are really critical. And in order to start it, let's start thinking primarily about the adjacencies, whether you know, adjacencies in terms of the products and services we're currently offering, or the markets we serve, or the business models we have, or the partners we have, the networks we have, and then how do we design then kind of our system to be able to adapt to this uh, in an effective way. Uh, so a pretty uh, classic way of trying to speed and start right away. So the low hanging fruits that we typically will have in the adjacencies as opposed to something else. But the key to everything we're dealing with, especially in today's environment, is the need to continuously innovate and then to experiment, experiment, and experiment. We talked at the beginning about the need for experimentation and the benefit of experimentation. We'll focus on this in our discussion. But the need for innovation is really critical. Uh, the world is changing. Uh, technology is changing. Consumers are changing. Distribution systems are changing. Uh, the ways of reaching the consumers are changing. Uh, the competition is changing. And keep in mind that competition is um, typically from outside. The serious competition typically will come from outside your industry. Uh, and from a consumer point of view, consumers don't think in terms of verticals. 
they don't think in terms of now what basically what is my retail experience and who am I competing in the retail area. Consumer experiences across industries. So the same the consumers that experience the the wonderful tracking of every Federal Express package expected now from everyone. You know, not only when they're dealing with Federal Express. Um, so the, when you're thinking about innovation, uh, you really have to think about innovation uh, of everything that you do, the, your offering, your business model, the approach, your approach to market. Um, and the innovation should actually be both innovation in big I and little I in terms of trying to think about really breakthrough innovation as opposed to incremental continuous improvement that you're dealing with. And the way to do it is by moving toward continuous experimentation, creating this culture of experimentation. Let's come up with new ideas and start experimenting with them. The next area, uh, actually uh, help elaborate a little bit on the range of innovations that we can experiment with. And the idea here is to think about a portfolio of initiative along the full horizons, kind of innovation horizons we know. Typically, there are three innovation horizons. Think about this in two dimensions. Uh, each innovation horizon is one, the product and service offering that we have, the business models we have, the technology we offer, everything we are offering the consumer. And the second dimension, think in terms of the markets we serve. Now, in each one of them, the product, service offering, business model, technology offering, think about, and the market, think about what we currently do, things that exist in the world and we do not serve, and then new to the world. And the idea will be that in your portfolio of experiments and initiatives should include elements in all three areas. So you should have things that relate to what we currently do and current markets we serve and how do we experiment there to do them better and address the kind of evolving need of customers in this area. How do we design set of experiments in the second innovation horizon, things that others are doing, others perhaps in other industries, and don't look only at your industry. The best benchmarking is across industries and not within industry. And also look at kind of other customer segments that you do not reach today and you would like to reach. What can you do with them? And then in the third area, think about uh, new to the world product solution, service solution, business models, as well as new markets. Now, ideally, what you'd like to do is we'd like to have experiments in all three. You may divide your the resource allocation, obviously, maybe something like 80% in the current Horizon 1, but 20% allocated between Horizon 2 or 3. Uh, if you feel that you this is too much and you have to focus more on the current, I think the the most you can do is don't allocate more than 90% to the current and at least allocate 10% between horizon two and three. Uh, think about an example, kind of a compelling example, Tesla. Tesla has current offering both in the electric car and the battery markets they're in, horizon one. But they're improving it by trying to, within horizon one, they're moving, for example, lower in the price range and introduce the Model 3, much cheaper than the Model S, and they're doing other things to reach within Horizon 1. But at the same time, they're already at Horizon 2 with the movement toward the autonomous car. And then they are also in the activities in Horizon 3 with their activities of the uh, satellite operation they have, and with the even the radical idea of a tube type communication between cities between LA and San Francisco, you kind of uh, kind of uh, tube type uh, transfer, uh, transportation. So how do you design each of you? How do you design your portfolio of initiatives and experiments to capture all three innovation horizon? Uh, the final area I would like to kind of uh, suggest is uh, deploying idealized design um, and starting with this, starting actually with a compelling vision for the organization. 
what type of organization would you like to have in now 2030? What would you like to the legacy of the organization to be? Uh, so the more you can start thinking about a compelling vision and think about one that I love is the one that Kroger developed, which is zero hunger, zero waste. Think about how powerful this vision is. It addresses both the needs of society, zero hunger in the communities they serve, but at the same time also give an amazing direction internally in terms of how do you lead to zero waste in our activities. And David, very operational. David, basically, they're trying to achieve the zero hunger, zero waste by 2025. They have measures against it, and they're reporting on an ongoing basis how they're doing against it. So start with a vision, compelling vision. What is your vision for your organization? And then let's go to our idealized design. As opposed to the traditional uh, planning, which is see where you are and start moving forward with this, ask yourself the question, if I'm trying to achieve, let's say, the zero hunger, zero waste, or whatever your vision will be, what do I have to do now to try to get there? So in a sense, it's called backward planning. Plan backward from this ideal that you have. A simple way of implementing idealized design is select a date that you are interested in achieving some ideal objective, let's say 2030, Select a prize. What award would you like to get uh, to be the most innovative retailer, to be the most uh, the best place to work for? You select the award that you want to get. And then write a story for receiving the award. Why did you get the award? Uh, by doing this very simple three things, deciding what is the time period, what is the award you want to get, and explain how you got it. This is almost a foundation of an idealized design planning process that will allow you to identify you know, what you have to do now to try to get toward this ideal. And then once you do it, then recreate your organizational architecture. Organizational architecture includes your corporate culture, the processes that you have, the structure that you have, the competencies that you have both internally and that you can get access to through open innovation. Uh, it includes the technology. It includes the performance measures and incentive that you have. It includes all the things that, that constitute an organization. And then once you do it, you also have to think about uh, the, the ecosystem that you have, the networks that you have. Uh, and how do you orchestrate the various participants in your network? Uh, once you do it, I think you will be able to implement a lot of the ideas we discussed here. And the way to implement them is then starting by identifying specific experiments that you want to start running, uh, leveraging some of the ideas we discussed in the previous uh, principles here. Um, key to this, um, the, the whole area of the idealized design is moving away from just, okay, how do we do a little tweaking and changing what we currently have, but starting asking the question, if I want to achieve, you know, uh, reach the moon, the objective that uh, Kennedy had of how do we reach the moon? What is the ideal? What would you like to be your legacy? What do you really will feel really great about if you accomplish this in a, the time period that you're interested in, whether it's a three year, five year, 20, 30, uh, and then say, what do I have to do today to try to get there through the strategy, which hopefully will be through a series of experimentation, but what do I need in terms of the organizational architecture that facilitates, would allow me to do it and achieve it in kind of in the most e effective way. Um, if we do it, I, I believe you'll be able to succeed in... Um, capturing the opportunities the crisis offered, the lessons we just discussed, and being able to thrive and not only survive in this environment. So if you look at what we just uh, covered, uh, we covered eight areas. And let me pause here and uh, respond to any questions you may have. And once we address the questions or comments that you may have on this, what I would love us to do is to start focusing on what can we do 
in terms of designing specific experiments that will help allow us to leverage these ideas in moving us forward. Thank you so much, Jerry. That was that was wonderful. Uh, we are getting questions, and I'll just sort of keep on sort of reading these as we come. I mean, probably for each one of these principles, Jerry. The first one is uh, regarding change your mental model. And the question that I have gotten is, uh, you make a great point about challenging and changing the existing mental models. What are the biggest impediments, Jerry, that you have seen organizers struggle with to be able to even challenge and, of course, change the mental model? What, what, what are the biggest challenges that they face? Well, the, uh, it's a great question. Uh, the, the, it probably will vary from one organization to another, mm -hmm. uh, from one individual to another. I think the biggest obstacle that, that I see is um, the convenience, the comfort of the status quo. Uh, and uh, in today's environment, actually, because of the crisis, uh, people realize the status, we cannot just continue the status quo as it was before. So it's a little bit of a panic and, and uh, fear fear to try to deal with the unknown. And I think that's what will differentiate between the really successful companies and those who are not. And unfortunately, there are so many companies that uh, that fail. You know, kind of I've seen recent statistics that in among major retailers, there were like over 120 bankruptcies in the, the, the recent period. And if you look at this in a bigger picture, uh, think about the uh, Fortune 500 firms that were uh, on the list at 20, at 2000, over close to 50% of them are no longer on the list today. So the, the fear primarily of taking new initiative, of moving away from what you feel comfortable with is uh, probably the major obstacle. Great point, Jerry. Uh, on the same thing, as, as you were mentioning, I mean, I just maybe a more of an extension from my side is the pandemic very clearly has maybe shifted the landscape quite a bit. Right. And in many cases, you are right that uh, we shouldn't talk about as to how can we change what we were doing earlier. We have to really sort of chart a completely new vision uh, moving forward. Right. Now, you talk also about the organizational architecture, wherein I think the cultures, values and it, it, that, that they have been sort of built over time. How difficult or easy it is for specifically a large organization, which let us say has been around for about 50 years or 100 years. To really be able to do that, and uh, because I mean, let us say someone with uh, an organization with hundred thousand people, uh, who really are spread across maybe fifty countries, and uh, who really have built their culture over the last hundred years, one step at a time. Suddenly, uh, because of the pandemic, that that landscape or the ground on which the the entire business was built uh, has probably shifted quite a bit. Uh, so how how exactly can the organizational architecture be even thought of given the, the complexities that we are talking about in terms of culture, et cetera? Great question. Uh, let me suggest three things. One is that you find a unit, a mm -hmm. separate business unit uh, or a small country, find somewhere that mm -hmm. you are willing to experiment with, that you're mm -hmm. not afraid to experiment with. Uh, and try to experiment in this specific area. Take a business unit and try to change the culture of the business unit, the, the processes, the structure, the reward system, the technology, start doing it. That's one. The other one, which a lot of companies have been doing, is through merger and acquisitions. Uh, you start acquiring companies that augment the capabilities. Now, since you're focusing primarily on retail, mm -hmm. um, the reality is that all companies have to move into becoming omnichannel. Mm -hmm. No online alone can survive. No physical facilities alone can survive. Mm -hmm. You have to be an omnichannel. And I think if there anything, the last pandemic, uh, 16 months, prove it that unless you had a solid online operation, you cannot survive. Mm -hmm. So you need the integration of the two. So. Uh, look acquisitions. So Amazon acquired Whole Foods, you know, kind of a mm -hmm. premier, you know, retailer to start building the experience that they need of becoming omnichannel in everything they do. Mm -hmm. Look at Walmart. Walmart acquires endless number of companies in the online space, you know, kind of primarily 
to try to build their competencies in this area. And I think they're a great example for a very large company that is moving effectively toward omni-channel through the acquisition areas by, by and selecting as the head of their you know, of digital operations, one of the CEOs of the companies they acquired. Mm -hmm. uh, the third area, so one, you can do it by identifying a unit internally and do it second acquisition, merger and acquisition, especially even reverse merger to some extent yeah. uh, uh, in terms of uh, the, the expertise that the two companies bring to each other. And the third is by bringing new talent, you know, kind of to the organization, you know, kind of one of the biggest changes, bring a new, you know, chief operating officer, create, you know, mm -hmm. bring a new president to one of your business units and give him them the freedom to do it. You mm -hmm. know, the challenge by doing it is making sure that the old organizational culture and processes are not uh, constraining and killing kind of the new entry. Give them the freedom, empower them to try to do it. I think we'll use any one of these three or all three of these. I think even a large uh, organization will easily be able to deal with this. Thank you, Jerry. Very, very helpful. Uh, another question that we have gotten, I mean, so do smaller organizations and startups, uh, based on, I, I think, the complexity you are talking about, do they have an inherent advantage uh, compared to larger organizations where things are more established and preset? Uh, well, it, they have advantage in some respects. They have the advantage, obviously, they, uh, they don't have the constraint of the past. Yeah. Uh, so they can create something. They have a, a fresh canvas they can paint on. They don't have mm -hmm. to deal with all the previous mm -hmm. constraints. The problem they have, the disadvantage they have, they don't have the access to the markets. They may not have the capital that they kind of the large mm -hmm. companies have. They don't have the established brand name that the, the large companies have. So that's one of the reasons that I think a collaboration of the two is the most powerful one. Hmm. And that's the reason you see that increasing number of large companies, established companies, are establishing accelerators mm -hmm. uh, to try to attract. To, the accelerator is really a magnet on a given topic that attracts all the startups who work in this given area to work mm -hmm. with them and then they can decide which of them they want to acquire or how do they want to support them but it's primarily they have a way kind of a foothold in the future with this mm -hmm. uh, and from the startup point of view it's ideal to come up with a partner if you want to or a base in a large company that gives them opportunity to experiment and interact with the established client base with the infrastructure that they have and the like so i think the winning combination is really the one that brings the two together and from a legacy point of view uh, i would suggest for the legacy companies to seriously think about establishing accelerators on specific topics that will attract the startup and think about any area, how many, there are, there are thousands of startups in the fintech area or in my area education. Think about the kind of the ed tech, how many new ed tech companies are there? And, and we have, and the legacy companies don't have a choice. They really cannot, and it's again, it's a type of open innovation. They cannot really expect to develop all the knowledge in-house. It will take them forever and they'll have tons of resistance and most likely they will not be successful. So why not try to uh, leverage existing talent and the entrepreneurial and initiative of the startup and bring them together? Fantastic, Jerry. I mean, I, I can't help but asking this on the ed tech part, because I know we have professors joining from India. We have uh, uh, academics joining in from Stockholm and so on. So one question is, I mean, education, I think, has been on the forefront, right? Because everyone knows and everyone expects uh, education to get disrupted, right? I mean, so you are really looking at joining a, uh, a let, let us say, a college spending probably about seventy or eighty thousand dollars a year, versus probably getting the same level of education. This thing. So, what is your perspective? I mean, what is? I mean, how do you really see the the entire uh, maybe college education just to start with getting disrupted over the next many years? Uh, I think those uh, educational institutions that are basically on the the theme or the mental model that says, let's just go back to the wonderful old days before uh, the crisis, mm -hmm. they're doomed. They will not succeed. If they're among the top 20 universities in the world, 
uh, they probably will succeed because their attraction is the brand name and the network of alumni that they have and not necessarily the educational content. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking just at educational content, there is no way that any university will just go back to the traditional classroom will succeed. Flip classroom is here to stay. Flip classroom, you know, get primarily leveraging then the technology you can learn on your own. Why sit in a classroom and listen to a lecture? Do it on your own. That could be personalized at your own speed and then use the class time as a way to apply the knowledge and integrate this and discuss it and kind of uh, have a real experience, experiential learning, which is the most powerful way of learning. By uh, So in my view, all universities have to move toward a hybrid model. They have to move into some combination of online and think about creative ways of doing, dealing with the interaction, the experiential learning. But the challenge for universities is they have to challenge all of their mental models yeah. because everything that universities do today is not is not driven by the need of the learner and by the effectiveness of learning. Think about scheduling. Why are all universities scheduled semester-based two times a week for 80 minutes each time? Hmm. Is this the best for learning? No. It is primarily the convenience of the, the, the scheduler. That's what drove university schedules. Why not come up with creative initiatives of a five-day program, integrated program on one topic? Can be by far more effective, you know. So there is a whole. You know, think about every aspect of the educational process, or every aspect has to be re-examined, challenged, and ideally changed. Hmm. Very interesting. So who is asking these questions, Jerry? I mean, because I think these are difficult questions to ask, and understandably, every university has a certain set of systems, and there is a substantial amount of legacy as well, right? So right. someone really has to be bold. And unfortunately, I still feel that. I mean, it becomes hugely challenging for someone to really sort of step back and ask these difficult questions. So who is going to be asking these questions? We were hoping, though, that the pandemic may have acted as a bit of a, uh, almost like a wake up call, let us say for a lack of a better, but I mean, who who is asking these questions? I think what you'll get is you'll get it all depending on the individual. I think mm -hmm. uh, the answer to your actually previous question, which I probably forgot to to give, Mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, the question of how do we assure changes in legacy organization and the like. There's one criteria, one, one critical factor, and this is the courage of the leader. Yeah. The courage of the leader. You need courageous and innovative leaders who can make things happen. And the leader, ideally, if you're lucky, that the leader will be the CEO of the organization. But it doesn't have to be because it might be that the leader is the head of a business unit somewhere yeah. there, a small group. Let's start innovative in the small group and then let the rest of the organization learn from this and adapt. Hmm. Very interesting. So one question that we have gotten, can you explain that network orchestration a little bit more? So that was, I think, one question which just sort of came in. So uh, can you so, give a specific example, Jerry, which helps people to understand here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, certainly. Well, think about um, Uber is a great example. Uh, Uber is a disruptor. They challenged the mental model of taxi services, uh, mm -hmm. came up with a technology platform that connects the drivers and the uh, customers. So you have a technology platform that allows the connection of the two in real time in the most convenient way. So Uber, in a sense, is a network orchestrator. They're orchestrating the combined network of the customers and the drivers. So this will be kind of a simple example. Airbnb is another example for a network orchestrator uh, mm -hmm. by bringing together um, homeowners who have homes or apartments or you know rooms they want to rent mm -hmm. and the customers who have the need that they created the platform that allowed them to bring the two together. In a previous book, a few years ago, we published, it's called The Network Imperative. Mm -hmm. We did an analysis of uh, four dominant business models. Uh, one of them is the business model of uh, manufacturers, you know, kind of for um, 
that leverage primarily asset, the asset builders, uh, like uh, manufacturers or retailers, they're leveraging their, their assets. Uh, second model was the model of service providers, like consulting firms. Mm-hmm. Um, the third model was um, of uh, software develop of knowledge developers. This could be software developers. This could be pharmaceutical companies that are developing new new patents. And the fourth category was the natural orchestrators, like the the Google, like the the Uber and Airbnb and others who manage primarily a network. And we looked at the for these four miles. We looked at what has been the market cap as a multiple of revenue. And the findings were quite amazing. They were for the asset builders, the manufacturers, retailers, the, the multiple was one to two. For the service providers, it was like three to four. Uh, for the software developers, knowledge developers, it's about five. And for the network orchestrators, it was about eight X. Hmm. So clear, clearly the market rewards in terms of market cap uh, those companies that succeed in managing networks. And also we have to think about the fact that increasingly competition today, especially if you look at the retail area, competition is not just uh, company X versus company Y. The competition is the network that each one of them have. The network going all the way to what is the supply chain that each one of them have. Think about the whole supply chain value and think about their ability to deal with the consumers, reach the consumers by, through social networks and others. So it's really the ability to manage the entire network that each one of them have. So you have to evaluate not the retail company A versus B, but the network that each one of them has. Do you think, Jerry, the network effect can also be impactful specifically on the talent strategy and how exactly you operate as a company? Because you gave the example of Uber, which is pretty much a gig company, right? And, and overall, Airbnb is the, the biggest uh, hospitality company which doesn't have a single hotel uh, own, right? So are we really looking at, uh, is there an inspiration from those stories which can be used by leaders to rethink as to how exactly they will grow their team or expand their team and get things done? Great point. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think every one of your listeners can benefit, if, you're, if they're not using it already, can benefit by re-challenging their whole talent strategy and saying, Mm -hmm. what talent do I really have to have in-house? And what talent exists out there that I can access more effectively than just Mm -hmm. by hiring people? The example I gave in terms of software development was like 10x the kind of the productivity of outside. It's a no-brainer that you should not hire internally software developer. They hire the designers, and hire the integrator of the software, but the software itself to be developed, do it outside. It's a, it's a no-brainer type area. And start identifying, and now everyone requires software development, You know, given the, that we are desperate for faster digital transformation. So think about the benefits in terms of time and the speed and cost of doing this externally. So I think everyone should re-examine their talent strategy very, very seriously. Keep in mind, all of the eight principles were originally developed. You know, we started the book about two years ago. And the book at the time, the title of the book was The Architecture of Disruption. It was designed as a guideline for legacy companies to defend against disruptors and become disruptors. What we did in the beginning on kind of an early March of last year, we looked at the list and I spoke with my co-author, Nitin, and I said, you know what? All our principles are actually perfect to try to deal with the crisis. Let's flip. So we flipped the structure mm-hmm. of the book, but the same, the same eight principles, these are the principles that every legacy company has to try to adopt if they want to defend against disruptors or ideally become a disruptor. You talked about the innovation part, right? And you talked about the different portfolios and so on, right? The Horizon 1, Horizon 2, Horizon 3. Now, understandably, you are looking at almost like a future back thinking, right? Future to present, how can you map back? Uh, Do you think organizations really have, in many cases, uh, probably the 
the adequate amount of resources as well as maybe capability for lack of a better word to think horizon three i mean i can think of one i can think of two because of the adjacencies but what about three because three seems to be a little far-fetched and in many cases because i mean if you really look at the average but as a cmo right in the space their average tenure is probably about two to three years maybe four years at most so from that perspective i think uh, do the do the uh, specifically in the retail or the e-commerce industry, the industry we specialize in, do the executives even have adequate time to think about Horizon 3? Uh, probably not. And the way to address it will be through uh, creating the accelerators for startups mm -hmm. who are thinking about Horizon 2 and Horizon 3. Mm -hmm. I think that's primarily the real benefit of this, of uh, start thinking about uh, creating an internal accelerator that focus of, um, you know, what is, if you talk about back to the educational area, what will be flip class, flip classroom 2.0? Create basically competition, you know, and bring mm -hmm. select uh, uh, startups that are working in the area and bring them in to try yeah. to further develop the idea. Or yeah. in the retail area, Think about, um, you know, how do you take the idea of what Amazon has started already with basically uh, a store with no cashiers. Yeah. You know, kind yeah. Of, uh, how do you take this and really expand this uh, further to other domains, you mm -hmm. know, in, in the retail area? Or how do you use augmented reality more effectively uh, to try to engage customers? Or, you know, you select the topic that you want to that is something to relate to new segment or new type of behavior in horizon two or three and try to encourage software you know, kind of new startups or mm -hmm. go through other open innovation approaches to try to get it. But you raised another interesting question here. You talked about the CMO. So let me take a minute, if I may, and share with you my view of the role of the CMO. Mm -hmm. I think we are, the changes we see now and what we just kind of discussed in terms of those eight principles have major implication to the role of the CMO. And uh, the fact, the statistic that you quote, which is correct, which is the life, life expectancy of a CMO is about two years or kind of it's actually going, it's becoming even shorter, um, is a problem that it, 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 it's a symptom of the problem that we have. Uh, no CMO has responsibility to what we teach in marketing as the traditional four Ps. No CMO is responsible for the product or for the price yeah. or for the place, which is the distribution. Mm -hmm. And then typically they have a somewhat some responsibility on the promotion or the, the advertising part and, and the brand. My view is that uh, that's a wrong conceptualization for the role of the CMO. The CMO should actually be the person in the organization that is in charge of audience engagement and audience growth. Think about the focus on audience growth and engagement. To do it, no one can do it with a single function. You have to become the coordinator and integrator of all the different organizational silos that are leading to the delivery of the experience that the customer suggests. Like we talk about in omni-channel, we talk about the seamless experience across all channels, but that to deliver the seamless experience, you need operation and service and the, the financing. You need all of the our, our kind of aspects of the organization who are delivering mm -hmm. this experience. So the CMO should be the one who is in charge of this and can coordinate the internal resources and external resources that are leading toward the engaging the customers in a more in a deeper and more effective way in this respect i see a great parallel between the cmo and the cfo the cfo is in charge of the financial viability of the organization the parallel the cmo should be in charge of the audience engagement mm -hmm. of the organization. And if you give the CMO this responsibility, I think you'll make a huge progress forward. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, when you look at titles today of CMOs, some of the most successful companies have changed the titles. 
and are either adding to a title to marketing and growth officer or digital officer, some combination, or even more telling, they don't have even the, na the name marketing in the title anymore. But you're dealing with chief client experience, chief client um, growth, the chief growth officer, chief revenue officer, all of the other things that are relating to what I'm talking about as in charge of the audience engagement without necessarily focusing on the marketing uh, kind of aspects. That's a great point, Jerry. That's a very, very powerful. In fact, I, I, mean, I, I was sitting in a panel where the discussion was, is the CMO title even relevant in today's world, right? Because or should it be a chief digital officer, growth officer, marketing officer combined? And secondly, I mean, uh, if you really look at the CMO, is it more of uh, one person or is it more of a network or a system, right? Because one person to manage all this shift and understand all this shift, I mean, no one probably would have that level of experience and almost like a sensitization of the as to how the things are changing. So what, what is your thought on that? Well, I, I still think that you need one person who is accountable for this. Right. So like the CFO, who is responsible for the, the financial viability of the organization, I want one person to be in charge of the audience engagement of the organization, the audience mm -hmm. growth. But definitely they need the team behind, you know, behind them that will support them and allow this integration. And you need mm -hmm. systems to facilitate this. You really need to design the whole organizational architecture we talked about to facilitate doing this. Mm -hmm. um, I, and the same thing has to go now, not only at the organization, but also at the board. Mm -hmm. So most boards, you know, have someone have a finance committee. Mm -hmm. How many boards have a marketing committee? Yeah. And if they have the marketing committee is not very effective, no one pays any attention to them. Mm -hmm. But what if the marketing committee had the same responsibility as the CFO? to be accountable for the audience growth and engagement of the organization. Wow, suddenly the board, you have now marketing a voice at the board that pushes it toward what we have to do as an organization to engage our customers and get new customers that will be able to achieve to help us achieve our vision. JD, another question that I've just gotten is, uh, basically about the experimentation, the rapid experimentation, right? So the, the yeah. question is pretty interesting. So the question is, is it more of a cultural thing or is it more of a structural thing? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a great question because is rapid experimentation a cultural aspect or is it more of a structural and just creating a, uh, or is it both? I think it's both. And I would add to this, it's a matter of definitely, uh, I, what I've been arguing always for years has been that all organizations have to have a culture of experimentation. We're really talking about adaptive experimentation. We're not talking about a single experiment. We're talking about the, the leading companies, what the, the Google and Amazon and all of the other kind of uh, successful technology company are doing, continuous experimentation. Everything you do, experiment, experiment, mm -hmm. experiment. Because the best way to learn, you know, and fast prototyping, that's what we need. We don't need seven years in the lab out there. If you can develop a fast prototype, test it and see what the reaction. So the first one will not be perfect, but at least you learn, you get the feedback and you get a more realistic way of proceeding. So I think that it's definitely a matter of culture, but to make it happen, you also have to have the structure, you have the competencies. I think every organization should hire at least one statistician with expertise in experimental design can be from statistics or from uh, experimental psychology, but you need at least one person who really understands experimental design and uh, understands how to design experiments effectively with the right control and how to measure covariates in terms of other variables that may affect the results. So you can really interpret the results in an effective way. Uh, and uh, it requires the technology many, many times. It requires a way of almost thinking about the whole measurement because key to experimentation is measurement. So it has implication to all of the aspects of organizational architecture. But I think you're right. The culture is at the core. And this goes back to leadership. You know, what is, um, you know, kind of to what extent the leaders of the organization can instill this culture of experimentation in a simple way. Simple way, I will not, if I was an executive in the company, I will not approve any budget if the budget did not include in it explicitly suggestion mm. for experimentation. Mm. 
Because if you're not having it, you're telling me you're not interested in learning. And the only way of learning is through experimentation. Hmm. So I, I would have insisted, if I were an executive in the company, I would have insisted for every budget that you want me to approve, I would like to see at least at least three experiments, one for Horizon 1, Horizon 2, and Horizon 3, or if Horizon 3 is too difficult, so at least for Horizon 1 and 2. Great point, Jerry. Uh, you, again, sort of getting back to this point about experimentation, I mean, we have seen that uh, it's so extremely important to empower all the team members, but more so the, com the, 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 the team members who really are having those interactions directly with the customer. And that becomes an extremely important component, right? So from that right. perspective, are we really looking at uh, maybe making any changes to the org structure rather than the hierarchical classic basis, whereby by the time you sort of get to know as to what the, the, the call center guy really sort of heard, uh, probably it's lost in translation, right? So are we looking at re-architecting the entire organizational structure to make it a lot more customer centric or how would you think about that? Absolutely, absolutely. I would start by saying uh, the customer has to be at the center. And if given the fact that I have to understand the customer and ideally collaborate with the customer, co-creating with the customer, what are the implications for the rest of the organization? Um, there is, uh, in, in the book, uh, we're talking about development and we're mm -hmm. suggesting uh, that um, the development should be front to back. Uh, so the idea is you want to start the development, not at the back office with the product, here's the product, and then how do I sell the product? Mm -hmm. But the idea will be to start with the front, with the customer. What are the customer needs? And how can I incorporate the What are the implications of the customer needs to what I have to deliver to try to meet these needs? So put the, the customer at the center. And the same thing applies not only for the design of the offering, the product and service offering, but also to the organization. How can I develop the organization that will allow us to meet their needs in the most effective way? So it's a great point, and I think that uh, uh, definitely we should encourage organizations to rethink all aspects of organizational or architecture, including the structure. So in this model, the, the, the eight principles we have recommended, Jerry, I'm pretty sure they all of them are sort of entwined, right? They basically sort of work with each other. Right. So collectively, I mean, how should, if, let us say, someone who's listening to this uh, presentation or a discussion, I mean, how, where, where do they even start? Should they uh, really start thinking of it collectively as one, one framework or should we sort of start somewhere, uh, one of these principles? Uh, ideally, at some point, we should basically address all eight, mm -hmm. ideally. Pragmatically, to try to move forward, I would select the one area that is most critical and relevant to my current organizational situation. So let me analyze my current situation, mm -hmm. do a spot analysis or whatever, but let's, uh, let's analyze the current situation. What are the real challenges that I face? Identify a major problem that I have and say, okay, to address this problem, which of these principles help me the most and design experiment around it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one approach. The other approach is the, the most fundamental one, which is item number one, which says, let's examine the changes in the world, the changes in technology, in consumers, the consumer behavior, the more empowered and skeptical consumers, the change in competition and the like. And to what extent my current mental and business model are still okay to try to deal with these changes. And if they're not, how should I change my current mental and business model and start with there? This is the most fundamental of all the areas. And whatever I do, translate immediately into, let's design now an experiment so I can move forward and test the idea to what extent it makes sense or not. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, Jerry. The final question, and this has been amazing. The final question is in many cases, the organization starts with one of these points, as you mentioned. But in many cases, it may not really have an immediate impact or you, you may not be able to see an immediate outcome, right? And if you really look at some of these pieces like innovate, then experiment, 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 some of these outcomes may really take a fairly amount, long amount of time. Uh, one of the things which I keep on, keep on sharing with our team, if you remember Amazon 
had a search engine called A9. Now, at that point in time, everyone sort of laughed at it and it was gone. But the team kept working at it. And now we all know it as Amazon advertising is really booming. It has become number two in terms of the paid pay-per-click or paid search model after Google. Now, from that perspective, they had to really have the tenacity. And they were able to adapt, customize, understand the customer better, and really integrate so that it has now really giving Google a run for their money. So from that perspective, uh, what is the time horizon and any any pieces of advice for folks <coughs> who may not really have 10 years, let us say, but as, as to how exactly do they know as to whether they are on the right track moving forward with this model? This is such an important and difficult question. Um, unfortunately, there is no, no single answer to this. Um, the, uh, you identify the problem. You identify the problem, which is that some... Uh, some experiments take longer to materialize. Uh, so my suggested solu solution to this is uh, the obvious one. Uh, hire intelligent uh, leaders who have uh, part of their leadership st style and skills. Uh, the combined ability to move fast, experiment fast, and if it succeeds, scale it big. If it's not, kill it. But move immediately to the next experiment and have more experiments. So kind of to have a whole series of continuous experimentation going on. So you don't depend on a single experiment and waiting for five years for the results. So you're running a portfolio of experiments. And I think the solution is by having the kind of the ideal people leading it, but at the same time, managing it as a series of experimentation um, that some of them will have short-term results because you need reinforcement. You know, you need for the management, you need reinforcement to show that it's working because if you're running an experiment, it doesn't work. The inclination could be, okay, forget it. Let, exactly. Let's get rid of it. You know, let's go back to the old way of doing it. But if you're running a portfolio of experiments, then you have the, the opportunity here uh, to say, well, this experiment immediately led to the following results, and this experiment will take a little longer, and kind of we start dealing with portfolio of experiments, and experimentation is the responsibility of everyone in the organization. It's not a centralized place that is doing, mm -hmm. you know, few experiments. So you create a culture of experimentation, and I think this will solve the problem because some of them will have a short-term impact, some will have a longer-term impact, but you evaluate this as a portfolio. Fantastic. Jerry, I know, I mean, I had mentioned the last question, but if it is okay, I'll, the audience questions are just sort of flooding in. I'll just have sure. one last one, and this is the final question. This is from Victor. Victor is the CEO of Redeal. They are a Swedish company. Uh, 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 he said, th Jerry, thank you very much for this extremely interesting session. Uh, these are very interesting times, to say the least. How do you suggest boosting the willingness to experiment and try new solutions at an individual level within the organization? Uh, I think that uh, the same reward system for everything else you're trying to achieve in the organization, uh, monetarily and non-monetarily, start featuring the experiments and don't focus only on successful experiments. Feature, create a system, a president's uh, kind of president's award for a weekly reporting or a monthly reporting on uh, innovative experiments and feature the person who led them uh, whether successful or not. And the focus is, you know, uh, focus on what would you try to do, what objective, what would you do, what are the results, and most important, what have we learned from this? So by adding the fourth item, which is what have we learned from this, you are then encouraging people, even if they, the experiment failed, did not lead to the results you wanted, we learned something from this, and what are we doing that is a result of this? What will be the next experiments we'll do? So I think I would start featuring you know, as part of the culture can be a, you know, kind of a weekly, monthly, bi-weekly, whatever the time period, depending how many experiments you can, you can run. And I would like to do it weekly because of, this will suggest more experiments are being run to reward, to recognize it, to empower them, to present, and then to reward them, you know, kind of clearly monetarily and promotion wise and, uh, in the promotion to recognize that this is because of their innovativeness in coming up with innovative experiments and initiating initiating them and carrying them through. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much, Harry. I know, I mean, we could have continued for a very long time. <laughs> really appreciate your ideas and insights on this thing. Thank you very much, Harry. Thanks a lot. You're more than welcome. May I conclude with uh, kind of my last slide? Absolutely, if, please. If we can put the last slide on. Yeah, I think you can change the last slide, Jerry. Yeah. yeah, reflect. Whoops, we move back. Uh, my last slide is reflection and takeaway. So I would like to suggest to the audience, if you take 30 seconds while we are transitioning to the next speaker and jot down to yourself, what are you going to do differently as a result of my talk and especially most interesting dis discussion with Zudain? And uh, what will you do? What type of experiments will you do? Uh, so write down to yourself a real action plan as a result of this session. And hopefully as a result of the day, when you have a few more kind of exciting uh, talks coming and discussion, you'll be able to identify at the end of the day an experiment or two that you would like to run based on the lessons from all of the sessions that you are attending. And thanks so much for inviting me, and hopefully this was helpful. Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Udain. That was that was an awesome presentation. And Jerry, for sure, there's there's going to be some reflection points on on my end that I I, I have a slew of notes here. So um, really appreciate that, and really appreciate you you joining us today. Um, so so moving forward. Our next speaker and our, our very valued partner at Google, I, I don't think my intro is going to do her any justice, but Natalie Natalie leads the, the Think with Google team at Google. And to those that are, that are unfamiliar with the platform, it del delivers and provides data and insights to millions of advertisers throughout the world. Um, Natalie has spent over 15 years as a journalist working with, with many major brands and has appeared on, on many news channels like ABC World News, CNN. NPR and, and many others. So she's somewhat of a celebrity here. So I'm, I'm happy I get to get to introduce her. So with that, I, I do want to introduce Natalie Zmuda to take us through some some insights into into what she is she has been seeing on the Think with Google side. So take away now. Thank you so much for the kind intro. I am so excited to be here. Um, as Marvick said, my name is Natalie Zmuda and I am the head of Think with Google, um, which is uh, let's get that there, um, which is Google's content and thought leadership platform for marketers and anyone who cares about marketing. Um, so I'm here to talk to you a little bit today about how we're going to look backward to move forward, um, because in early 2020, as we all know, the world changed. And with it, people changed. And we all started doing things differently. We started shopping differently. We stayed in touch with friends and family differently. Work, school, exercise, entertainment. All of it, we've had to rethink and reorder in the last 18 months. And some of those trends have been thinking, have been fleeting. Think about when everyone was trying to find toilet paper or when all of the parents out there, we were all searching for homeschool schedules and trying to figure out how to educate our kids, how to be teachers. Last summer, everyone was buying blow up pools and spent a lot of time gardening. I know I learned how to can tomatoes for the first time with all of the, the tomatoes we had in our garden. Um, in this summer, we're seeing a lot of searches around travel. We're seeing a lot of personal care searches. People are coming out of hibernation. But there are other trends that, that we think indicate a bigger, potentially more permanent shift in the way that people behave and in what they expect of brands. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. So we're going to look back to move forward and we'll explore which trends are here to stay. I've got a lot of data to share with you, and I hope it's useful as you're all thinking about what's next for your business, as you're all starting to, to think about 2022 planning. Um, and I'll leave time for Q&A like Jerry, so please jot down any questions that come to mind. All right, here we go. So people are constantly evolving, and they constantly have new needs. Every day, 15% of the search queries that we see on Google are ones we've never seen before. And that was before the pandemic. So let that sink in for a minute. It's crazy, right? So what's a brand to do? What are we as marketers to do if we want to attract and retain customers? We've got to evolve, plain and simple. We've got to read the tea leaves, which for us at Think with Google is search queries. And we need to make educated guesses about what's likely to stick. And that, I think, is more critical today than at perhaps any other moment in modern history. 
Why, you ask? Why is it so important right now? We get it. COVID was life-changing. It was huge. It's been huge. It was. It is. And when you pair that with the technology that we have at our disposal, this is what you get. Four in five consumers say they discovered new brands online during COVID-19. So if we were all in a room together, I'd ask you to all raise your hands uh, to tell me if you discovered a new brand in the last 18 months. I'm guessing a lot of hands would go up. I know mine would. Chances are you discovered multiple new brands. And that makes it even more crucial that we're all paying attention to these new consumer behaviors and how people are changing, what they're doing differently. Because everyone listening today, you're probably all in a position that you're either going to lose customers or you're going to gain them as a result of COVID. So in the next 25, 30 minutes or so, I'm going to talk through five trends, all backed by Google data, all based on search queries that we're seeing. And I hope that that will help to illustrate some of the consumer shifts that we think are here to stay. I'm going to dig into why individual individuality matters more than ever. We'll explore searches that show how people are embracing a higher purpose. I'm really excited to talk about home as headquarters because even before the pandemic, we saw this happening, which makes this not just a trend, but a trend on steroids. And we'll dig into how people are really bringing their whole selves to your brand. And their expectations are that brands are going to, to really acknowledge that, to really understand that, that people aren't gonna be treated just as a demographic, but that they're going to be treated as their unique selves. And finally, future-proofing. It is top of mind for all of us as marketers, and it's also really top of mind for consumers. They're thinking about how, how to future-proof their own lives as we can come out of this really, really uncertain period um, in time. All right, so first trend, first step, individual matters. In the last 18 months, COVID-19 has been this, this globally shared problem around the world, any country in the world, small town, big city, rural, urban, we lived with the ramifications of COVID-19. Yet, even though this was this, this hugely global experience, it also exposed this really simple truth, which is that there's no universal human experience. So people are placing more value on individual needs, on individual perspectives, even when they're outside of the norm, even when they're different. Let me share some examples. Let me share some data. So these are some of the types of searches that we're seeing. In India, there has been a 250% increase in searches related to disability etiquette. As people are trying to understand, you know, how does this work? How, how is this experience different from my own? And how can, I, how can I be a part of this? At the same time, search interest for racial justice has peaked worldwide, not just in the US, worldwide, as did a whole host of related searches. The world is really grappling with and in trying to better educate themselves about racial related injustices. Searches for inclusion up 100%. This desire to be inclusive, this desire to be included, it's not, it's not going to go away. And I think today, more so than, than ever before, people have this, this greater appreciation for experiences that are different from their own, for people that are different from themselves. There's another aspect of this trend toward understanding individuality. People really today expect experiences that are personalized for them, that are efficient for them, and that are convenient for them. And this has been popping up in search. We've been seeing this. Um, people are getting super, super specific about what's relevant to them and about what they need. So for years, we saw people searching near me. That, you know, that has been a big, a big trend over the last number of years. People looking for, you know, grocery stores near me, best ice cream near me, movies near me, you name it. But today that's getting a little bit more granular. So people want to know along my route. What's along my route? What is specific to me that I can find on my way to wherever I'm going? Searches for along my route have been growing really quickly up a thousand percent. So search is becoming, has always been personal, but it's becoming even more personal, even more specific. And when people expect that of search, 
what they're really saying is they expect that of the brands that they find on search. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about what this means for brands. Simply acknowledging diversity, equity, inclusion, it's, it's not going to be enough. Brands need to have empathy, but also solutions for all of the situations that their consumers are facing. Brands also need to really build inclusivity in from the beginning, because treating it as an add-on, it's not going to cut it. Unilever is a great example of this. Unilever announced earlier this year that it would drop the word normal from its beauty products after they did this global poll that showed that people feel like that word, when it's used to describe hair or skincare, it makes people feel excluded. So globally, more than 100 of Unilever's brands are going to have the word normal removed from their packaging and removed from their marketing materials. And the company says that this is really an important step toward creating a more inclusive definition of beauty. And building on that along my root insight we talked about, it's time for brands to really start thinking about individual journeys. So how does your customer, your specific individual customer, go from inspiration to consideration to purchase on any given day for any given product? In the case of IKEA, you, they took this really literally, which I think is very cool. Uh, so IKEA acknowledged its superstores are often built on the outskirts of cities. They often take a while to get to them. It's a bit of a commitment. You got to kind of make a day of it, right? That's why they have those, those cafeterias with the great Swedish meatballs. So last year it offered this distance-based discount. It's buy with your time promotion. And that allowed people to actually buy items with their time. So there were tags on items all across the store that showed the price in money as well as the price in time. And when you got to check out, you would show the cashier your Google Maps timeline, where you'd been going, and they would give you the discount. And so I think that that sort of thinking is what we're going to need more of as we start to think about individuals. And I've got a quick video to show you from Ikea. Ikea's giant superstores are usually built on the outskirts of cities. As a result, families spend a lot of time driving to the stores. Could IKEA give them a stronger incentive to make the trip? IKEA's Buy With Your Time promotion was conceived as a way to reward people for traveling to IKEA. They could use the time they spent on the road to actually buy things in our stores. Everything in the store had a tag that showed the price in money as well as time. During checkout, shoppers just had to show the cashier their Google Maps timeline, which would have a record of all their past trips. Converting that time into an amount in UAE dirhams was a simple calculation based on the average family income in the country. Hi, sir. Good Hi. morning. Would you like to pay by cash, card, or by your time? Cash or time. Or would you like to pay with time as well? At the moment, I can see that you have 2 hours 35 minutes. Can I pay for these small items with my time? For this one item, sir, it's a total of 45 minutes. And for these three items, it's a total of 1,800 dirhams, sir. That on time, this on card. As expected, this novel promotion was an instant hit. <laughs> Have I got anything left over for a hot dog, maybe? After all, this was the first time that anyone had changed time literally into money. Or for that matter, into a shelving unit, a coffee table, or a potted plant. All right, so hopefully that starts to get you guys thinking a little bit about how might you create more individual experiences. Now, trend number two, higher purpose. In the last two years, we have had global crises from you know COVID-19, of course, wildfires in Brazil, Australia, the US, and it's brought people's values to the forefront. It's really pushed people to look for ways to do more for their communities, to do more for their environment, and if people are doing that, and if people are thinking that way, you got to believe that they expect the same of the brands that they're loyal to. Let me share some examples, paint the picture a little bit. So in the UK, growth in searches related to carbon neutrality, up 92%. Growth in searches for ethical online shopping, up 600%. 
we're seeing that what people value, the, the things that they determine are important to their purchasing, purchasing decisions, that's really converging with their values, their very views on the world. And one of the things people value now more than ever is helpfulness. Searches for can I help up 70%. And searches for support local businesses went absolutely through the roof, up more than 20,000%. Now, some of this emphasis on local businesses I expect will die down as local economies start, start to recover. But remember that the new brands that were discovered during this period, the new habits that people formed, those are gonna stick. Another interesting point. According to Edelman's trust barometer, businesses are now the most trusted institution in the world. That's something that gained steam in part as a result of COVID because people realized that governments were just not equipped to develop and distribute COVID vaccines without the support of private institutions. Businesses stepped up in a really big way in the last 18 months. There are tons of examples from throughout the pandemic of businesses stepping up to help people. And people are going to expect that businesses are going to continue to focus on big social, political, and environmental issues going forward. So what does all this mean? It is increasingly important to support communities and to take action to integrate sustainability and your values into your business. Converse did this, I thought, really brilliantly. They invited artists to create these air purifying murals to really bring communities together. And the murals, which are now, they exist around the world, and they use air purifying paint to eliminate CO2 and other harmful substances. So actually, as the paint dries, it kind of, it becomes like a tree. Any surface coated with this paint becomes an active air purifying surface, or surface which is very cool. And in a world where people are shopping their values, businesses also need to be thinking about how to make their values, how to make their internal practices a bit more visible. There are lots of businesses I've worked with over the years that are doing very cool things that they never talk about. Now's the time. Shiseido, for instance, is starting to give people behind the scenes glimpse of its R&D process. They have this new global innovation center that they're fashioning as an open lab with the goal of becoming a leading research institution that people, that customers can easily drop in on, they can explore what's in the works, or they can drop in and refill their favorite products. I've got a video on that too. 2020, our sustainability action starts from Ginza. The Shiseido Ultimune Fountain. Inspired by the Japanese Motai Nai spirit, which values all things with deep appreciation. It's an entirely new refill service. Please bring your emptied Ultimune bottle to our global flagship store. Your bottle will be thoroughly cleaned with the utmost care. Refilled with Ultimune and carefully checked before being returned to you. Ultimune strives to replenish your skin and spirit and drives environmentally friendly efforts. The Shiseido Ultimune Fountain. From Ginza to the world. Sustainable beauty actions. Shiseido, Ginza, Tokyo. All right, trend number three, home is headquarters. This one I find to be fascinating. fascinating. Um, and I'll share a little behind the scenes story from Think with Google. So back in, take yourself back to December of 2019, our internal research and insights team, they approached us, um, they came and chatted with me and they said, we're seeing this really interesting trend. More people are working from home and more people are saying that they, they wanna work from home. They want flexible schedules. And we've got this data point. There are a ton of people starting to use grocery delivery services. Grocery delivery services have been around for a while and they've kind of been, you know, knocking along, um, but it's really starting to explode. Do you think that's interesting? And I agree with the story. I said, let's do this. The word, the working headline was something like, there's no place like home. And then right as we started wrapping up the story, uh, you know, probably February, 2020 or so, um, the world shut down. Everyone went home. 
And so we ended up pivoting the story to reflect all of the new data that was coming in. Home truly became people's headquarters. Whether it was pre-pandemic or post-pandemic, the, the insights are the same. People are busy and they're looking to make better use of their time and to have a better quality of life. So here's the data. Pre-pandemic, grocery delivery searches were already surging, as were searches for remote jobs. So grocery delivery searches up 130%. Searches for remote jobs jumping 210%. Neither of those things is going to go away. And if you've discovered, just discovered grocery delivery service during the pandemic, or you've worked from home for the first time, you're probably going to continue to want some aspect of that, at least some of the time, because it makes your life easier. It makes your life better. Also during the pandemic, we saw this huge surge in searches for at home. No big surprise there. Ballooned up 10x. Same with watch time on YouTube for videos that were focused on specifically on home activities, up 120%. Some of this is going to fade away with the pandemic as life gets back to normal, but there are gonna be lasting changes. The in-office work model, all indications are that it has likely changed forever. And that means new patterns for people. More meals consumed at home, a greater need for home offices, different patterns around e-commerce. People have gotten really comfortable with online browsing and shopping. Groceries is just one example of that. So I'm personally really, really interested to see what this is going to shape up like. What, is, what are things gonna look like this holiday season? I was reading a piece from our, our, uh, our Spanish LATAM team and they were talking about how half of the people who are gonna be shopping this holiday season are new e-shoppers that were born during the pandemic. I'm super excited, super interested to see what happens with all of those new e-shoppers this holiday season. So what does all of this mean? Bottom line. People want a better quality of life. Who wouldn't? I do. And they're not going to be keen up to give up the services that helped them with that. And you've heard this a million times. I know. Invest in an omnichannel strategy. And if you need more proof as to why, just look at Target. It says omnichannel customers spend 4x more than store only buyers and 10x more than digital only shoppers on average. We're also seeing, you know, businesses across the board have had to rethink the way they do business in the pandemic. And they're rethinking what are maybe some traditional or perceived business boundaries um, because they're trying to make services more convenient for people who are at home. And Hyundai, their luxury car brand uh, Genesis has really embraced this. They've got personal shoppers, they're bringing test drives and other showroom services directly to people's homes, for example. And I've got a quick, quick clip of that. We're bringing everything you love about personal shopping to the world of luxury vehicle shopping. Introducing Genesis Concierge, a fresh approach to finding your perfect luxury car with the help of a personal assistant. Genesis Concierge. Seems pretty appealing, right? Who, wanted, who wouldn't want to embrace that and make life a little bit easier uh, when it comes to car shopping? All right, trend number four, whole cells. Remember when we used to talk about how we brought work home with us? In the last 18 months, we have all brought our homes to work. I know my kids have popped up on lots of, lots of video calls. Um, my dog's been running around on lots of video calls. There's been construction outside. Like, everything that's happening in our homes is now intermeshed with work. The lines have blurred in the roles we play. And there are many people around the world that are gonna continue to manage work and home as we go into 2022. People have this expectation beyond that, beyond this blurring of lines, because of this blurring of lines, people have this expectation that their specific needs are going to be met. That when they type in a question into a search box, that they are going to get an answer that is specific to them coming back. That the brand is going to understand them as a whole person. That they're not going to be just defined by demographics. That I'm not going to just be a 40 year old woman, that I'm going to be a mother that I'm going to be, you know, they're going to know exactly what I want out of them, that I'm going to have all of these other facets that make me make me a person. And as a result of that, we're seeing some really interesting searches. So people are shopping differently. They're turning to YouTube for virtual test drives or showroom visits. So kind of related a bit to what we saw with Genesis, we're seeing this really fundamental shift in how people are buying cars. 
new car buyers are more likely to use YouTube in the car buying process than they ever have before. And people are also getting more demanding. So we talked about near me searches, add now to that. We're seeing that searches for now near me have grown 100%. People are also increasingly searching in their native languages. And I find this one to be really interesting because this is a big shift. So keep in mind, about 60% of the content on the internet is in English. Yet native, native, keyword native, English speakers only account for about 5%, little over 5% of the global population. And so we're seeing this really marked shift, particularly in APAC, where you've got 35% of the top searches last year were not in English. And around the world, we're seeing jumps in searches for translate English to name your language growing. So just one example here, requests for translations from Hindi to English are up 90%. So what does that mean for brands? We've got to all remember that people are bringing their whole selves to your brand and they're not going to expect anything less. They're not just bringing their consumer identities, their demographics. So we've got more and more brands thinking about how do you speak like a local? Walmart owned Flipkart recently introduced this multilingual voice assistant for grocery shopping. And we're seeing a ton of in innovation in APAC, often out of necessity in this area. So India, I think, is again, just a really fascinating example here where you've got India's Hindi internet user base. They are set to outgrow the country's online English language users. And when you combine Hindi with Marathi and Bengali users, that's gonna be 75% of Indians that are online. Now, at the same time, there's this blurring of people's work and home lives that we've talked about, and brands are thinking more holistically, should be thinking more holistically about what they can offer and what they can best, how they can best serve customers. Panera is a great example of this. Pivoted to grocery delivery, you know, in restaurant business, pivoted in the pandemic, opened up a grocery grocery delivery business, and it's still going strong even as they're reopening restaurants. And I've got a clip uh, we can hear from the CEO of Panera. Joining us now is Narin Chowdhury, CEO of Panera Bread. Narin, thank you so much for joining us. I want to start off on this massive growth in delivery. You're taking kind of an unusual approach to delivery. Tell us about your hybrid model. Yeah, so uh, uh, Panera is actually emerging stronger through the pandemic. Uh, as you mentioned, we are more off-premise than before. So from 40% before the pandemic to almost 85% is now off-premise and more digital uh, from 35% to nearly 55% of our business is digital. And I think on the off-premise, the biggest driver uh, is delivery. Our delivery business is growing by more than 100%. And uh, as you mentioned, we indeed we have a unique, a very versatile delivery model. Uh, we have uh, the combination of a fully owned delivery infrastructure with 8,000 of our own delivery drivers on the one hand. And on the other hand, we have partnerships with third party aggregators and all sort of hybrid models in the middle as well. So it's a very flexible delivery model that is helping us drive this uh, growth that we're seeing. All right, we've got one more trend. Final, final trend, number five, future proofing, top of mind for all of us, doesn't matter who you are, businesses, consumers. In the wake of the pandemic, there has been this, this new, not new, but there's been this wave. People have this interest in kind of figuring out how do I, how do I manage the things I can control? There's been so much that we have not been in control of in this last year. So how do I manage the things that I can control? How do I future proof my life wherever I can? And people are, no surprise, feeling a bit uneasy as we come out of this pandemic, and they really want reassurance. They want assurances from brands. They want peace of mind wherever possible. So it's not going to surprise anyone that people are going to have a lower appetite for risk for a while, and we're seeing that show up in search. Searches for rentals are up 100%. And 65% of people say that they're reevaluating their lives and their goals in a study that we did. People have also been learning new skills all throughout the pandemic. This has been a really interesting one to see. We've seen a 50% increase in daily views of videos with beginner in the title. And there's been a 70% increase in searches for how to invest. And there's, these are just two searches, but there's a whole 
catalog of searches that are kind of along these lines where people are trying to learn new skills. So as we come out of the pandemic, people are going to be looking to put those new skills to work. So what does all that mean? With these lower appetites for risk, I think there's even an even lower tolerance for confusing or any sort of any kind of time consuming communications from brands. Communications from brands should always be simple, but I think it's going to be even more important now in this moment. I found this really entertaining study where they looked at a number of um, popular apps that have terms and conditions, you know, those things that you never read that you just click through when you download an app. And the study found that it would actually take hours to fully read these terms and conditions. In fact, one of the data points they had, if you combine the top apps uh, from this study, the combined terms and conditions longer than a Harry Potter novel. So keep, keep that in mind as you're thinking about your communications to folks in this moment. Um, now is also a really good time to get creative about how you reduce risk for people. I remember this from the Great Recession. You do too, 2008, 2009, brands were getting really creative. How do we give peace of mind for people who are feeling really skittish? And I think we'll start to see that happen again. Um, haven't seen any great examples in the US of this yet. If you have them, send them to me. But this example from Malaysia really caught my eye. There's this real estate venture that's introduced a, a try before you buy program for homes to entice renters. I've got a clip for you. New Year, new hope with Eco World Stay to Own. What is Stay to Own? It's simple. You stay to own. This easy home ownership program lets you enjoy living in your dream home first before buying it later. But that's not all. Entry is easy with minimum fuss and low monthly rental. This gives you maximum flexibility and up to five years to save up to buy your dream home at the same price as the day you moved in. Yes, the same price. Better yet, part of the rent you pay can be converted to savings to help pay for your dream home. The earlier you convert, the more savings you will enjoy. So what is Stay to Own? It's a fantastic and flexible opportunity and a new hope for you to own your dream home. Specially designed for you by EcoWorld and Maybank HouseKey. So that's kind of a fun one, a unique way that this company is looking to kind of put people at ease and, and help those people that feel, feel risk averse. All right, we have gone through a lot of data today and I hope packaged together as these with these broader trends, with some of these brand examples, some of these quick video clips, it's unlocking some new thinking, some new ideas. Um, it's getting you thinking as you look at head to 2022 because this quote really sums up what we're all facing right now. There isn't a world where people revert back to their 2019 behaviors. And part of that is just a comfort level. That's a quote from Corey Berry, who's the CEO of Best Buy from earlier this year. And I think it's it really, it really rings true for me. We all need to recognize, we all need to prepare for the fact that the pandemic is going to have a lasting impact on consumer behavior. And the people that we're all trying to reach today are fundamentally changed from the people that they were in 2019. I hope looking back for these last you know, 20, 30 minutes or so has helped you all to think about how you'll move forward. And I hope you'll all subscribe to Think With Google to get more content like this, trends, insights delivered to your inboxes. Thanks so much. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thanks, Natalie. That was that was wonderful. I, I'm now hungry. I want a new car and maybe a vacation coming up. I don't know um, if my wife's watching. She probably want a vacation. But um, that was that was incredible. Appreciate you, you sharing a lot of those insights. We we did get a, a slew of questions that did come into the chat. Um, and I kind of just take them take them top down if, if you're okay with that. And I, I think the the first question came in from what pertained to your your number two topic in terms of higher value. Right. What what has surprised you the most about consumer change in search and shopping habits? And, and what have you seen on the Google at Google side there? Yeah. Um, so I think the thing that I continue to be fascinated by with the change in search is just how specific people are. So 
you know, five years ago near me was kind of the big new thing that we were talking about at Google. And now we're seeing, you know, I mentioned it already, but now near me or along my route, the fact that people are going to search, going to that blank box and saying like, I expect that you'll be able to tell me what is near me that I want now, what is along my route, that, that kind of specificity, I think really has to make us all stop and think like, wow, people really have this super high expectation of technology today. And if we're not meeting it, then we're, we're missing expectations, then we're not going to deliver for that customer. Um, so I find that really interesting for search, um, for shopping, you know, I think just the sheer growth that we've seen. Um, there were some stats that I was looking through from, from eMarketer actually that were saying, you know, this is the first time, uh, e-commerce in China, it's the tipping point. E-commerce in China has exceeded physical commerce for the first time. And we're seeing really rapid growth in markets across Asia, EMEA, and in the US. So this huge boom in e-commerce that we've, you know, all been talking about for the last 20 years, like it's here, it's happening. And I find it, you know, the stat that I said earlier about all those e-commerce e-commerce shoppers that were born during the pandemic, I cannot wait to see how they behave this holiday shopping season. I think it's going to be super interesting. Absolutely. And I, I know we're starting to see a lot of those trends on, on the Net, Net Elixir front as well. So um, appreciate your thoughts there. Um, transitioning into, into some of the, the next ones, one major topic you, you also did highlight, Natalie, is the, the or that one that's also trending throughout our world is the, the back to office, right? And, and getting back to the office. So what works, what doesn't work, will it be a hybrid model, anything along those lines. But as businesses start to go back into your point in terms of along my route or near me, do you think that consumers' behaviors could shift away from online shopping or browsing in, in terms of in terms of when folks start to go back to the office full time or part time? I mean, I think it's it's natural to expect that there will be a little dip. You know, I've mm -hmm. shopped more in physical stores in the last few months than I did during the same period a year ago because I wasn't leaving my house a year ago. So that we're gonna see some of those dips for sure. Um, but I think ultimately people are looking for what's convenient. That's what all of the search trends are telling us, what's convenient. So some of those habits that I formed or things I learned about during the pandemic, I'm not gonna let them go. Um, I've, I've got an example actually, uh, over the weekend, Sunday, I think, um, I realized like last minute, like, oh, I need like this, this, you know, I need some cleaning supplies, I need some paper products for, for Monday. And we had friends that were stopping by in like half an hour. And so I didn't have time to run up to Target, which is like 15 minutes from my house. And so I grabbed my computer, I sat down, put everything in my shopping cart, hit same day delivery. And they do the thing where you can like text with the personal shopper now. And by the time our friends left, all the stuff I needed was on my front step. Like it was just in the bag on my, on my front doorstep, on my porch. And so that kind of thing isn't going to go away. Like if you found a convenient way of doing things, um, I think that sticks. I really do. 100% agree. If I could tell a story based on, on what you just shared, I was mowing the lawn the other day and I smacked a pipe and broke it and Home Depot came came to the rescue. I ordered it online, drove over there. They had it in the locker and I was like, man, I've gotten lazy or this has just gotten so much easier to me. It's just so, a new way. It's just we're not going to go back. Why would we? For sure. I know. I didn't have to search the shelves. I knew what I needed. So life, well, life is a lot easier. You know, the other thing I have to mention that's that I found really interesting and it's um, it's, you know, a little bit in the U.S., but certainly more in developing markets. If I think about um, like South Africa, uh, definitely parts of Southeast Asia, there were a lot of people that were fundamentally underbanked. So people mm -hmm. that when the pandemic hit, hit didn't have online banking. And so e-commerce was not an option for them because they didn't have online banking. And now as a result of the pandemic, you have this big push where all a lot of these people have become actually first time bankers or first time, you know, they're working with financial institutions to get access to banking so that e-commerce becomes unlocked for them. I think that's another really interesting trend we have to watch in some of those more developing markets. Awesome. No, that's, that's great. And I'm sure we'll, we'll start to see see those within countries that start to, to pop up throughout the world. Um, perfect, perfect. So I'm just looking at the, some of the other questions that we have. And I, I think this also flows again with your near me and then the trends that, that you were mentioning. Um, aside from from what you just mentioned in terms of new financial markets for consumers to buy there, are there any emerging trends that may not be evident right now that might be important mm -hmm. over the next two, three, four, five years? 
The crystal ball question. Um, <laughs> you know, I. it's really interesting. The sustainability piece, I think, is really interesting. You know, this idea of a higher purpose, which, like, if you're a little bit cynical or skeptical like me, you kind of roll your eyes a little bit and you're like, oh. But I, I really think that that is going to become more and more important in the next couple of years, you know, and it's something we've been talking about it for years, right? I was writing stories about like brands trying to be more sustainable 15 years ago in the, in the apparel industry. Um, but I think we're getting to a tipping point. I think it's going to be, I think we could have this sort of watershed moment in the way I don't want to, in the way that in 2020 was a watershed moment for racial equity. I think we could have that for sustainability in some way, shape or form in the next couple of years where sustainability is just going to become um, a must have, a must do. And consumers are going to are starting to care more and more about it if their search queries are in or any indication. So I really think brands need to take a close look at that now, because if they wait, it's going to be they're going to be on their back foot. It's going to feel like lip service when they do start doing it. I appreciate that. So if I if I could take a, a step back step backwards in, in terms of that question as well, you know, what trends or trends are are you and the team at Google watching the most closely aside from from the major ones right now and and the the ones that you guys are foreseeing for the future? I mean, we're really looking at kind of all of this really really closely right now to see what's going to stick. Um, mm -hmm. We've been running research looking at kind of different scenarios. If you go to thinkwithgoogle.com right now, I, I believe it's Stellar's top, top story. Um, we've got this research where we're looking at, okay, in different scenarios, in a scenario where um, kind of things go back to normal and we have kind of a smooth recovery, how are people gonna behave? And in a, in a scenario where there's sort of this bumpier recovery or we have kind of rolling lockdowns, how are people going to behave? And we we did surveys to kind of look at how people thought they would behave across a bunch of different metrics. Um, so we're really, really focused on that piece and trying to understand what exactly <laughs> exactly what we've been talking about, like what is actually going to stick, what's what's happening in that crystal ball. Awesome. And I have one last question that just came in from the chat. It's a mix between a, a comment and a question. So I'm, I'm more or less just going to read it. It's from, from Adam. Um, you said you loved your analysis. Uh, you've done some fantastic co-marketing in this presentation with Panera, Shishido, and a few others. Um, this support, this, this sort of marketing support would be life-changing for small businesses. How long before brands prioritize small business as part of their co-marketing strategy? Um, well, it's an interesting question. I hadn't thought of it as co-marketing. I just thought it was I just thought they were interesting examples. Um, so certainly, I think you know, as regard, good ideas come from everywhere, right? So Panera, you know, big domestic brand. Uh, the Malaysia example is a smaller company that's you know in in APAC. So I, it was less about co-marketing for me and more about just finding some cool examples that I thought might might inspire the audience. For sure, for sure. Um, that that more or less more or less wraps us up. I, I didn't know Natalie if you wanted to share any one last thoughts with with everyone that's joining us here. Um, if there's any last minute comments that you no, have. I I hope it was helpful. Um, this is just a you know this is kind of the tip of the iceberg. You know I only included a couple of search queries for each of the trends, um, but poured through a bunch of them. And we've got um, there's lots more on Think with Google. If anybody is interested in checking out more of the search data, we publish um, you know on a rolling basis, we publish all of the information that, that we're finding um, and try to package it up and make it interesting and and kind of do some analysis for you all as well. Absolutely. I know I'm, I'm, me and my team are on there at least weekly. So we appreciate everything that, that you and the team are putting together for us. So um, really appreciate you, you, you taking the time to join us today. Um, we'll, we'll definitely have to keep in touch in terms of in terms of what's trending and, and what's changing in the in the e-commerce world. But um, with that, you know, we're, we're going to jump into uh, another break, I, I think, and do a quick break. Some a magic show. Oh no, I lied. We've got to we've got to prepare for a cookieless world. You know, my favorite topic, a world without Oreos. No, I'm just kidding, guys. That would be terrible. But it if that did happen, that we'd have to solve that really quickly. But um, one of the one of the topics that we do get asked a lot at, from our from our clients from a lot of the prospects that we do speak with potential clients, and it, it comes up on a, a variety of the, the webinars that we host as well, but how will, how will we, oh, sorry, let me take a break. 
what are the different implications for retailers in these businesses and how is a cookie-less world really going to impact us? Um, for those that, that are more interested in this, you know, we, we do have a free uh, downloadable ebook at netelixir.com slash connecting the dots um, where, where you can take a look at, at what, what's going to be potentially happening. What are our thoughts about it? But coming up in a future future session with Alex and you, Dane, where we're going to talk and dig a little bit more deeper into it. They're going to have a live Q&A session on how does this impact retailers? How is this going to impact your business? And and how can we, can we navigate this world together? Because I think this is a, a topic that Everyone needs to start to work together on it's not a it's not a free for all in terms of in terms of one doing better than the other because it will impact us from a, a marketing standpoint standpoint overall. So feel free to, to jump into that in in terms of getting the downloadable ebook. Our, our team did a fantastic job with putting this together. Um, so again, netelixircom slash connect the dots, and I believe it's also going to be in the in the chat box that you have there. Um, so with that, transitioning into into our, our next piece, uh, I know this is a little bit of a break right around lunchtime on the East Coast for us. So um, I hope you guys had some some chance to, to, to understand everything that, that Jerry and Natalie put together for us, and there's some great takeaways, but we'll break it up. We'll keep it a little bit light for you guys um, from the data, the insights, the ideas, but don't go far. Keelan Lester, um, a, a an interactive magician, a mind reading. We're gonna have a quick entertainment break. So if you have, if you are working from home, if you have kids around, family members that do wanna come by, take a look and see what's gonna be happening here. Um, we're gonna dig through that in, in roughly a couple minutes, but you know, I'm kind of a mind reader myself and uh, an illusionist, ready? How's that? So, Stay tuned. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. I'm just kidding, guys. But anyway, without further ado, I'd, I'd love to introduce Keelan Lesser to, to take us through this, through this quick break. So it was Kevin Spacey's character in The Usual Suspects. But either way, please welcome the fabulous Keelan Laser. Put your hands together for Keelan Laser Digital Illusion. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you this amazing act. He has performed in over 60 countries. He has been on over 100 television shows. His YouTube videos are in the tens of millions of views. He was voted British Magic Champion by his peers back in the UK. From London to Las Vegas. And now all the way from his living room. Please welcome Keelan Laser. Well, hello everyone to the magic of innovation. My name, as you've heard, is Keelan Laser. And over the next few minutes, I'm going to give you a fascinating insight into this virtual world of magic and mentalism. But before I start, I need to give you all a quick test to see how susceptible you all are to magic. And what I mean by that is a quick test to see how susceptible you all are to deception. So I need you all to do and try this all at home if you're watching from the stream and for the people on the Zoom side, I want you to put your hands out in front of you and give them a shake. You'll do that. And then turn the palm of your hands outwards. Your thumbs are towards the ground and the back of your hands are facing each other. And hopefully we'll be able to see you in my stream in a second as well. There we go. And I want you to cross your hands over and clasp your hands together like that. Let's have a look. I can see Will doing that, Shannon doing that, Erin perfectly. Um, uh, Pushkara, Pushkara, yeah, you've got that as well. Pu 
point your thumbs to the ground. Point your thumbs to the ground like this. Now, without clenching your hands, without folding them in, I just want you all to copy me. Do this. Keep your hands out straight. And now just do this. You see, magic is about deception and you have just been deceived. Now, there's going to be kind of a lot of these psychological tests throughout this session. A lot of the mind reading and mentalism is going to happen in your good selves. We're going to be talking a little bit about whether we've got free will or whether we're predetermined. But before I get into all of that, the title of this uh, session is The Magic of Innovation. And we've all had to innovate and pivot over the last 12 months. I've uh, gone from performing in Las Vegas to back in London, performing now virtually out of my one of my spare bedrooms. Now, uh, I've been ordering more online in the last 12 months than I have in my entire life. Show of hands, you've been ordering more on Amazon in the last 12 months than you have in your entire life. Show of hands, let's have a look. Yep, pr pretty much uh, a full house there. And show of hands, by contrast, how many of you have been utilizing Google Shopping? Any Google shoppers? No one, okay, well, oh yeah, well, well there, okay. Well, the reason why I like uh, Google Shopping is for this reason. I'm not sure if you're familiar with one of their uh, sort of lockdown initiatives. You go to Google and let's say you type in, I was watching uh, an interview with uh, Serena Williams, actually, the other day, tennis player. So let me just type in a tennis uh, ball, T-E-N-N-I-S, there we go, and ball, B-A, there we go. It's come up, tennis ball. And we're going to go not to the images, but to the shopping section and choose something that we like, for example, this one. What's quite nice about Google Shopping uh, these days is the fact you just reach and they just pop it straight out into reality. I'm not sure if you are familiar with that. I'm not sure if you are familiar with Amazon sort of a lockdown initiative as well. Show of hands if you're not just like an Amazon user, but you're like a hardcore Amazon Prime member. Do you have any of those in the group? Let's have a look at you all. Let's have a look. Uh, yeah, okay. Or almost a full house as well. Uh, the reason why I like Amazon Prime is that their deliveries are, again, normally than 24 to 48 hours on a majority of the items, but they have this kind of lockdown initiative as well, where you literally just uh, pop something into your cart and then you just reach in there, pop it straight out into reality. And it makes my lockdown a lot less stressful. I don't have to deal with delivery drivers anymore. I never run out of hand sanitizer or toilet roll. So I thoroughly recommend you trying this out at home. Now I'm going to be utilizing this pack of cards in a second, but I need to do another psychological test on you all. So I need you to sit back. I need you to relax. Um, actually, no, I'm going to do a psychological test with one person, then I'm going to expand out to the entire group. Let me do that. Start off with one person, then expand out to the entire group. So I need someone who's going to be honest. I need someone who's going to be reliable. I need someone who's highly intelligent. And because we all have to look at you on the screen, someone who is incredibly good looking. Let me have a look at you all. Let me have a look. Let me have a look. Will Alexander. Will Alexander. Will Alexander, will, would you, Will, 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 will you unmute yourself, Will, and would you choose someone who fits that description? Um, I'm only kidding, Will, you're going to be perfect for this, my friend. You're going to be perfect. All you need to do is utilize your imagination, Will. That's all you're going to need to do. We're going to go to this top camera right here, and you will see right off the bat, just like COVID, I have four queens sitting on this table. The Queen of Hearts, Diamonds, Bays, and Clubs. Uh, two red queens, two black queens, and I'm going to remove two of these queens, but I'm going to do it invisibly. That, Will, is where your imagination comes in. I'm going to be removing two of them invisibly. They're either going to be the two red queens like the fox, or they're going to be the two black queens like the uh, pen lid there, but they're going to be two queens of the same colour, and I'm going to do it invisibly like this. One, two, there, two queens, taken them out, and I've placed them on the palm of my hand. Now, which two queens have I removed, Will? Is it the two red queens, or is it the two black queens? The two red ones. Absolutely spot on. I don't know how you do it. You get it right every time. It is the two red queens. I'm going to throw them away like an old shoe. There. Now I have uh, left with the two black queens, the queen of spades and the queen of clubs. I'm going to remove one of those and throw it away as well. So I removed it, place it upon my hand. I'm going to throw it away with the two red queens. Is it the queen of spades or is it the queen of clubs that I'm throwing away? The queen of clubs. Absolutely spot on. So I'm left with the queen of spades. See there, I was right there. He was absolutely right. I am left with the queen of spades. I was so sure I would be left with the queen of spades. So unbelievably sure that Will would be left with the queen of spades. I actually popped it on and read back. I was so unbelievably sure Will would be left with the queen of spades. I actually didn't even bother bringing any of the other queens to the table. Please give Will a big round of applause for starting this process off. Oh, thank you, Will. Now, the rest of you. I need you to, we're going to do another psychological test. So I need you to sit back. I need you to relax. I need you to make your minds go bank, which obviously for Will is really quick, but for everybody else, <laughs> very well. I need you to stare straight to the center of this spiral. Keep staring straight to the center of this spiral for a few seconds. And I'm going to ask you to look 
at the back of your hands. Keep staring, staring, staring right into the center of the spiral. Five, four, keep staring, three, two, one. And now I want you all to look at the back of your hands now. Stare at the back of your hands. If it looks like your skin is crawling, moving, warping, morphing, if that worked for you, if that worked for you, give me a wave. If it worked for you, give me a wave. If your skin is, okay, worked really well for Erin. Erin, unmute yourself, Erin. We're gonna bring you into my feed so we can have a little chat. Hello, Erin. We can't hear you too clearly. Is your mic nice and loud? Are you near, near the mic at all? Just say hello again. Hi, hello. Oh, perfect, we can hear you nice and clear now. <laughs> Erin, can you see this glass? Here. Yes. Good. Can you see this white card right here? Yes. I have drawn something on the back of this card, Erin. I'm placing the glasses off the table so it's a little bit clearer for you to see. Uh, now, Erin, a yes or no question, Erin. Do you own a pet? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. I don't want you to think of the type of animal that pet is because in today's society with open Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, uh, Instagram profiles, there may be a way uh, that you or your family have uploaded a picture with you and your pet as a profile picture. And may, there's maybe ways in today to find out whether you've got, you own a pet. So I don't need to think of the uh, pet. I want you to think of a completely different, unrelated animal to that pet. It doesn't have to be a pet. It can be any animal that's completely unrelated to that pet. You have another animal in your mind. Yes. Good. I now want you to change your mind a third time. So you had your pet in your mind. You morphed into another animal. Now you're morphing into a different animal that's completely different to the first two animals. Again, it doesn't have to be a pet, it can be any animal on the planet. Do you have another animal in mind? Yes. Good. That is the one I'm really interested in, this third one, because this is the one that was deep rooted back into your subconscious, something you didn't know you were going to think about a few moments ago. So for the first time, tell everyone here at Connecting the Dots, what is that third animal? A horse. A horse. Now I want you to name this horse. Now, I don't want you to think, before you think of the first sort of horse name that comes into your mind, there may be some obvious choices like Black Beauty. There may be, a, I think there's a famous horse in Shrek, the, the Pixar Disney movie. I don't want you to think of any of those names. I also don't want you to think of any names associated with any pets that you've had in the past or currently have or pets that you know. I want a completely unique name for your own unique horse. What would you call your own horse? Um, Charlie. Charlie. Love it. Charlie the horse, ladies and gentlemen. Is uh, 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 out of interest, what was the second animal that you thought of? Uh, a sheep. A sheep, okay. And what pet do you own? Is it a, a dog or a cat or? Both. You own a dog and a cat. Okay, that's right. Dog and a cat. And that is the reason why I get people to change their minds a few times. Because you ask 100 people to name an animal, the chances are, statistically speaking, they're all going to name either a dog or a cat. Normally, even if they own a cat, they would normally say a dog. So if you want to read people's minds, just tell them to think of an animal and the chance that it's going to be a dog. So I get people to change their minds again and again. And that's when you end up with a, a choice that is usually a little bit unorthodox, like a platypus or a, a snake or, in your case, a horse. Now, I'm going to show you what I have drawn on here. If this looks more like a horse than it does um, a sheep or a dog, I will class this as a success. And the way this works is that, that spiral is causing a pattern on your hand. It's what's called a retinal arthenym image. It was forming a pattern on the back of your hand. The pattern it was forming actually looks like this. Looks like a horse, right? Just in case there was any confusion, you think it's a pony or something like that, I'm doing something dodgy. I actually wrote the word horse, just in case there was any confusion. But what really confuses me with this is that I also called mine, Erin, Charlie. Charlie wow. the horse, ladies and gentlemen. Charlie the horse. What else would you call a horse? Except for Charlie the horse. Now, Show of hands, and we're going to go to a sort of a gallery view so we can see you. Show of hands if you believe in uh, that there are people on this planet that can predict the future. I know Erin probably does now because she's just experienced it for herself. But if you if you believe that, okay, there's more than I expected. I expect you to be uh, more skeptics, but you are believers, and maybe I've convinced you early on. But there, there are a lot of people that are kind of skeptical about that kind of thing. Now, uh, there are people that predict the future. There are weather forecasters that are known to predict the future occasionally. There are, um, there are uh, scientists, there are, um, mathemat yeah, there are mathematicians, there are economists, there are philosophers that predict the future, there are uh, politicians that believe they can predict the future. Um, and there are a group of clairvoyants that's made more accurate predictions than anyone on the planet. A specific group of clairvoyants is a group of people, a group of uh, characters known as The Simpsons. The Simpsons is um, 
the greatest clairvoyance of them all. And I'm going to show you exactly why. Normally, I would play a video that lasts a few minutes with this, but we don't have time for that. So we're going to go straight into this. So we're going to go back to me. And, um, and, and I'm going to give you a, an example of why I think the Simpsons are the greatest clairvoyance on the planet. And they, they have predicted things like President Trump's election. They predicted it in like... Uh, 2000 and it came and it came true in 2016 if you just google how many predictions that the simpsons had made during their time that i think you'll be quite uh, quite amazed now i know what you're thinking the simpsons is the longest running tv show in american history with 635 episodes so statistically speaking they're bound to make some accurate predictions along the way what i'm about to show you really freaked me out because the probability of this appeared too great i found an image on from The Simpsons on Google that I thought I had to bring to my show and test this theory out. So I'm gonna do something quite rare in mind reading and mentalism by showing you what's gonna happen in the future before it's even taken place. So you can see this thing unfold into reality. Before this, I need three skeptics to hide your eyes while everybody else gets out your cell phones, your mobile phones, and takes a photo of what I'm about to show you on the screen. And you can do this at home as well if you're watching on the stream. So then you can show those three people that what you took a photo of is what you took a photo of and nothing has been changed. I'm going to ask uh, Lee, Shannon and Pushkara to uh, unmute yourselves and you should see yourselves around about here. If you see yourselves around about here, unmute yourselves. So we're going to say Lee, just say hello to make sure we can hear you. Hello. Hello, Lee. And uh, Shannon, just say hello to make sure we can hear you nice and clearly. Hello. Hello. And uh, Pushkara, am I saying your name correctly, Pushkara? Yes, it's correct. Correct. Perfect. Hi. I want the three of you to take the palms of your hands like this. I want you to cover over your eye sockets like this. I want everybody else to get out your cell phones, your mobile phones, and take a photo of what I'm about to show you on the screen. Please do this at home as well, because you can always WhatsApp it or send it to these people later on or put it on the, you know, Instagram or whatever. So, okay, your three, your eyes are shut. Everybody else, get your cell phones out ready and take a photo of this. Keep your eyes shut, you three. I can see Erin taking a photo, Will taking a photo, and I think Heather's just about to take a photo as well. So the three of you have taken a photo. Uh, give us a wave, Will and Erin, and uh, Heather, if you're taking a photo, perfect. It is locked on your phone, it's date stamped back in time. We are now gonna go back to me. We're gonna go back to this top camera, and we are going to get my friends to unmute your eyes. You can unmute your eyes, you three. Uh, we have uh, Shannon and we have Bushkara. Okay, so the three of you, I have a pack of cards right here. It's not a full pack because I've taken out the Jokers. Because, you know, we didn't need those because, you know, we've got Will Alexander here. <laughs> Sorry, Will. I have written on the back of every single card the numbers 1 to 52. So each card is an individual number associated with it. So we have the number 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way through that pack of cards. There is one number on each card. The numbers do not repeat, and uh, the cards are nicely shuffled. So there's one number between 1 and 52 on each card. Lee, I want you to... Actually, Lee, I'm going to do something different with you. Uh, Shannon, I want you to choose a number for me between 1 and 52. Any number, Shannon, between 1 and 52, what would you like? Uh, 28. 28. Okay. Uh, Pushkara, I want you, as Shannon's chosen an even number, I want you to vary this for me and choose an odd number. So 369, etc. Between 1 and 52, any odd number of your choosing. 13. 13. Unlucky for some, but hopefully lucky for Pushkara. And Lee, I want you to, you to do something different. I want you to choose a playing card for me. Now, bear in mind, the Ace of Spades is the most popular chosen cards in the pack. So when you see on all the, mov so when you see on the mov movies, the TV shows, or surely followed by the Queen of Hearts. That is the most popular chosen card by females. Now you can have one of those two cards if you want. I'm just telling the statistics. You do have 50 other cards you could possibly choose from as well. Which playing card would you like from a deck of cards, Lee? Okay, I'm glad you didn't ask me to add those numbers. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna say the King of Hearts. The King of Hearts. Okay, the King of Hearts. Let me just briefly draw that there. Okay, so the King of Hearts 28 and 13. We are going to look for the King of Hearts 28 and 13. If you see any of those cards, do give do shout out at me, uh, you three, because I do have a concentration span of a goldfish, and I've got a lot to get through, so I have, do have a tendency to go past them. So we're looking for 28 and 13 to start off with. Oh, look at that. It was like it was meant to be, wasn't it? It was like it was meant to be right there. 13, Pushkara. We're also looking for 28. If you see 28, give me a shout. We're looking for number 28. If you see 28, Give me a shout, scream at me um, to make sure that I do not go past it because we want your choice and your choice only. So let me have a look. If you see it, scream at me. There we go. It's there, 28. Okay. And we're also looking for the King of Hearts. The King of Hearts, which is Lee's choice. 
Let me look for the King of Hearts. If you see the King of Hearts, give me a shout. There's the Queen. But we are looking for the husband, which is right there next to the okay. other king there. So three cards, three choices, three people. I... Now, what I find really fascinating with this, three cards, three choices, three people, uh, we're going to replace you three with the prediction. This is what everyone has on their phone. Now, if you're one of the few people at the top there, we've got Heather, we've got Lee. They can show you that this is what they took a photo of. Hopefully you are home as well. If you're watching on the stream, you also took a photo of this. Now, the fact is, the fact is, Pushkar, I said it was unlucky 13, but it is lucky for some. It is lucky for some and it's lucky for you. And it's lucky for me because it had to be card 13. The reason why it had to be card 13, Pushkar, is because card 13 is in fact the Jack of Hearts. You see, it had to be 28, Shannon. It had to be 28 because card 28, Shannon, is in fact the Seven of Spades. And you see, it had to be the King of Hearts. I know I pushed you away from the Ace of Hearts and the Queen of uh, the Ace of Spades and the Queen of Hearts, but you did have 50 other cards to choose from, but you went for the King of Hearts because you had to, because the King of Hearts is in fact card 27. And that, my friends, is the exact reason why I think the Simpsons are the greatest clairvoyance of them all. <laughs> Show of hands if you believe in clairvoyance now. Show of hands if you believe in clairvoyance. Okay, yeah, we have a few more believers. Good, okay. Well, I only have a few moments left, so I'm gonna ski through this. I've been doing, I do a lot of uh, illusions with technology. If you look at my Instagram and my uh, Facebook uh, and my uh, YouTube videos, you'll see I do a lot of illusions with technology, with drones, artificial intelligence and stuff like that, and robotics and holograms. So much so that I worked with uh, a psychologist and a, and a, a psychologist and an enge engineer to come up with this uh, software that using GAN technology to, uh, as a form of AI that pushes thought into people's subconscious. It doesn't work with everybody, only works with certain types of people that pass this test. So what I want you to do, I want you to sit back, relax, and uh, count how many times this ball bounces I'm about to show you. Now, before I get into all that, I just want to show you that I've actually, when you're all coming into this sort of thread, I actually wrote uh, a few notes down on my phone. Then I took my new phone and I filmed myself holding my old phone to my new phone, therefore trapping it on a video on my old phone, and I airdropped it across. And it looks like this. So it's a little prediction, a bit like the Simpsons video uh, uh, picture on your phone. I've actually now put a prediction on my phone that's on a video, and I'm going to show you that video in a moment. I've also written some notes down on a piece of paper, hold that piece of paper up, place a piece of paper in an envelope, place the envelope into my wallet, and I'm going to show you that also in a moment. So what I want you to do now, I want you to stare at this video, count how many times this white ball bounces across the screen now. Okay, so we're going to go straight to Shannon for this. Shannon, it looked like you had laser vision there, burning your eyes with your screen. So I'll be burning the screen with your eyes, I should say. So I'll be inter interested to know what you came up with. What did you come up with? I counted six. Perfect. And that's why I chose you, because I knew you. your mind was on the job. Six. Show of hands and be honest with me. We're going to go to a gallery view. Hopefully you can see this. So um, show of hands if you also got six. Show of hands if you also got six. Okay, so we have uh, uh, Pushkara got six, Heather got six, Lee got six, Will didn't get six. N no surprise there. Um, <laughs> sorry, Lee. Okay, perfect. We have a few of you. Um, uh, Pushkara. Okay, perfect. Now, I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine, Shannon, that we've all been vaccinated with every different possible strand of this mutated virus, and it means you go anywhere on the planet. If you go anywhere on the planet, where would you go? Uh, and it's got to be a place you've never been to before. That's the only stipulation. It's got to be a place you've never been to before on vacation for a few weeks. Where would you go? Uh, the Bahamas. Bahamas. We're going to the Bahamas, ladies and gentlemen. Bahamas. Let me quickly write that down. Good. We are now going to go back to Lee. Lee, unmute yourself, Lee. Lee, I want you to choose uh, some a celebrity to take with us to the Bahamas. And it's got to be someone we all here would know, like a big Hollywood movie star, a big sports star, a big famous Seeing out of extremely desperately a politician, but someone you're going to have fun with in the Bahamas, who would it be? I don't know. That's a rough one. I'm going to say, I don't know, Michael Jordan. I'm from Chicago. Michael Jordan. Okay, good choice. Michael Jordan. All right, he is an A-lister beyond all proportions, so he's definitely going to go first class. We also need some food for this trip, so we're going to go to Pushkara. Pushkara, what food would you like to, for, to eat with Michael, Jack, uh, Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan, in the Bahamas? Is it going to be... Uh, British fish and chips, American burger, pizza, pasta, Italian curry, Thai curry, sushi, uh, whatever, Paella. What kind of food would you like to eat, Pushkara, with Michael Jordan in the Bahamas? Unmute yourself and let us know. Um, a pizza. 
A pizza. We are having a pizza with Michael Jordan. And lastly, we need a cost for this trip. So everyone get out your phones for me, open up your calculators. And I want you all to quickly think of a year that is important to you. Not 2020 or 2021. They're important to everybody. I want a year that something nice happened in your past. We're going to go to Will with this. Will, unmute yourself, Will, and give me a year that is important to you. Something nice happened in your past year. What year was that? Uh, 1993. 1993, everyone punch in 1993 into your calculators, all press plus. Follow along as well at home if you're watching this, not on the Zoom side, but on the stream. And uh, uh, Erin, give me a year that's important to you. Uh, 2019. Do you say 2019? Yes. Everyone add 2019 to that to total, press equals, you have 4012. And we're going to go to um, Shannon. No, uh, yeah, Shannon, Shannon, give me everyone press plus. Shannon, give me a year that's important to you. Uh, 2018. 2018. Everyone add 2018 to that. All press equals. You should have 6030. If you do, show us your phones. Are you there? Perfect. You are there. Every Okay. Uh, I reckon this is going to cost more than $6,000. So I'm going to add. This is Michael Jordan. He's going to. That's not going to cover his airfare. So I'm going to press plus. I'm going to add some digits to this. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to look away. I'm going to add, let's say, five random digits to this. So here goes. Ready, uh, one, two, three, four, and five. I want you all to add 54,991. All add 54,991 to that total. 54,991 to that total. All press equals, you should all have 61,021. If you do, show us your phones, you all with me. Thank you, Will, thank you, Aaron, thank you, Heather, perfect. Okay, do you remember I mentioned about my wallet a little bit earlier on? I wanna show you the contents of that. That is about right, probably, for Michael Jordan, a, an a cast basketball player. So I, I wanna show you the contents here. Don't get excited, there isn't $60,000. Um, I'm an entertainer in the pandemic, trust me, that's not gonna happen. But I wanna show you what is inside, inside here. In the old world, I'll hand this out to you, but it's unsanitary to do these days. So I'm just gonna show you what is inside. You can see this envelope is sealed all the way around. I'm not gonna take this off the screen, because I want you to see exactly what is inside there is this little note and inside this note is a message that says i had a dream that i went on a trip and i flew about 12 hours from the united kingdom to the bahamas and on this trip i went into first class i went into first class take a selfie just to post on facebook and then you never guess who was right there michael jordan was there tucking into a very unhealthy pizza which was not like him it was not like him, but he took out the whole of first class, so no one could see except for me, because the total trip cost him a whopping 61,000 and a 21. But do you remember I mentioned about my video as well? I want to show you that video right here. You can see it says quite clearly, and it says, I had a dream that I went on a trip to the Bahamas with Michael Jordan. We ate pizza and the total trip cost 61,000 and 21 dollars, ladies and gentlemen. But do you know something interesting about that number? Do you know something interesting about that number? You see, it had to be 61,000, didn't it? It had to be 61,021. It had to be 61,000 because it's the sixth month of June, the 10th day, which is today, 2021. That is today's date. The reason why we're all here today for Netherlinks are connecting the dots, ladies and gentlemen. I have one more and I have a couple of minutes left. A couple of minutes to show you one more. Show of hands if you're watching Netflix more in this lockdown period than you have in your entire life. Show of hands. Yes, pretty much a full house. Okay, Heather put her hand straight up there. So we're gonna to go to, to Heather. Heather, I have a list on my phone of 100 different movies written from one to 99. You should be familiar with most of these movies. They're mainly Hollywood movies, but there's a few there that you may not know, a few Bollywood movies, a few, uh, if you're listening to subtitled Hindi movies, you may know, may not know those. There's a few French movies that you may or may not know, but you should know the vast majority. And I have a prediction right here. All you need to do is choose a number between one and 99. We're gonna go down to that number on the list and find out what movie your number rests on. So choose a number between one and 99, Heather. It could be a number that means something to you or just a random number that pops into your mind. What number would you like? 85. Did you say 85? Mm -hmm. Is that a number that means something to you? Yes. yes. Is What does it mean? Uh, my birthday is August 5th. So eight, five. August 5th, 1980. Okay, so it does mean something to you. Perfect. Okay, I like that. We're going to go to the top camera there. Uh, and so you can see. And we're going to go to number 85 on the list and see whether we've got a good movie or whether we have a dud movie. So can you see that list uh, quite clearly on your screen, Heather? Yes. Good, we've got Superman, we've got The Godfather. Let's say you've chosen, uh, I don't know, number 12. You would have got Top Gun. If you've chosen, say, number 13, you would have got a movie about my ex-girlfriend. But you chose number 85. Let me scroll down to 85. You can see Rocky's at 40, 50's at Jaws. Uh, let me go down to 85. 
Can you see what 85 is? Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park. Have you seen that movie? Yes. Yeah. Good movie or dumb movie? That's a good movie. A good movie. Okay. We're going to load up uh, um, Netflix. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Netflix backstory, but Netflix started their business not by streaming movies, but by selling DVDs. Oh, don't look at my history. Let me get rid of that. Then uh, competing with a company called Blockbuster Video. Then they knocked Blockbuster out of business, basically. And now they're the biggest streaming site on the planet. There's only one Blockbuster store in the US. There's none in the UK. What people don't realize, though, they still offer a DVD service. You just need to know how to access it. And it's by voice recognition. You just say 85 uh, Jurassic Park and you find you get it right there. People don't realize that. See, magic of innovation. People don't realize that you can take it and you can just sort of peel it off there into reality. People just don't realize that. Now, if I was to pop this into a player, it would play Jurassic Park 85. But no one believed me because we don't have players anymore. Actually, I can show you. Because this is 85 Jurassic Park. You see right there. Had to be 85. Had to be Jurassic Park. Had to be because of this. This was my prediction. So this was my prediction. And the reason why it's my prediction is because it had to be number 85. It had to be 85 because it says Jurassic Park. You will choose 85. It had to be Jurassic Park. It couldn't have been anything else. It had to be Jurassic Park. It had to be 85. In fact, let me grab my camera. There is one more thing I want to say. That is, I hope to see you in person someday soon. But until then, stay safe, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much for supporting me. My name is Keith Laser. Please connect on social media, but I'm going to pass you back to the very capable hands of Marwick. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Bye for now. Awesome. Thanks, Keelan. That was amazing. Um, if anyone is uh, impacted by the cicadas, it kind of sounds like Jurassic Park a little bit out here, too. So, Heather, you did a great job. You nailed it. Um, but perfect, perfect. Hope everyone enjoyed that little break uh, with that. You know, we hope you had a chance to, to grab a snack, grab a drink. If you're home, maybe move the laundry over. It's laundry day. Um, so we'll, we'll jump right into the next one. You know, I, I really wanted to move into our, our next topic that, that really focuses in on with, with David Bell. David Bell is the co-founder and president of Idea Farm Ventures, or, or IFV, as, as some, who, some people know it. Um, many folks know David as the, the guru of D2C movement, and he has a vast, vast background in terms of digital marketing, e-commerce. And without that, he's also had a 20-year academic career at the Wharton School as a, as a chaired professor. So today, David's going to take us through, through his topic and the playbook of D2C, and with that, I'd love to introduce David Bell to, to kind of take over. Hey, Marvik, thanks a lot. Well, I, I don't know who to blame for putting me after uh, Kaylin and all that magic. You know, we're going from the magic to the prosaic, but, you know, we'll try and do what we can with that. So thanks for the intro and thanks for the whole team for setting this up. So what we're going to run through for the next uh, 45 minutes is this playbook of D2C. Um, that's the, the title. So what are some of the things that have happened in the D2C community, some of the brands that are emerging and some of the really things to think about as you build your own D2C companies uh, and also as you think about investing in companies. So that's kind of the viewpoint, the consumer lens, the builder lens and the investor lens. So just a little bit about me. I appreciate the intro, Marvik. So just, you know, how did I end up uh, getting into this space? So Years ago, when I came to the United States, I'm originally not from the US, as you might imagine, from the accent, came from New Zealand, and there was a whole cottage industry of uh, people analyzing data from supermarkets. That's kind of like the lab rats uh, of, uh, of marketing and, uh, and studying barcode scanners to understand, you know, if Coke drops the price, do people switch from Pepsi? Do they buy more soft drink? Do they change store behavior? Do they stockpile and so on? Uh, and then the internet sort of rolled along, gosh, I guess about 20 years ago, but uh, a little bit after that, uh, great founder, Mark Law, who founded, you may know, Jet.com, which he sold to Walmart for $3.3 billion. He's doing all kinds of other cool things now in the cities of the future. But the first company that he founded was Quidzy, which was the holding company, and the biggest website was Diapers.com, and he sold that to Amazon um, for $545 million in 2011. So I was involved in that company as an investor and also as a researcher, really trying to understand what was the difference between the picture on the left where, you know, Heather goes into the supermarket, she's thinking about what to buy. The supermarket run by Marvik has a constrained trading area. These are the, the picture on the left where now you can effectively sell into the whole country. What does that look like? Now, a little bit later on, around sort of 2010, 2011, there were early companies like Harry's and Warby Parker kind of showing their 
in the screen. And these were the so-called first D to C or direct to consumer companies. Um, those companies now are still in existence, valued at uh, over the magic billion dollars. And uh, as a result of all that experience, I ended up founding with a good friend of mine a few years ago, Idea Farm Ventures. So we look to invest in companies um, who basically do the stuff on the right, but also very importantly, don't neglect the stuff on the left. So with that in mind, let me go into how we're going to start out. So this sort of D to C playbook, I think, really has to be understood in context. So uh, D to C companies effectively are selling to consumers, consumers used to and still buy in retail environments. So what's been the evolution of the location in which people kind of buy stuff? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, then we'll get into some underlying principles. There's no magic, uh, Marvik, I'm afraid, but uh, there is a formula. You know, I, I can't shake off uh, those all those 20 years at Wharton. I know Jerry Wind would be very disappointed if there was no formula in the slide. So we'll talk about some of the underlying principles that are driving these new companies. Uh, and then I'll give a little acronym. I'm a big fan of uh, acronyms. If, if you know me, that's one of the things I kind of like. Um, and the DTC playbook that we're going to talk through today is something that I've termed the Edmund Hillary economy. I'm from New Zealand, Edmund Hillary, as you may know, with Tenzing Norgay uh, several years ago, decades ago, uh, ascended Mount Everest. And he had some interesting things to say about that accomplishment that I think lead us into DTC. And of course, as we go through this, there'll also be some practical examples as well. So let's kick it off with the location piece. <clears throat> location, location, location <clears throat> is kind of the mantra for um, consumer behavior, shopping, retail, and so on. And when we think about the D to C playbook, it's really critical to think of that really in terms of three different levers and what that historical kind of context teaches us. So, you know, 100 years ago, location, location, location was the physical store. You know, where do Marvik and I locate our coffee shop? The determination of where that goes is going to have a measurable impact on whether or not we're successful. Uh, the good news about that <clears throat> is we know where the customers are going to be located. They're going to be in close proximity to the store. The bad news is the trading area is going to be rather limited. So if we had a store on the corner of 38th and Walnut, there's a predefined trading area that drops off pretty quickly. So we know where customers are good, but the market's small. Then along came e-commerce and e-commerce is kind of the converse. The good news is, you know, Mark Law could sell into the entire uh, United States via diapers.com, customers in Virginia, customers in Portland, everybody could access it. That's great. The bad news is how does he acquire customers at low cost of acquisition and how do people get to know about them? Uh, and now, of course, we're in 2021. We're in the world of where all of those things get combined together online and offline. And I think it's really important to remember that when a lot of the early D to C companies Companies launched, they never ever envisioned that they would actually have any kind of physical presence. There was a whole mantra about a decade ago that the physical world would die. Uh, and if you wanted to do things like e-commerce and build brands, that would all be done through the internet. Of course, we know today that's not true. So the evolution of location from a physical location to a location of customers, where are my customers clustering uh, geographically, to now thinking about evolution of a location in terms of what are the activities that I have to perform both online and offline to attract customers to my brand. So um, a couple of years ago, we wrote some uh, research around this that I'll get to in a moment, but I think really just kind of ram the point home. This event actually happened on the same day. Uh, I won't ask anybody because I can't cold call anybody right now as to when this was, but it was actually in June, believe it or not, 2017. And on the same day, uh, Amazon, the world's largest online company, acquired Whole Foods, which is obviously an offline entity, and then Walmart, the world's largest offline retailer, acquired Bonobos, which was a men's clothing company um, started at Stanford that I was also an investor in. So what was interesting is you see like as a real visceral reaction, online and offline both coming together. So we know that that happens to be true. So how do we navigate the D2C playbook in that context? Well, a couple of years ago, um, we did some research at Idea Farm thinking around the core functions that you have to perform. One is delivering experience to customers. The other is fulfilling product. Uh, and in the old days, experience and product all happened in an offline environment. I go into Macy's and I buy this uh, sweater. Uh, then came sweaters.com. Okay, I go online, I read reviews, I get all the information, and I have that experiential exchange online. I watch videos, I read reviews, and fulfillment's also online because the product is shipped to me. But now, of course, the world is the combination of all four of those things. So Heather could go to tiffany.com, as I did for my nieces last Christmas. I buy product there, and then I go and I physically fulfill it in the store. Or you could go to a Warby Parker showroom, have a great experience about the brand, and then buy the product online. So now we're navigating information and experiential, whether it's online or offline, and fulfillment online and offline. Okay, 
Uh, I'll skip over that one, but this one's kind of hard to hard to read, but I'll, I'll mention what it is. The previous article uh, we wrote, which was called uh, The Store is Dead, Long Live the Store. I, I think the editor was British. I don't know if it was Keelan or not, but, uh, you know, the king is dead, long live the king. And the idea there was in 2020, 2021, there's a lot of retail that's really dying and dead, but there's also a lot of real retail that's really, really great. And there's a lot of experiential stuff happening, whether it's the Museum of Ice Cream or whether it's brands like Third Love that just have fantastic stores in New York. So the notion here is brands that really leaned into physical that were much more experiential in nature tended to do really, really well. Brands that were really just inventory and fulfillment, like traditional department stores, sort of did really, really poorly. Um, the second piece of research here that I think is really interesting for the D2C playbook and why offline is so important is this notion of something called customer supercharging that we discovered through some research with bonobos so here's the idea so let's imagine that Marvik and i i hope he won't take offense but that he and i are basically clones of each other we're identical in every respect with regard to our buying behavior at bonobos we buy at the same cadence we spend the same amount of money we show up at the same times at the website and so on so we're basically clones of each other um and then Marvik has the opportunity to go into a bonobos guide shop in new york city and um he's offered you know a couple of espresso by the nice salesperson he's told that blue really suits him <clears throat> and he should buy a blue suit and so on and so forth and then what happens thereafter because of that physical interaction with the brand even if all his subsequent purchases happen online he happens to buy at a faster rate he spends more on average he buys a broader assortment and he's less likely to return product so what's happened as a result of that offline experience that he's been supercharged <clears throat> he's had an experience <clears throat> excuse me, experience with the brand that's made him much, much more attached to it. So even if he continues to shop online in the future, um, his behavior is that he has much higher customer lifetime value and much higher attachment. So offline remains incredibly important for building that bond between customers and the brand. Okay, so what are the principles then that are underlying the playbook? So I guess the first piece was just really hammering home the idea that online and offline come together in synergy. And what we're thinking about is what pieces of the customer journey are fulfilled online and what pieces are fulfilled offline. And it's really interesting if you like the historical stuff uh, like I do. I hope Andy won't mind. I don't know if, uh, if he's out there somewhere, Andy Dunn. But if you go into YouTube and you watch Andy Dunn talking about Bonobos back in 2010, um, he was very, very clear that they would never, ever have offline stores. There would never be offline presence. Everything would be done online because offline was inventory, it was staff, it was real estate, all the things that you didn't want. Now, of course, Andy was also very prescient in that he started the zero inventory store for Bonobos, which was this notion of a small footprint store that was highly experiential that led to all of those positive effects and ultimately, I think, helped him get that exit to Walmart. So the first piece we're really thinking about here is the critical nature of offline and how that plays a role in the D2C playbook. So what are the key principles that underlie uh, the playbook? Well, I, I couldn't help myself. So the first principle I'm just going to illustrate here with a... Um, with an equation. And this is a metaphor that I really like us all to kind of embed mentally and to be thinking about every action that we take as a brand through the lens of these two levers that we're going to discuss here. So uh, again, if I had the opportunity to cold call someone, I'd say, hey, who is this guy on the left with a great head of hair and the, you know, a couple of uh, green and blue symbols underneath? Uh, that's Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton came up with a formula for gravity. Uh, the fellow on the on the right, William J. Riley, he's less well known, but he came up with a formula for commercial gravity or retail gravity. And what's interesting here, and the principle that it gives us in terms of the D to C playbook, is is the following. So, imagine we have two towns, um, and Marvick lives in town A, and town A is a small town, only a hundred thousand people. Heather lives in town B, that's a bigger town. Uh, hence B, and it has 250,000 people. So if I were to ask a random shopper like Jerry, you know, wh where would you rather shop, an A or B? Uh, having no other information, if you were sort of rational, you'd say, well, I'd rather go to B, because B's bigger. It's probably got a Starbucks and a Dunkin'. The small town may only have Dunkin' Donuts, and the bigger town might have a Whole Foods and a you know, store for selling fancy sweaters and so forth. So there's a whole theory going back almost 100 years around agglomeration that says bigger is always better for commercial opportunity if you're a customer, okay? But that's not the full picture here. Let's imagine DAB in the top there, that's the distance between these two hypothetical towns, and it's 75 miles. So here's A over here with Marvick, here's B over here with Heather, and the question is, what is the location, MAB, of the marginal customer? That's the person who's just indifferent between shopping at A or shopping at B. Now, it turns out the marginal customer is not at the halfway point. The question for you guys is the marginal customer 
closer to A, the inferior town where Marvik is, or closer to B, the superior town where Heather is. Well, it turns out the customer is closer to the inferior town, the marginal customer A, because I'm less willing to exert effort, sorry, Marvik, to go to Marvik's town than I am to Heather's because Heather's is just better. So the break point is 26 miles to Heather's. <laughs> Heather likes that. Sorry, 29 miles to Heather's and 46 to Marvik. So what's happening here is when customers make decisions, they're trading off two things. How difficult is it to get access and how good is it when I get there? So if you want to exert gravitational pull and think of some of the world's best companies like Amazon, if you want to exert gravitational pull over your customers as a D2C brand, number one, you need to bring customers closer by reducing friction and you need to increase gravitational pull by having better prices, better assortment, better brand value and so on. So those are the two levers. So every action that you take should be viewed through the lens of does it reduce friction or does it increase commercial attractiveness? And clearly, you know, if you read some of the great books like The Everything Store about the history of Amazon, you know, Jeff Bezos absolutely is obsessed with improving the commercial attractiveness of what Amazon does and absolutely obsessed with eliminating frictions. So and my favorite example there, uh, a few years ago, he had this thing, this, these little tide buttons, you know, you need detergent for your washing machine. I know somebody, Kaylin mentioned, uh, no, Marvick mentioned doing the laundry. So you could add that little button right on your washing machine and you just tap it and then you get a message in the phone and Tide is being delivered. So think of how frictionless that is or think of how frictionless it is to order an Uber or a Lyft vis-a-vis -vis, uh, trying to stand in the street and get a cab. So that's it. That's the formula. That was specifically for Jerry and maybe and some of the others on the team who wanted to see a formula. But I'd really like you as you think about D to C, how do I eliminate friction? You know, Verb, for example, is a great sort of bar company, energy bar company. Everything's done through text messaging. You know, very, very frictionless for me to interact with that brand and order product. And how do I increase commercial attractiveness by thinking about the rollout of the product line and the extension into, into new areas? Okay, so a couple of other things that are important here in terms of leverage points for D2C. That's the key principle. How do I eliminate friction? How do I increase co commercial attractiveness? But four other things we really need to get our heads around in terms of what underlies the ability for us to create great D2C brands. So the first thing is um, that the digital economy has dramatically removed the friction that people have in searching for information. And this was a huge boon during the pandemic, right? A lot of small brands got a lot more exposure because we have this time unlocked. We're sitting at home. We're seeking out stuff. So the fact that the friction of being able to find stuff has been dramatically reduced is a key principle for us to think about when we build a D2C brand. Number two, as we kind of mentioned at the outset, because we really want to hit ourselves over the head with this, um, wherever we start life, so typically D2C brands start on the internet through e-commerce and fulfilled that way, we also want to be thinking about the role of physical space in the brand journey. So with Bonobos, uh, and this also actually happened with Warby Parker and some of the other brands, I think originally it was just pure... Um, expediency so i don't know if anyone in the audience did this if you ever actually went to the warby parker office on lafayette or you went into the bonobos office and you actually see people working there and you could go in as a customer and you could actually try products so there was this great kind of symbiotic relationship where the people working for the brand could see customers coming in and out customers could actually see people working for the brand so it was kind of a nice exchange but out of that grew that notion of gee there are some people who just like to do stuff offline uh, and what is offline really good for? Offline is really good for experience. Offline is really good for communication. And offline is really good for building a bond. Offline is not great for just holding a massive amount of inventory so that people have stuff when they show up. Amazon will beat you every, you know, every day of the week at that game. So what's the experiential component? Related to that is the notion that offline also is now amplified by online. So uh, a great quote from a friend of mine up at uh, Harvard Business School says, um, uh, John Dayton, he said, uh, you know, Dave, he said, on the on the internet, uh, your audience has an audience, right? Your audience has an audience. And this is a, a, a fundamental principle that's maybe somewhat obvious, but it's interesting to think about the implications. So again, you know, 20 years ago, if Marvik and I have a store and 100 people come in, at the end of the day, 100 people have experienced what we have to offer and they know something about us. And maybe they tell 10 other people, like a friend or a partner or a spouse or something like that. So from that 100 visits into our location, we kind of got like 110 impressions. Of course, now anyone wandering into the store, you know, has one of these little guys. So if 100 people come in, you know, if the right people come in, maybe 10,000 people know what's going on because content and so on is created. So physical is amplified by digital. So that's the second thing to think about 
that's a really important leverage point for D2C, whether it's mobile, whether it's some partnership, whether it's shop and store, something like story, um, what is the role that that plays? Um, the third leverage point for D2C that I think has been really fascinating, particularly through COVID. So uh, a good friend of mine at Wharton, Pete Fader, used to joke, you know, that the, uh, the fraction of groceries sold online, okay, in 2019, let's say, is roughly the same as what it was in, you know, 1919. Okay, and he was sort of being somewhat funny or facetious. The point was like no one really likes to buy groceries at all online because they're highly tactile. They have highly non-digital attributes, meaning it's very hard to communicate to a customer the taste, the feel, the ripeness of a banana on the Internet. It's very easy to, you know, buy contact lenses on the Internet because you know exactly what you're going to get. So products that are highly digital in nature or all of their features can be digital, digitalized, are tailor made for the Internet. So, you know, what did Jeff Bezos start with when he started Amazon? Well, he started with books. Why did he start with books? Because every single feature of that book, the title, the length, the price, the author, all of that can be communicated to Marvick digitally or in a store, and he's basically getting the same information. So buying online does not become a barrier. So think about another product like footwear. Okay, Tony Shea, obviously very unfortunate what happened to Tony, but Tony was a brilliant entrepreneur. And Tony had this vision of like selling shoes online, right? And Marvick's like, you know, I don't want to buy shoes online because I don't know if they're going to look any good. I don't know if they're going to fit. They have these highly tactile, non-digital features. So Tony's like, you know what? I've figured out a solution. Why don't you just order five pairs of shoes, keep four, uh, sorry, well, sorry <laughs> send four back and keep one and I'll take care of it. Now, you know what? I'm going to build a whole company around delivering happiness. I'm going to write a book about it and this and that. So he figured out in a very, very clever way how to solve the non-digital attribute problem for customers. So when you're a D2C company, if you're certain aspects of what you're selling are non-digital, tactile, touch and feel, how do you get customers over the hump and get them comfortable about the buying process if you're doing most of that online? So I was down in New Zealand, uh, fortunately, during a fair part of COVID, and I came across a company down there that sells avocados on the internet, right? Avocados are highly non-digital. I don't know if they're right, what they're going to taste like, what they're going to look like. So this is what these guys do. They literally send you like a range of ripeness of avocados. So you get buy seven and the first one shows up, you can eat it immediately. And then like the seventh one is actually not that ripe and it's going to be ripe in a week. <laughs> okay, so thinking about how to solve the non-digital attribute problem and what attributes of your product are digital versus non-digital is a critical leverage point for D2C. Uh, and then the final thing here, you know, we could think about other devices too, but we'll keep it simple. I mean, just the value unlock that comes through this this device here. So, you know, one of our previous speakers in a conference, a good friend of mine, Anindo Ghosh at NYU, wrote a whole book about mobile. So if you want to know more about it, go there. But here's sort of five things that's amazing about mobile that are leverage points for D2C. So number one, the mobile device is a distribution channel and a payment channel in one thing. Wow, amazing. Marvik, I can take your money and I can send you stuff. And I can do that to billions of people on the planet. That's incredible. Never happened before in human history. Uh, number two, um, this is a device upon which people are constantly snacking all the day long, consuming bite-sized bits of entertainment, right? Or, you know, this is why you've got to try and adjust your posture once in a while, because particularly millennials and Gen Zs, right? They're all like hooked over because they're constantly, uh, constantly on the phone, right? So it's a device upon which people are constantly snacking. So how do you send them snackable content? And interestingly enough, this is uh, one of Jerry's areas. If you think about the history of advertising and TV advertising, TV advertising was always made less effective by technology. So now Heather has a DVR, she records over stuff, she blows through the ads and she doesn't watch them. Or Marvik has a remote control, ads come on, he goes to another channel. So technology was never the friend of advertisers until this little guy came along. Because if you run an ad on TV, let's say for Bonobos, since that's the brand there, every single person who's sitting in front of the TV has one of these who then starts going to the website and the Insta and everything else. So actually TV advertising is made more effective by the presence of this snackable content device. Uh, number three, the device is locationally aware. So you know where people are, that gives you great information on their buying patterns. It gives you information on how to customize promotions to them. Number four, it's a device upon which people can create amazing content and they can share it with other people. So what is your brand doing to encourage the creation and the shareability of that content? And then number five, it's a device that really facilitates and encourages word of mouth and makes it more successful. So, you know, if I happen to go and I buy uh, some Lemon Perfect, uh, one of our brands at Idea Farm, I like what I'm drinking, I might show the Insta to Marvick. So it amplifies the power of word of mouth. So really, as the second piece here, I'd like you guys to just internalize, how do I reduce friction? 
How do I increase commercial attractiveness for my D2C brand? And how do I sort of take advantage of these leverage points? That frictions have gone down, that offline has this awesome role, that I have products and services that are a mixture of digital and non-digital. I mean, think of all the amazing D2C stuff that's happening in healthcare and vet care. You look at companies like Modern Animal in Los Angeles or Small Door and how part of what they do gets done online and part of what they do gets done offline because of this breakdown of digital and non-digital features of what they do. And then finally, just you know, everything from your dry cleaning to the car you're driving around in to your groceries are all being facilitated by, by this device. Okay, cool. So let's roll into the next piece. And this is now going to give you guys a little bit of an acronym that hopefully pulls all of this stuff together with some brand examples. So there's Edmund Hillary, there's Tenzing Norgay, is standing, I guess, with Mount Everest in the background. And um, at the end of this kind of accomplishment where these two guys went up the, up the mountain together, um, Edmund Hillary gave a very famous quote, or a very famous quote, at least from where I'm from down in New Zealand. So the way I think about the playbook for D to C now going forward, taking those principles we've already discussed and embedding those is through the lens of what I call the Edmund Hillary economy. So what does that mean? So Edmund Hillary, when he and Tenzing Norgay uh, climbed and ascended Everest, uh, there were a bunch of reporters around, you know, this is obviously decades ago, and they said, man, you, you guys were just pulled off something absolutely amazing. That was just incredible. And uh, maybe because he's a kill uh, Kiwi, maybe because he's just a decent guy, uh, Edmund Hillary said, so you know what? He said, you know, you don't have to be an extraordinary person uh, to do an extraordinary thing. You just need to be an ordinary person, sufficiently motivated and focused on a personal pain point. I was like, yeah, I mean, I added the pain point, but, but that's exactly it. If you think about a lot of the great D2C brands in the consumer space, they're just people who are passionate about what's wrong with the status quo. They're passionate about doing good things for the world. Most of the new brands that come out, the two hygiene factors you always have to hit as a D2C brand are, are you better for customers and are you better for the world? So I'll give you two examples, one of which was the call I had just before our conference. Another one's a couple of personal friends in LA. So um, oral care, as it turns out, is a pretty lousy category. Toothpaste comes in a tube, you squeeze out the tube, you throw the plastic in the ocean. The toothpaste may have all sorts of chemicals they are actually bad for your gums. Uh, and so Ash and Lindsay in Los Angeles came up with this revolutionary idea. Let's make toothpaste as a pill. I don't know if you guys are fans of Shark Tank. You might have seen Ash and Lindsay win Shark Tank with a product called Bite, Bite Toothpaste. Literally, it's toothpaste as a pill. So what happens is you get a little glass jar. It's got 62 pills. Why? Because there's 31 days in the month. You brush your teeth twice a day. You pop the pill in. You start scrubbing and your teeth are cleaned and there's no plastic waste going into the ocean. They've built an incredible company expanding constantly in the oral care space around that consumer insight. Uh, prior to this uh, our discussion today, I was on the line with a really nice gentleman in San Francisco, Shri uh, at Hooray Foods. He's making amazing plant-based bacon. You know, one of the biggest problems in the world is like, what are people eating every day? And what does that cause for their own health and cause for the environment? And so he's come up with a plant-based solution for, for bacon. It actually tastes really good. Okay, so the Edmund Hillary economy. So fundamentally, just ordinary people focused on doing extraordinary things. So if we keep that going and kick through, um, let's start with this brand here uh, down in, in New Zealand, uh, Rascal and Friends, and I'll explain why I'm showing that in a moment. Um, yeah, I'm going to come back to that one. Uh, Rascal uh, and Friends, yeah. Well, yeah, I'll come back to that. Okay, so just a couple of things to, to lead us through here. Of course, the millennial consumer, this is Goldman Sachs Research, the largest spending power in history, Gen Z coming right alongside uh, and against those guys. What's perhaps more important than all of those numbers around all of the spending power that millennials have and Gen Z has is more of the psychographic. So not thinking about the age delineation. Obviously, I'm not a Gen Z, I'm, I'm an Xer. Um, but what's important here are the attitudes that the millennials in particular have diffused upwards to Gen Z and boomers and downwards to Gen X are all around things like convenience on demand. I want immersive experiences. I want things that are better for me, better for the planet. So thinking about how that psychographic basically plays out in terms of consumption patterns and product opportunities. Um, if you think about building a DC brand uh, today, uh, and actually I had a former student, a guy named Rajat, who was actually now as a, as a VC, uh, and he wrote a tongue-in-cheek article for Forbes about how you could build a company in one day. Uh, and he actually did it kind of for fun, also for a bit of a joke, but to make the point, it was a coffee delivery company that you could build a website, a Facebook page, have all the infrastructure up and running. And I think we all know now that all of the enabling factors from content creation, from back end and so on, all can be done seamlessly so even small companies can look big. Um, on the other end of that, 
we're seeing most of the incumbent companies in the consumer space, many, many bankruptcies, many brands sort of dying off. And, and basically here, this is not to disparage these large, great companies that some of them have been around for a century or more, but they just seem to have difficult not always, but oftentimes difficulty addressing this new mindset and this new psychographic of consumers. Okay, so now let's get into the Edmund Hillary piece now that we've understood a little bit about who these customers are. And I promise I'll come back to Rascal and Friends because that's a great example uh, of a brand down in New Zealand that really plays into the online offline piece. So the first piece of the D2C playbook with those principles in mind and now thinking about things that we would take action against is this idea in the Edmund Hillary economy, number one, of engagement. Engagement. So how do we create content and how do we create communities that are really going to resonate not only with each other, but with future customers coming in? So tech people like to think about MVP, minimum viable product. As a D2C guy, I like to think a lot about MVA. What's the minimum viable audience and the emotional connectivity that you have with customers and an expansive view of what you do, right? So, you know, bite toothpaste is not just selling toothpaste, they're sort of taking care of all of your oral health and your broader kind of well-being. So with that in mind, we can look at a couple of older brands and newer brands who really did a great job with this. So if you go back to some of the, you know, stalwarts of the first generation of D2C, I mean, Glossier, Emily Weiss basically built a community and content before she even introduced products. So she had amazing engagement through her community. Away did the kind of same thing with an expansive view of what they were. Not really a bad company, but really sort of a make travel great company. So when you think about this first piece of engagement, you're thinking about the audience, the minimum viable audience. So if it's RX bar, that's CrossFit. So who's your minimum viable audience to create that wedge? What's the content that that audience is going to create? And how's that flywheel going to keep going from there? So uh, another one of my favorite brands in the wellness space is a brand called Your Super. There might be some customers out there because they're doing over $100 million in revenue. It's a husband and wife team selling superfoods. Interestingly, not being the playbook of the coast. Okay, We haven't talked about that explicitly, but a lot of the D2C first brands are New York, LA, San Francisco, Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago. These guys actually at the interior out, I guess Huron and the men's uh, skincare space is doing the same thing, but have built a huge business around bringing superfoods to people who don't necessarily have access to those kind of things locally and building a great community and story around that. So check out your super if you really want to see how content and community engagement come together in one piece. I'm not an investor, by the way, just to sort of clarify that. But Michael and uh, Crystal are really, really great people. They came from Europe to the United States as students, and they built this incredible company. Um, the second piece of the playbook is really differentiation here, and it's meaningful points of difference in the product and go to market. So let me break those two things up separately. So if you think about the early incarnation of D2C, Away is an example, Warby is an example, Harry's, Glossier, and so on, they really did three things. So number one, there was kind of a value unlock. Because it was D2C, the price point to the customer was typically more favorable than going through an offline channel. Number two, there was kind of a quality parity, maybe an innovation, but at least a quality parity. So, you know, Warby glasses look just as good as some other acetate glass that I can get with Gucci written on the outside. And then number three, the third point of differentiation from the early D2C playbook was the customer journey. So you think about Casper, just what an amazing customer journey that was buying a mattress where the thing showed up in a box and the box looked really cool and you sliced it open and it plopped out, you know, just way, way better than going into sort of a mattress store and having such a prosaic interaction with a salesperson. So thinking about now, what are the meaningful points of difference in the product? I would say now the playbook requires the product really to be a hero. The product is not just about parity, but it's fundamentally better than incumbent products and early generation D2C products that have come before. We're also seeing now much more of an upgrade in terms of people wanting higher quality and higher aesthetic products. And then secondly, differentiation and grow to market. Uh, go to market. If you think about brands like Dirty Lemon or brands like Verb using text-based processes for interacting with customers and so on. So the second piece after engagement is how do we think about differentiation in the product and also in the go to market strategy. Okay. A couple of brands that do that really well that I just mentioned. So RX, RX bar, highly differentiated on the product and also in the packaging. Think about how crowded that bar space was. And these guys just came in, listed the ingredients. And the last one was always no BS, no bad stuff. Dirty Lemon did a bunch of cool things around text-based ordering, but also vending machines where you could pay whatever you want, which generated a lot of sort of social content as well. So differentiation in product, differentiation in go-to-market. 
Okay, the next thing, we can't really get anywhere in the D2C playbook without thinking about measurement uh, as part of the brand DNA from onboarding all the way through to scaling. And I'm going to give a couple of examples of brands that I really love here. So data and D2C, this is really part of the whole leverage point of why, in fact, you have all of this clout over incumbent brands and so on. So this is the point where I'll go back to Rascal and Friends. And I really encourage you to take a look at that brand. It's out of New Zealand and it ties together a lot of the points that we've already made. Uh, it was founded by a guy, um, uh, Nick Mowbray and his brother and sister. Nick, I think, was actually the World Entrepreneur of the Year, uh, which is kind of a big deal, this Ernst & Young uh, Award. And it was initially for a company called Zuru, Z-U-R-U, which is one of the world's most profitable toy companies, makes all kinds of toys. So for him, going into more prosaic consumer products seemed to be relatively simple. So what Rascal & Friends is, is a fundamentally amazing diaper. For anyone who has kids, this product is way better from a product point of view of almost every incumbent brand that you can find out there. They built the, script, the factory themselves, they have a lot of capital, they're making an incredible product. But the second thing, the go-to-market that was really interesting is they started to build up the community through D2C as you, as you do. Uh, so a group of engaged people, mainly moms and people and families. And then what they did in New Zealand, which is a duopoly market, there are really only two major supermarket chains. So we'll say Marvick and, uh, and Heather, since I'm picking on these guys all day. So I go to Marvick and I say, hey, you know, your supermarket has like 300 followers on Instagram. I've got 30,000 and I've got this brand called Rascal and Friends, which is diapers. And right now, you know, you're, you're cutting price of Pampers to get people in the store because Diapers and pets, so baby and pet, are the only two categories that academics have found over many, many years actually drive the store choice decision of customers. So the decision to go to supermarket A or B is really only driven by those two categories. The, the other categories don't matter so much. So instead of promoting that as a lost leader, what I'm going to do, Marvick, is I'm going to give you an exclusive. Only you will have uh, Rascal and Friends. Heather's not going to get it. And what will happen over time is you will drive market share into your store and you also have basket building from those customers because people who have kids buy a ton of stuff. And so a couple of years after having adopted that strategy, he built effectively a $200 million revenue business in New Zealand. And there's only 5 million people and he moved market share from one chain to the other by an order of magnitude 4 or 5%. So that's a really creative way of thinking about how do we tie our online and offline together? How do we build a product that's fundamentally better? And how do we use and leverage the engaged group of customers that we have? A couple of brands uh, more local to the US that did a great job of this. Careoff, as you guys might know. So Craig, who was from Bonobo, started Careoff. Great guy, used to come and speak in my class. And I didn't really get it when he started. He said, hey, I'm going to start a D2C vitamin co company that's going to be personalized. And he did many, many things right. But one of the things that he really nailed, and I think today is probably still the gold standard, if you go there and you go through the onboarding process and you type in, hey, my name is Jerry, and there's, hey, Jerry, are you excited about vitamins? Are you skeptical? Or are you just like not at all interested? So it's always like a three-part answer. And as you go through this process, you become more attached to the brand. What comes out at the end is sort of made for Jerry vitamins. But also what comes out at the end is the gold that he now has on how to remarket to you, understand your preferences, email you at the right cadence and so on. Um, in terms of onboarding uh, all the way up to scale through measurement and data, you know, Jet is a great example here. And I think I've put yeah, the little article that I'd like you guys to see. So uh, I'm not suggesting that you actually do this um, as a new D2C company, but it's an instructive example. So Mark Law, when he founded Jet.com, you know, his biggest challenge early on was to acquire customers quickly and have a sufficient pull so he could really compete with Amazon. So he set all these sort of hurdles in place. Okay, Cortland, if you sign up five people, I give you, you know, a month of free shipping. You sign up 10, I give you a year. And then the big carrot was, if you sign up the most people uh, of anyone, get the most email addresses for me, I'll give you 100,000 shares of stock <laughs> in diapers.com. It's like, wow, okay, that's great. So obviously that motivated some people. There's a fellow there, Eric Martin, he signed up the most people, over 8,000, I think. And as a consequence, uh, he received $100,000 worth of sh uh, stock, sorry, 100,000 shares of stock in Jet, which once the acquisition went through, I think was worth about $20 million. So data, measurement, customer flows, absolutely critical, need to be designed in from the get-go. That's what Kerov did. But also creative thinking about how you can activate people to collect data for you and how you can kind of incentivize them. Okay, next piece that's really important in this D2C framework is the whole idea of unified commerce, which is be where your customers are and how they want you to be. 
So again, the old idea of you know online and offline being separate is completely out the window. The new idea is that they're, they're symbiotic, they work together, they reinforce each other. Uh, and I think Harry's is a great example here of a brand that's really played in what I would say is all three lanes of the new D2C playbook. So in the middle there, they started out as a digital native vertical brand, buy your razors online. Then to the left-hand side of the screen, they open up a few barber shops. Why? Because you want to give a physical manifestation to the brand, what it looks and feels like. And again, this doesn't have to necessarily be a profitable or a large scale thing, but you're giving a manifestation. Then the combination of those two things, then because of the millennial customer base, attracts interest from the large traditional players like Walmart and Target. And so now basically what you have is you have a brand that was D to C first, that opened its own physical space and then has growth and scale through the traditional wholesale channel. So in, in CPG um, in CPG D to C, this is really the playbook. D to C uh, is really the entry point. It's not the end game. It's the entry point with all of those principles that I laid out before to build scale, to build community, get data, to understand, to showcase the better product that you have, but really where the growth often happens and the acquisitions often happen are through Walmart and Target. So those of you that follow the category as I do, um, might've remembered a couple of years ago, Harry's was up to be acquired by Edgewell for $1.3 billion. That was the transaction and it was actually squashed uh, by the FTC in, in a ruling that, well, probably didn't make too much sense, but they, they only really looked at that brand um, as it competed in offline supermarkets and said, hey, if there used to be five brands on the shelf and now one acquires the other and there's only four, concentration goes up and customers will be harmed. That was the argument. I, I don't particularly agree with it, but that was the argument. So unified commerce is critical to the D2C playbook. Um, the next thing that becomes really important in just the last couple of minutes here, next gen hiring, you want human capital beyond X's and boomers. So how do you get the right kind of young people in? And how do you get people who actually learn really, really specific tasks? This is not to, to knock anyone who's gone through a more formal MBA degree. There's huge value to that. But how do you just get someone who really knows a ton about growth or really knows a ton about aesthetics? So these more focused tasks that in particular the next gen, uh, the next gen hiring crew knows better than anyone else. And then the final piece, um, this is where a lot of the D2C companies have fallen over, but I think now it's kind of out there in the ether and the vernacular that we have to pay huge attention to this is discipline. Clear understanding of profit-led uh, unit economics and growth and the optimal timing. So Clay Christensen, who was one of the world's most famous business professors, Harvard Business School has sadly passed away. Clay wrote The Innovator's Dilemma, a number of other really prescient things, but he also had a really cool piece that said, hey, you got profitable unit economics and you got growth and almost always the timing should be do unit economics and profitability first and growth second i mean sometimes if you're building a network based tech business you might reverse it but typically you never ever want to do that and i think that's been the problem with some of the early cadre of d2c companies have taken in too much capital and have gone for growth first and those d2c companies don't have network effects and so on like tech companies do and try to catch up profitability that almost never ever works so remember clay's principle on that discipline got to include a little chart there and you know a dollar bill i should have put a hundred that would have made it more compelling but we've now got to the end uh i guess we have three or four minutes left for questions what you guys might have noticed no prizes marvik but i maybe noticed that actually that acronym goofy as it is spelled out the word edmund because we had engagement differentiation measurement unified commerce next gen hiring and discipline. Hopefully that'll help you guys remember it and say, who was that goofy guy from New Zealand who said that, oh yeah, Edmund Hillary, these are six things that I have to do in D to C, building on the early online offline playbook and also those other principles I should get. Absolutely, my heart's broken that we don't get any prizes, David. So <laughs> we're, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to restart this all over, but no, no thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, many people do say I look good in blue, you know, really brings out my eyes. So that's my next stop, Bonobos. That's where I'm going after this. Um, so uh, we do have time for a, a couple of questions, David, and, and before we before we jump into the, the next piece. So one of the things that I, I really wanted to, to, to chat with you about is, is my role here at Netflix, where I get the opportunity to work with everybody, right, from new clients to current clients, whatever that might look like. But what are the, the main pieces that we have been starting to see are a lot of folks going from direct to business to direct to consumer. And the easy part, I don't want to say easy part, but the first part about that is, sure, we can get you online. That's not a problem. We can get you a website. We can get you e-commerce ready. But 
how do you see the the customer relationship with D2C brands evolving over the next few years? And how is that so important to two of these distributors? Yeah, so I think, you know, that that's really part of the goldmine of D2C is the direct line into the customer. So that helps you with, you know, creating a really good customer journey. It helps you with getting data for what a new product rollout should be. It helps you with sort of market testing. And also, if you do it right, it actually should be standalone profitable. And what, what we've found in our experience is, if you can create standalone profitable D2C before you go into these other channels, that's also something that incumbent purchases really, really value because that's typically a place where they've kind of stumbled and they've fallen down. So I think you know building D2C to be profitable from day one and building it with care and thinking about the minimum viable audience it doesn't have to be huge, but it has to be engaged. It has to be profitable. It has to be that two-way exchange. If you can do some of the things that brands like care of have done you know i'm sure part of the reason bayer paid 250 million for a chunk of craig's business was just he'd done such a good job at pulling in customers through that journey of rolling out new products all of that was anchored by his d2c measurement uh, system awesome no thanks that i think we have uh, time for just one, one quick question david and I, I think it, it just came in so you spoke about how brands actively rethink their structure and message to, to target and recruit millennials right um both as employees and consumers but when should brands look to actively engage the younger gen z audience what when is that right time <laughs> yeah they're a bit different too we're finding right gen z has a slightly different attitudinal profile to the millennials but i think you know if the brand is a better for you, better for the planet brand that's targeted at that broad psychographic of Gen Z and millennial, you have to have people on your team. I mean, we obviously, our team have Gen Z and millennial people because, you know, otherwise, how do you do the just the internal gut check market research to understand what that psychographic wants? And I think you find, too, I mean, this is no disrespect to people like myself who are older. I think younger people just know more stuff quickly than they just, just like, you know, in the Olympics, you know, the 100 medal, uh, sorry, 100 meter race. Um, people run a lot faster than they did in like, you know, 1960 or 1970. I think people today who are 17, 18, we've brought in people as they're about to enter college as interns, they're just really, really good at stuff and they really have an authentic voice. So I think engaging them as early as possible is, is super helpful. Awesome. No, I really, really appreciate that, David. Um, thank you again for, for taking the time. That was, that was really awesome, really awesome presentation. Thanks a lot, guys. Really your insight. <laughs> Thanks for having me. So hopefully someone out there starting a new D2C company or reinvigorating what you're doing. That'd be always great to hear those stories too. Absolutely. Perfect. Awesome. Perfect. So thanks, Guy. Take care, take care, David. So transitioning into into a, into our next piece, and I know one of the topics that, that we mentioned a lot about is is the cookie list world, right? How can SMBs compete and win in a cookie list world? So with this session, I wanted to bring in Alex Cohn from IAB and Udane Bose, our CEO and founder here at Netelixer. Quick, quick, just a background on, on Alex so we understand his his background. Um, prior to IAB, Alex was the director of product management at Xander. And he was directly responsible for the privacy and the creative product behind it, the engineering plans, and overall the execution and go-to-market between between everything there. So, in Alex is a is a is very knowledgeable on this topic. So this is why we really want to bring Alex Udain into this into this picture to have a live Q and A session, but overall just a discussion about why this is so important, especially going into 2022. So with that, Alex and, and Udain, I'd love to bring you guys on. Thank you, Marv. Hey, Alex. Hey, how's Good it going? going? Hi, good to see you. Good, good to, to see you, see Alex. you too. I know it has been a fascinating day so far. I mean, we started with Professor Jerry Wind, and then we had Natalie give an amazing, insightful presentation, and then we had the mind-blowing magic show. And now we had the amazing David Bell. Wow, David, I'll never forget the Edmund. Never, ever. So that's amazing. Uh, so, Alex, I think before we kickstart our discussion, uh, I would love for you to really just quickly self-introduce yourself, maybe, and yeah. a little bit about IAB Tech Lab as well. What is the sort of work and what, what, just a little bit about IAB Tech Lab. Of course, I, I know this uh, this audience may not be super familiar with what we do, but IAB Tech Lab is uh, really focused on creating standards for interoperability in the digital advertising sort of ecosystem. So we relate that oftentimes to standards that people know outside of digital advertising, like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, you know, if those things weren't there as underlying technologies, a lot of the 
products that are built on top of them would, wouldn't have flourished the way that they have because there's not the stable sort of underlying standard state. We do the same sort of thing for uh, for digital advertising uh, ecosystem. So that's a little bit about IV Tech Lab. Personally, uh, thank, thanks for the inter introduction. I I. I came at this topic of sort of that what I call the intersection of privacy and identity and a lot of different commercial concerns, be it brands, be it publishers where ads are getting served and the technologies in between. I started really focusing in on this just over about four years ago and got super intrigued um, by this issue space and it's only grown in importance uh so I, I i guess i picked a good issue to like dig deep on but yeah i've got experience sort of in the on the technology side i've been a product manager for a long time now and been working at sort of the center of this again collision of privacy uh concerns that are disrupting identity and how we do things like measurement and attribution and targeting in in this space um, so it's, it's, a, it's been a fun time to be me. I get to do this a lot, which is really great. I'm really excited to actually get to talk to like SMB marketers today, which is not my typical audience. So glad to, glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Fantastic, Alex. Great to have you here. I, I know, I mean, you mentioned SMB. I think we have, we have, as of last count, probably more than 400 SMBs joined this session. Amazing. And, uh, I think just in a very simplistic manner, I think I discussed with you when we, last spoke, which was a couple of months back when you were in that mountain house, that lovely mountain house in upstate New York. But I said that, Alex, I mean, one of the observations we have is probably about 80% of the SMBs are still figuring out as to what is what is really going, is the cookie less world and what, how exactly will they be impacted. So it will be really helpful if you can explain in very simplistic terms for yeah. everyone as to what is going on. Yeah, the, the most simplistic way I figured out how to explain it and hopefully this is this is simple to understand is the connection between an ad, an advertiser's audience or brand's audience and where uh, where they want to show an ad to that audience right on a you know a piece of content like a publisher's site or app or whatever experience that's showing an ad so that the connection that has been there to link up what a brand knows about an audience uh, or, or or me, right? So I, I, I shop at a lot of different brands or I might be a prospective like um, person who is gonna buy something from one of the, the SMB marketers here. Um, how, how does a machine connect me on brand A's website to uh, where I see an ad on uh, you know, publisher one's website that has traditionally been cookies, third party cookies, um, without needing to understand what third party cookies are. They're literally just a mechanism to understand that me on my web browser, I'm the same person or the same entity on that browser in one place as I am in another. And that linkage is breaking. So you, I think the thing to know is that that means you know, when you want to control how many times you might show a given ad to a person um, across different sites, that's going to be harder to do at scale. Um, doing attribution uh, because I might see, you know, and interact with a, a, some sort of ad experience in one site and then go take an action somewhere else. The ability to make that linkage is really what what is breaking um, with the, the loss of the third-party cookie, or at least it's breaking from the ubiquitous way that most companies uh, pulled off that connection kind of under the hood. So it's, it's really a breakage in this, this linking of audiences. The bigger picture, like, you know, to think about is why is this happening? <laughs> um, people are concerned about their privacy as their, their, you know, the data wake that they leave, is it being protected? And it's important to note that that's not just like, you know, consumer, your, your users, consumers, people buying your products, right? Like they don't just think about uh, privacy as it relates to web browsers, which is where third party cookies were the ID linkage. They think about it elsewhere too. So like on, on mobile phones, 
um, where there aren't cookies, but they're still concerned over my privacy. So the bigger picture is we're, we're all kind of talking about third party cookies and the disruption that removing those creates. But the, the impetus to that really has been, you know, consumer concerns around privacy that both governments, regulators are reacting to, as well as the major like huge platforms like like Google and Apple, who are all over the news right now for sort of what <laughs> what their changes may be doing to marketing. So that that's how I explain it when I, I talk to folks. It's just that the connection between uh, an audience that is a, presumed to be an advertiser and an audience that's presumed to be a publisher's where you might see an ad, that that linkage being broken. Understood. That's that's extremely well explained. What is it getting replaced with? I mean, I, I know it's getting <laughs> broken, but what is the future? I mean, what, what is the alternative? Yeah. Well, right now, um, a lot of different things. So um, there's no, we've been saying this in our own presentations, there's no real silver bullet at this point. The platforms who are sort of taking away, so you've got Google Chrome who made the announcement about it's deprecating third-party cookies. It was really the last web browser to do so or to say that they were going to do so. They haven't done it yet. Um, but they also have like 65% market share globally mm -hmm. of like web browser traffic. So people paid attention, right? Mm -hmm. um, when Google announced that, they said, well, we realize that's going to disrupt a lot of things. Um, how... Advertiser outcomes happen, at least for paid, the digital on web. Um, and they've been creating some proposals for that are they're mitigating to some degree. I think the best way to understand the proposals that they're creating, at least, are is keeping what's known about a linkage between an advertiser sort of audience and, a, and where an ad might be shown to a, to a user and that, that publisher's audience, that linkage happening in the browser. And mm -hmm. in the same way, outside of the third party cookie landscape on, on mobile devices, you, you probably are all heard about some of the changes Apple's making in iOS 14, which I think we're going to talk about in a second, but mm -hmm. they're developing similar mitigating, I guess, APIs, but like interfaces for technology companies to plug into. In the case of Apple, they've built something for conversion tracking. But, you know, uh, the point is, though, what, what's replacing it? A lot of different things that are going to be a bit fragmented. So it's the, you know, besides just knowing what's changing, it's now going to become like a, a time where figuring out of all those things that might be semi replacements for different outcomes that you had before. Figuring out which ones of those work and which ones of those you're going to invest in, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and what what capabilities you're going to look for in the technologies that you pick will be somewhat predicated on which of those different tools that Chrome's building, that, um, that Apple iOS is building, et cetera, like which ones of those kind of work for your, your, your outcomes, but the, 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 the summary is it's going to be fragmented for a bit because it, what we're seeing is a fracturing of how these connections are made that have enabled, you know, things from frequency capping to targeting to attribution at scale. That scale is going away with the loss of third party cookies, with the loss of the IDFA and in general and, and the iOS mm -hmm. ecosystem. So to be able to achieve those outcomes, you're going to have to use a bunch of different tools now. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it may not be the best news in the world, but it, it is it is uh, the facts uh, as they are at the moment. It will be interesting to see, I guess, you know, what what companies really thrive in um, adapting to this new kind of landscape. Hmm. Very interesting, Alex. So, so essentially, the impact for the marketer would be what? The, how how yeah. exactly will the marketer uh, get impacted? <laughs> yeah. So. I, you know, marketers have a lot of different channels and strategies. Mm -hmm. So with regard to cookies, your paid web and sort of cross channel analytics, I think are going to be the most <laughs> impacted by the loss or the deprecation of the third party cookie. Well, what does that mean in paid web? What are the specific impacts? Um, 
the outcomes that identifiers like uh, the third party cookie enable is like if I'm running a paid sort mm -hmm. of web campaign and I want to control the frequency that one individual browser user, you know, how often they see an ad in a given day and, and not blow my budget on that, that actually isn't going to be possible at scale anymore mm. um, across sort of the open web. It will be possible in certain pockets. So like if you, if you are doing most of your buys uh, on paid web through um, and most of them are happening on sort of singular properties like a Facebook or like a, like Google's properties or even Amazon. You can control frequency within that scope of domain, but really what's being, I guess, kind of attacked here is the concept of being able to persistently kind of identify a browser across domains. Um, so, you know, if, you're, if your funnel is, you know, seeing an advertisement in one place and, and jumping out to make you know to take an action somewhere else that connection <laughs> at least the scale is being broken so the, the impact of that is like i think fragmentation i used that word earlier but some fragmentation in in analytics in terms of where you're able to go to see mm -hmm. uh you know how 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 you know paid media campaigns are working um is going to be a really big one probably for this audience. And then just like in general, you know, spending, spending wisely, right? Like part of targeting and, you know, Facebook gets a really bad rap and I'm sure everyone has their own opinion about Facebook. Facebook did a marketing campaign kind of in response mm -hmm. to, yeah. uh, in response to Apple's changes. Now it's very self-interested, but at the same time, it's true. They're saying for small and, you know, medium sized brands, especially ones that are startups and mostly digital direct to consumer, the ability to just spend your money where it's performing, where performance is judged by an action you take somewhere outside of Facebook, that's that's going to be really difficult now to, to measure. So it's like, I, I think there's going to be a whole lot of impacts. Now, it depends on what the outcomes are you're looking for. So like, I realize not all marketers are made the same. One last thought here on this question of impacts on, on marketing. I mentioned paid web and cross-channel analytics sort of as a, as a general area that's affected. I think two days ago, Apple announced a feature mm -hmm. about basically uh, you know thwarting the ability to track email opens and email yeah. clicks. So like email marketing as well um, is something that's now being, I guess, kind of come into the crosshairs of, of at least Apple. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to pay attention to right now in terms of impacts on your marketing efforts. It's, it's a great time to lean into smart, uh, you know, I guess agencies who are looking at this stuff at scale, like across a bunch of different mm -hmm. brands. Um, that's one thing I would note there is like, you're going to need some help. <laughs> yeah. It's a very interesting time, uh, actually, Alex. So two questions from this. The first one, from what you are mentioning, essentially, uh, you're talking about this concept of a walled garden, right? So you have to work within the walled gardens of Google or Facebook or Amazon or whatever it is. And you really have to do exceptionally well within that walled garden, right? And effectively, I think, just by a principle of, let us say, almost like a uh, uh, deduction, I mean, understandably, the bigger players have an advantage because, uh, they'll be able to drive a mass a, a much much bigger mass compared to let us say some of the smaller channels so understandably there may be a bit of a migration as well probably yeah. i don't know so uh, that's i think so my question is uh, how how big of a threat is it for the smaller channels uh, or is it going to shift the budgets away uh, effectively from them and really localize it or give a lot of power to the larger ones is my first yeah. Well, yeah, the power dynamics have always, you know, big and small are still going to be the big and small relatively, right? Like Google right. being big, a uh, uh, channel, <laughs> it's funny to say this, but like relative to Google's property is a channel like just buying, you know, advertisements potentially on something like Reddit or weather.com, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're going to have a hard time, I think, um, convincing... Well, 
where where people are using an agency to place their dollars. They're going to have a hard time convincing agencies to focus on all the legwork that they're going to have to do to mm -hmm. sort of buy in a fragmented way. Yeah. Um, and that and that's naming like a few really big channels. Mm -hmm. uh, the I mean, or at least properties, I guess, where you might you know find your audience um that are somewhat ubiquitous to, to a lot of different types of you know potential consumers um yeah i mean it it will be interesting to see like i think what to watch is again back to these mitigating um things that google and apple are putting in the place of things like third-party cookies or device identifiers in the case of apple and ios you know, theoretically, those should allow folks that are marketers that are spending money on on these channels uh, that are not just within the wall garden to uh, wall gardens to actually get some of the same outcomes across buying across you know the open web or a bunch of different apps in the iOS ecosystem. It's hard to say whether or not that will actually happen because yeah. all of these things are very theoretical right now. So we're yeah. <laughs> these shifts are happening before there's actually something that's been tested and proven to mm -hmm. replace them. So in theory, uh, at least some of the, the major, you know, what I would call like happy path outcomes for, for marketers should have some replacements coming. Uh, very few of those things have been tested at scale. May many of you probably read about in the news, something that Google's calling flock, which is sort mm -hmm. of just a, uh, the way to think about it is they're creating audiences in the browser of like behavior and browsing, which means that a, that a brand like a marketer may, may want to try and test, you know, against, you know, test, test their, their marketing budgets, at least in, in paid web against those sort of browsing behaviors that have been aggregated by the browser and, and kind of represented to an end user or to a to a buyer in, in like ID form. Somewhat complicated to explain, I, I know. Um, but that stuff is just in what's called origin trial, which means like it's just a percentage of, of Chrome traffic right now. And 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 then on top of that, just a you know, a handful of companies that might be testing out, well, how could this work? So it's a little bit nerve wracking, I think, for people right now to think about, OK, this stuff's going away. There's supposed to be replacements, but I haven't been able to test the replacements yet. So it's a big coordination problem. The last thing I'll say about this, too, is like even if those mitigating sort of features that, that Google and Apple are proposing as replacements to things like the third party cookie or the IDFA, even if they work from an outcome standpoint, the power dynamics of who's designing uh, mm -hmm. those sort of tools that a browser's offering or that iOS is offering. The question is, is how are those things going to respond to market demands, right? So if mm -hmm. you know, I'm a small, if I'm an SMB marketer and I want new features, who do I go talk to? Do I go talk to a web browser? Um, do I go talk to Apple? <laughs> Um, more than likely, you're not going to get Chrome on the phone. You're not going to get Mozilla on the phone. You're not going to get, you know, Apple on the phone. Certainly, they're they're notoriously the hardest company, <laughs> probably in the world, to get on a phone. Um, so, like, what is the incentive, I guess, of the the product and engineering teams at Apple iOS and at Google Chrome? to really meet the market's demands that will continue to evolve, right? Because marketers want to try new things. Marketers have new ideas. Um, will these APIs be responsive to that? TBD. Um, I, I, I've actually asked Chrome, the Chrome team that directly, and they've not provided a really great answer other than like, we're trying. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Do you have any answer to that question? Um, no, I think I think point. about this stuff uh, probably yeah. in my sleep. So one of the things about this IDFA and the, the iOS 14.5 uh, and so on, uh, I think is you mentioned about the what is the impact going to be on the, the email service providers? 
because i know we have quite a few of our friends who are who run the esp business like we have friends from listra clavio sendlane and so on joining this call so what what is again it's probably too early maybe just two days or less than 48 hours uh, uh, but what are the initial impressions what is the initial I, response i mean you're right on it being sort of I, in a way the biggest announcements have been early i come back to one of the things i said on your first question which is bigger picture what is inspiring apple to make these changes what is inspiring google to make these changes and and other you know major platforms and it's kind of, it's responding to this zeitgeist right now of hey i feel like i don't know what's happening with my data and i you know i don't feel like i'm in any any kind of control over that and in as much as that is true you have a lot of engineers now thinking about at these platforms thinking about well how do we respond to that and a lot of them have come up with every potential way to to maybe surreptitiously track uh, a a user across the internet track alex you know alextcone@gmail.com across mm-hmm. the internet um and email is a huge huge like opportunity to know who i am across sort of devices so there's two fa- there's two facets of email happening here that i mm-hmm. think are interesting for sort of the email service provider or email provider like services out there um one is email obfuscation so sign in with apple is like basically obfuscating a user's email yeah. uh, google actually has a proposal to do the same thing in chrome mm-hmm. it's called web id so there's that factor and then there's the measurement factor of like mm-hmm. when an actual the which is what the 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 bigger i guess announcement was this week from apple when an email loads i guess in a in an apple email sort of system them trying to find the the image pixels basically the track opens track clicks and and stop those from being able to you know make calls out to to do that like i don't know like that it's 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 some point i feel like a lot of brands and and public like big media companies for that matter are going to say wait a second why are you disintermediating me from my like who i have a relationship with the user alex at alexdcohen@gmail.com right i've now given you my email twice i shouldn't do that but anyway um <laughs> but yeah like i think i think there's going to be pushback from major brands i think there's going to be push cuz they're they're affected too right yeah. um yeah. so yeah it's it's a little early to say what how widely this will spread what apple is doing but if you go back to the principles that they're attacking sort of in you know the what i call the zeitgeist of like concern user real user concerns about what's happening with my data i think you can expect you know google's android platform to maybe do similar things as ios maybe in a different way but same sort of outcomes and i yeah i think email in general is is in is a is becoming more and more in the crosshairs now again email means a bunch of different things but just thinking about what what those engineers are sort of after when they roll out these new features uh that are supposed to be protective like is it is a good way to predict the future in terms of like well does it seem like a a privacy engineer would come after this practice? <laughs> mm. Chances are if you answer yes, like they probably thought of coming after this practice. Uh <laughs> it's an interesting time Alex. I mean, it is uh, but one of the things I mean, when these companies are announcing new changes, let us say Apple's new changes and so on, it, it can be fairly safely mentioned that these are irreversible, right? I don't think they're going to be reversing them anytime soon. Like I but who knows but who knows exactly and the reason yeah. i think that that supposition is there primarily because all of this concerns privacy now privacy is a much much stronger bigger uh, overall purpose compared to the individual advertisers or right let's say agencies really really right, right so that's what my concern is that we really have to accept the fact that this change is unidirectional and i think the chances of it getting sort of reversed is probably probably less so my question my final question is uh 
what what exactly i iab tech doing to go ahead and educate everyone and do you guys see this as a net negative or is it a net positive or how how, how would you see this yeah good question i'll try to be brief knowing that we have 2 minutes um our reaction to this and i i mean we're decently public. I, I can speak for Tech Lab. The, the IAB, for what it's worth, is sort of a mm -hmm. franchise name. Um, so I can speak for IAB Tech Lab. Our, our view of this is that the status quo of how uh, a lot of this audience linkage was happening in digital advertising need, like, could definitely use some reform. Um, adding controls, especially like thinking it just about, you know, brands and publishers where ads are being served, right? Like, Giving them controls over where data is going to is really important. Giving users control is important. And to be able to do that, you kind of have to reform the underlying tech so that you can more or less sandbox it, mm -hmm. to the old term from Google. So generally, we're, we're supportive of the direction of like, we need to reform. I think to your point on irreversible, the, our, our posture on this is, this is the direction of travel the question is, is there multiple ways to travel? Are there multiple yeah. ways to travel? And the, our answer is yes. We think that there is a there is a possibility to balance commercial interests in advertising, digital advertising, marketing, like with consumer and regulatory privacy and data protection like demands. Like it is possible. Um, and I think our, you know, what we're trying to do is, or at least from the tech lab standard side, is we're trying to actually develop some underlying standards to create more opportunity for those controls to be there, like in a mm -hmm. ubiquitous fashion, so that we have a better story for for digital advertising on, you know, why this isn't the wild wild west and why you actually can control, uh, you know, companies' ability to, you know measure outcomes on you as sort of an individual browser user or iPhone user. So we, I think, yes, it's unidirectional, but the direction, if you think about like, could be adjusted and, and that's really based on education too, is like the more people who understand what's happening and can weigh in on like, wait, hold on, there are different ways to go approach this problem. Like, I think that will be great. So I, I love speaking at things like this for that reason, because it more people knowing what's going on is great. Thank you. Fantastic, Alex. I think yeah. uh, it, it really it really has been a pleasure having you on this one. I yeah, thanks, thanks for having time, me. Two, two months back, and so much has really happened in those two months, right? It's cra just absolutely crazy stuff. But thank you very much, my friend, for really joining yeah. us on this one. And any questions for Alex? I am pretty sure he, he's one of the most accessible and the nicest human beings <laughs> that you can meet. So I am pretty sure he, uh, uh, all the SMBs specifically joining in, if you have any questions directed to us and We'll definitely discuss with Alex and get back to you. But thank you very yeah. much, Alex. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. So we come to the, the, the last uh, 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 segment of our uh, session today or the, the, the conference today. And I'm pretty sure that you have been quite amazed and charmed with some of the presentations that, that really have happened. It started with Jerry talking about the, the, the bigger overall strategy for the post-pandemic world. Then we had Natalie sharing some amazing insights in terms of what are some of the fundamental changes, changes in consumer behavior. And then obviously we had David sharing about the DTC blueprint uh, in the Edmund way. And uh, lastly, we had Alex Cohn uh, answering some of our questions, which a lot of our business uh, uh, clients really have been asking us uh, about what is the outcome and what exactly, uh, what exactly is the future of marketing in the Oculus world. So we get to the final segment, the innovation roundtable, where I have really the pleasure of inviting four uh, four exceptional executives and great friends of Netlexer uh, to the round table. I'll start with Louis Brodnax. Uh, Louis heads the e-commerce business for Sazerac. Uh, we have our dear friend, Michelle Peters from UPS. Uh, we have Christine Hunt from Lulu's and we have uh, Aaron Zaga from Newton Baby. So I would sort of request uh, the, the, the panelists probably to just do a quick round of self introduction and a little bit about the company as well uh, and the role you are in as well. So, I mean, Luis, maybe if you can start with you, that'll be great, but welcome again. Uh, Luis, I think you may be on the yeah. mute, so yeah, perfect. Hi everyone, Louis Broadnax from Sazerac. 
a longtime friend of an elixir and uh, looking forward to uh, speaking with you guys this afternoon on uh, innovation. Happy to be here. And uh, just if you don't know, Sazerac is one of the largest uh, spirits companies in the world. Uh, we've got over 400 brands, everything from Fireball to Southern Comfort to Happy Van Winkle. And I'm uh, looking forward to discussing with you guys on the panel. Michelle, if you want to tell you next. And good afternoon. And again, thank you to our audience for joining us. My name is Michelle Peters, Senior Marketing Manager of Global E-Commerce Strategy and Execution at UPS. Um, in addition to my time at UPS, I enjoy assisting business owners with developing and implementing strategic um, marketing strategies. I've been doing it for over 20 years. I uh, enjoy consulting with small businesses, um, being a mentor and a life coach to female teenagers and young adults, um, public speaking and sitting on panels like this for thought leadership forums. I am a wife, a new mother, and a active member of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. And of course, all of you are familiar with UPS, <laughs> one of the leading global transportation logistics companies around. So with that, that's a little bit about who I am and I'll turn it over to Christine. Awesome, thanks so much, Michelle, and congratulations on the new addition to your family. That's Thank great. You. Um, so hey everyone, I'm Christine Hunt. Uh, I'm VP of Brand Marketing over at Lulu's. Lulu's is an e-commerce uh, women's fashion brand and we're actually coming up um, on our 25th anniversary this August. Um, so it's it's been an amazing ride. The company actually started um, as a little boutique in downtown Chico. Uh, and then quickly went online back in 1994 um, and has been like purely e-commerce ever since. Um, I recently joined the Lulu's team back in February this year, um, recently coming from Elf Beauty. Um, and that's actually where I know Netelixer. So I'd worked on Elf Cosmetics with them back in the day. Uh, and then previous to that, working at um, Sephora and then agency side, um, what I tell people is, you know, to sum it up, what I do is I buy clicks on the internet. Uh, so <laughs> I think that's what a, a lot of us do here. Um, when I am not buying clicks on the internet, uh, I am hanging out with my friends, my family, my husband, uh, my little fur baby, Franklin, who's a cat, 17 pound cat, so not so little. <laughs> and um, yeah, I love, uh, I, I love just sitting here on panels and discussing with people like yourself and just kicking up great ideas. So very happy to be here. Thank you. Fantastic, Aaron, please. Hi, Aaron Zaga, I'm the CMO of Newton Baby. Um, Newton is about six years old, digitally native. We make the safest uh, crib mattress uh, on the market. So hopefully, Michelle, your baby's sleeping on a Newton. If not, talk to me after. Uh, and we sell some, some other baby sleep products as well, sheets, swaddles, mattress pads, um, and just launched a co-branded crib also. Um, no Net Elixir a long time. I hired them when I was back at Teleflora. I don't even know how many. I think Aaron may have. Yeah, we probably would have <laughs> one of the one of the struggles of the online virtual world, but we'll sort of just keep it going. Uh, I think as sort of Aaron joins back. I think let me just kickstart the overall discussion, knowing that there would be audience questions. We have been getting a ton of audience questions as such. But I, I, I would love to know a little more. I mean, maybe maybe Louis, Michelle, or Christine, as of how what has been the impact of the pandemic on your innovation process in the company? Right. I know all of you uh, are from different company uh, categories and sizes, and uh, the customer audiences that you really have are completely different. But I would love to know as to what was the pandemic's impact on the business and okay. very specifically on the innovation process within the company. So anyone, Michelle, Christine, Louis, you want to take it? Sure, I'll start the discussion off. I think there were three key points um, that we had to look at. And the first one being the acceleration of innovation, right? Innovation is not new. It's something that we've been doing for a long time, but accelerating how we innovate was something that was very imperative. Um, technology advancements, where can we advanced technology, what systems, what back-end systems, what, how do we interact with our customers? That was probably the second one. And then the third one was really innovating the process or the flow of the UPS customer experience. So that was really, really big with us. Um, 
we looked at those three different work streams and went to work. <laughs> we jumped into the deep waters. We went to work. Um, we formed new processes, new systems, and really just changed our entire thought process about innovation and how to accelerate that, how to have those minimum viable products get to the market. Um, and then how do we understand what our customers need? We shifted our mindset from it being about UPS to being all about the customer. Everything we did, the question started, what does that mean and what will that do for our customers, right? And then we backed in from there. So I think I'll let uh, Lewis and Christine add in, but those were the first three things that we did um, as a result of the pandemic and innovating at UPS. Great. Yeah, I, I think Michelle's dead on, um, you know, acceleration became the, the massive, you know, talking point across the organization. And for us, um, you know, we sell liquid, but we really are selling experiences. Mm -hmm. And those experiences were all had in restaurants, bars, big group settings, most of the time, and all those, those were gone. So what we really had to do is really adapt to how our consumers were adapting to the COVID um, pandemic impact. Where were they now taking their experiences and where were they creating them? And in a lot of cases, it was hometainment. Um, so from an acceleration perspective, there was packaging, there was supply chain. Uh, we also had to deal with legislation. Uh, we sit in a three-tier distribution system today where we legally have to sell to a distributor, who legally has to sell to a retailer, who then sells to the consumer. Well, legislation started loosening up where it allowed different models to become available where manufacturers could sell direct, manufacturers could do curbside, lots of drinks to go. So all those things that were between consumer changes and legislative changes um, were ones that we had to, to deal with from an innovation perspective. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that is not perfect. I mean, just <laughs> I, Lewis and Michelle, I, um, I agree with both of you um, and feel your pain. And uh, Lewis, uh, I think, feel your pain kind of on a personal side. So my husband um, is a bar owner in San Francisco, so yeah. definitely fans of Sazerac, uh, but uh, he, you know, definitely felt the pains uh, during the pandemic as well, like uh, many of our businesses did. Um, so agree with you that acceleration was key. And it was also, you know, for, for Lulu's being, uh, a, not only a women's e-commerce fashion brand, but also a brand that's really been known for dresses um, and events dresses. Uh, that was a really big challenge on our business. So we had to innovate in order to survive. Um, and so we, it sort of forced us to think outside of the dress, um, which is actually a great thing today because uh, we've expanded into so many different areas over this time. So we expanded into activewear and loungewear, things that people were wearing more during the pandemic. Um, we expanded uh, into like beauty and self-care. So it really, you know, it really pushed us um, to think outside of the box and go beyond um, our norm. So we still consider the the dress our gateway drug, um, but now there's so much more opportunity for our customer um, to shop with us and to stay with us. And then again, thinking about the customer experience, just like Michelle and Lewis talked about, um, that was a huge thing for us. So knowing that shipping was you know, was a challenge as everyone all of a sudden had increased demand in shipping. Mm -hmm. um, it was really about how do we, <laughs> how do we set expectations with our customers? How do we straighten up our, our comm strategy? How do we make sure that we give them a little extra love because we know things will be delayed? Um, and then also taking care of our customer service because we knew that they were getting the brunt of it. So um, some really interesting things came out of that that have continued through um, past the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Aaron, so I think that just uh, the, the question was overall, how has the pandemic impacted your business and anything on the innovation process of the company? Yeah, I mean, uh, we had the benefit of being digitally native and having both brick and mortar and online distribution, but primarily online. So we were to some degree a beneficiary of shifting patterns uh, and we saw skyrocketing demand both on our site and on Amazon. Um, which, you know, pretty much immediately caused stock outs right at the same time the supply chains were getting disrupted. So getting that stock uh, made and, and restocked and back to our warehouse um, was all kinds of fun. So between shipping delays and skyrocketing demand, we we're kind of caught on both sides. 
Um, so, uh, you know, it was, it was in oftentimes a good problem to have, uh, too much demand, but staying in stock, um, messaging, customer shipping delays, uh, all of that was pretty, pretty new for us uh, as an organization. Fantastic. Thank you. My next question would be actually linked to the first, uh, first presentation by Professor Jerry Wynn. And I think, Michelle, you sort of brought it up mm -hmm. in terms of changing the mental models, right? I think mm -hmm. that was his first premise on this one. So, I mean, were there specific instances where you really had to rethink maybe mm. some of the operational parts within the company? And what were they? If you can give us even maybe one example. Uh, that sure. Be sure. So we uh, adopted a new framework. And this is one a great example is thinking of reimagining or revisiting who is the cost customer, right? Customer first, that was that's the thing for us at EPS. It's customer first. But then taking it a step further and saying, who is the customer? And traditionally, the customer, when you think about a package moving from A to B, the customer is at A, right? The person that tenders us the package. But let's just for a minute, think about the healthcare market and what happened with the vaccines and all the medical equipment that needed to get to where the PPE and everything, right? So our customer is now multifaceted. When a package goes from A to B, we have to not think about one customer that's going to be impacted by UPS, but by multiple customers. So who shipped the package? Who's receiving the package? Um, how does the patient going to feel? How is the medical vendor going to feel? How is the doctor that's going to implement it? If that package is damaged or if it's late, all the different customers or potential customers that could be impacted, they all need to have a great customer experience. So rethinking who is your ultimate customer. It's not just that one individual that we thought about traditionally, it is multiple individuals. And if anybody within that flow chain becomes to be, um, you know, uncomfortable with the process or the experience that they feel, that could disrupt or even tarnish your entire reputation. So we had to think about that. And that's last said, you know, having a new thought and then training, right? Everybody within the company to think about that, to consider that, um, you know, and so in that healthcare segment, we have a thing that says it's not a package, it's a patient, right? So who's receiving that medicine? Who's getting that shot? Who's getting that new heart? You know, who's getting these different tools? What are they going to feel? And what happens if it's delayed? Who's going to be impacted? So that's just one example of reimagining or rethinking um, how you do business. Fantastic. Thanks, Michelle. What about you, Luis? I, I know the liquor sales overall sort of skyrocketed. <laughs> and, and overall across, I think, <laughs> the, the common trend. But any, any any specific changes that you experienced in the industry? Yeah, there there, there were a ton um, that we went through all the way from, you know, shifting production to making hand sanitizer and getting that onto the market. But I, I think in general, um, you break it down into create and partner. The biggest initiatives really were around bringing our experiences digitally to our consumers where they were. So things like virtual tastings for groups of um, employees as happy hours, um, a virtual tour of the distillery since you couldn't come visit in person. Uh, we had a virtual digital version that we made available so you could continue to tour online. Uh, online mixology classes, one of our locations decided to help people learn how to make cocktails. So things like that, bringing that engagement to the consumer. But we didn't stop there because I think it was important to close the loop, which is now you have to go partner. So with the likes of a Drizzly or an Instacart or a reserve bar. Mm -hmm. So once you have the ability for someone to learn how to make the drink, they've engaged, they have an event, we also want to make sure that they have a, a mechanism to be able to purchase. So digital shelf, product content, enhanced content, all became really important in our overall mission of making sure product is easily visible to consumers and then also easily purchasable. And again, this is one of those scenarios in the new landscape where traditionally we would not have leaned as heavily on spending brand dollars to help impact some of the uh, retail chains, but with the changes in legislation, uh, we were allowed or we were able to make sure that we could pivot and ensure that 
we were had to pull through into the channel through the right right uh, right distribution mechanisms. Fantastic, thank you, Christine. Adam, any any? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it was interesting because we had sort of a whole suite of new products ready to launch, but the factory in Europe that was going to be launching them that was just about to start manufacturing got completely decimated by COVID early on. Uh, to the degree that they they shut down, and I still don't think they're fully reopened. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of threw our our whole innovation process <laughs> out the door <laughs> and forced us to restart entirely. Uh, and some of the stuff that they were making for us was kind of proprietary and patented. Um, and I mean, uh, so we we really kind of threw out the entire playbook, started from scratch. I took over new product development. We hired a new agency to start creating new designs, had to find new factories in countries that weren't as impacted, which ironically at that point in time was China, um, and then Southern Europe, and really had to pivot our entire new product process and, and start over from scratch. Um, so, you know, I think that was, that was a pretty dramatic change to our innovation agenda. And then the other thing was just, we really had to innovate along the supply chain. Um, we had relied on air freight in the past, that was pretty much out the door. We had relied on fast ships. At some point, fast ships used to be almost the same price for us. Um, that changed dramatically over the course of COVID. So the supply chain innovation was pretty dramatic as well. Fantastic. Christine, anything to add? Yeah, I would just say that um, for us, it's it, you know it's both the, the pandemic and then coming out of the pandemic has been another innovation process, um, just in terms of scaling up and you know scaling down. So initially with the pandemic, we had to scale down a lot of our employees as our business was taking a huge hit. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people went on furlough. Now we're in this position of scaling everything back up. And now that we're facing this pent up demand, um, now we're hitting those those same issues that others were hitting during the pandemic who are seeing the spikes. Now we're seeing the spikes as people are going back out into the world again and having those uh, those challenges of maintaining our inventory, keeping things in stock, um, forecasting. So we've really had to change our approach to things so that we can scale up with this pent-up demand. Um, and what that means is that not only bringing people back and, and onboarded, but also reevaluating a lot of the processes that we have internally. And in order to scale, we're really looking to bring in outside partners. So we've been rapidly increasing some of the partners or the technology that we have in-house um, rather than just relying on manpower um, so that we can manage this huge, this beneficial increase for our business right now. Now, one of the things I was just curious about, I mean, again, uh, uh, on this one, so uh, all of you uh, run the e-commerce part or are somehow integrally associated with the e-commerce part in companies of different sizes. Like, Luis, I think your company has been around for 170 years, if I'm not wrong. Uh, Michelle, your company has been 110 plus years. Uh, Aaron, your company, six years. Uh, Christine, I believe, 1996, if I'm, or 1996, yeah. right? So probably about, let's say, 30 years, 25 years, right? No, understandably, implementing innovation starts with understanding the customer and seeing the trends. Right? Mm -hmm. How difficult was it in each one of your companies to see as to where exactly things were headed, specifically in terms of the changing or evolving consumer behavior? And how, how did you really even listen to these changes in a company which is huge, like UPS, for example, Michelle is mammoth, right? Effectively, I mean, it's just a gargantuan organization. So what are the different processes yeah, so we just, we really went after the voice of the customer. You know, normally in, in the past, we like to really think that we knew our customers well, and we'd like to innovate based on our interaction from sales and marketing with customers. But this time, we did things a little bit differently. We sat down, just like we're having this conversation on video, and really had one-on-one -on -one interviews with customers of all segments and all backgrounds, and really just listen, what do you need? Like, what do you need right now? What is your biggest challenge? What are you you're facing, right? So throw everything that we thought we knew about your business out the window because your business just shifted as Lewis pointed out and tell me what do you need? In some instances, we found out that we have those solutions. We just needed to remarket them and reposition them with certain customers. And then there were others that we figured out, you know what, we don't have that, but let's get it, right? And then broke that up into pieces and did different several project teams and implemented agile type development and minimum viable products. But it all started with really changing the way that we got the voice of the customer, 
one-on-one -on -one videotaping conversations and just letting them be open and raw and in some cases so emotional if you listen to some of the interviews it was so emotional like my business is falling apart or, i need this i need that um so just really that was the first time we really done that we did that in a large capacity and then we went back to the table and we had these innovation round tables if you say within our own company we brought different diverse backgrounds of different people, whether we brought IE together, engineering or, you know, marketing, accounting, sales, like we brought different backgrounds together and sat down and said, hey, here's a list of everything that we found out from the voice of the customer. Let's break it into different pieces. And then what can we go after right now? What do we need to put on the back burner? What can we fix? And how fast can we get something to market and really just, you know, pulled up, rolled up our shoulders and, and dug in. So the entire process of how we innovated completely changed. Yeah. Luis, anything specific? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. Uh, so I'm gonna pivot away from digital just a little bit mm -hmm. and give a, an example from our product development team um, because their, their vision and the way they approach innovation is a little different because you know, bourbon, bourbon needs to sit in barrels for years and years and years and years before someone can enjoy it. Um, so the two examples I'll give from an innovation perspective, the first was, you know, to Michelle's point, um, crowdsourcing. So there are certain standards that are, are needed for a whiskey to be called bourbon. And we did a crowdsourcing effort a few years back called Craft Your Own Bourbon or Craft, Craft Your Best Bourbon. And it basically was asking consumers what ingredients they'd like to see the most, whether it was, you know, rye or wheat or barley. And that became an actual product. And I'm happy to say that just this past February, it won World's Best Bourbon in the World Whiskey Awards. So that's just an example of taking consumer feedback, turning it into a physical product um, that could then be leveraged. Uh, the second example, actually, probably somewhat by accident, there was a terrible storm that damaged one of the warehouses. Some of the barrels were exposed to the elements over time. It turned out some of those barrels were very, very good bourbons. So we now have an entire warehouse, Warehouse X, dedicated to nothing but experimentation. And the first experiments um, were just purely based on temperature. Lower temperature, higher temperature, a fluctuating temperature exposed to the elements, over 6 million data points were collected. And those now, I can, I'm happy to also say, are stored away, being aged, and at some point will be barrels that we uh, release as net new product to the market. So from a long time horizon, how do you start thinking about innovation between crowdsourcing and then just using data uh, available to the, the distillers, master distillers, to create something new and different. Those are two of the places that we put some focus over the last few years. Lewis, my mouth is watering. <laughs> <laughs> want to get you some when they're ready. <laughs> uh, anything to add, Aaron, Christine, on that part? I mean, again, a six-year-old company, the innovation process and the examples, I'm pretty sure, are very different. Yeah, I, I mean, I, <laughs> you know, for. For the, the, these other guys who have thousands of employees, our, our process is a little different. Um, something is broken, we just rip it up and start new the next day. Uh, it's a little, <laughs> it's a little easier. Um, you, you know, I, I take one person of my, you know, less than ten person team and say, "Hey guys, we're changing this." Uh, you know, go read everything you can about it on the internet and hire a vendor in the next two days and let's let's wing it. Um, it's definitely a little different. So. You know, we we were able to do some pretty crazy pivots um, in, incredibly quickly. We Bye Bye Baby um, had been one of our top distribution outlets, and they all closed, obviously. And then Bye Bye Baby's parent, Bed Bath Beyond, was in some credit trouble, it appeared. So we literally shut them off almost overnight and redirected all of that inventory to Amazon D2C. And then... It was, I mean, it was literally within a single week, I think within probably two or three days that those decisions were made. Um, but we, we have luxuries like that because, you know, our systems aren't so old and antiquated that we can make 180 changes in a relatively short period of time, so. 
it's, it's very different for us. <laughs> I think that's powerful though. And I think that's yeah. the advantage that SMBs need to use when it comes to innovation is mm -hmm. don't be afraid to fail and try something new because you can be agile. And if it doesn't work, then next week they try something else. You know, it's the, the the fact that you have the ability to make those changes so quick. And I talk to SMBs all the time. Do it. Go with what your cut is telling you. Do it. Try it. Measure the results and then change from there. And so I, I'm glad, Aaron, that you guys were able to do that because that had to have been rough, right? That's my go to. Bye bye, baby. <laughs> right. So they yeah. closed down. All we had was Amazon. <laughs> So the way that you, the fact that you were able to do that and not afraid to do so, you didn't sit on it and ponder for weeks. I think when it comes to innovating and taking advantage of the moment, that's what you want to do. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we didn't have the choice. I'd love to take some credit, but I, I don't know that we can. But the, the, net, the net outcome, I mean, I think you raise a valid point that small companies should really keep in mind, um, which is that we picked up a ton of market share as a result of that pivot. Um, and that is that is an advantage that smaller companies have that, that they should always think about and hopefully proactively take risks like that. Mm -hmm. Certainly. And I, I think one, yeah, yeah, one thing I can add um, just from a Lulu's perspective is uh, we, you know, we've been around for a while, um, but again, with everything e-commerce, like we were able to move pretty nimbly on things. Um, so one thing that I think just so amazed by the team for doing is again, like on a skeleton crew, because we did have to um, reduce our, our employee size for a bit. On a skeleton crew, we decided, okay, let's take a look at the trends, what's gonna happen, started trying to make predictions. And we realized, look, a lot of, like, a lot of events, a lot of weddings are getting canceled, of course, um, but they're gonna be back. And so kind of anticipating this demand and also knowing that we had to expand our business in order to really be able to capitalize and, and really drive um, forward after the pandemic. What we ended up doing is we ended up launching, it's the biggest like 360 launch we had ever launched to date in January, um, which was weddings. So we had taken a look at, uh, taken a look at the data, just knew sort of where the industry was going. We had also taken a look at all of our consumer data and everyone was coming to us for wedding guest dresses, for bridesmaids dresses. Um, so it felt only natural for us to come out with bridal gowns. And our positioning has always been, hey, we wanna make sure that we're delivering a real value in our product um, and delivering that at an affordable or approachable price. Um, and that was one of the areas that we scoped out that we could really make an impact for our customers, knowing brides gone through so much during the pandemic. I just can't imagine the, the there's mm -hmm. already the stress of planning a wedding and then you have COVID and canceled plans and everything on top of that. Um, so we wanted to give them something special. We were able to offer our dresses. We have over 300 dresses on the site right now that um, are between 88 and $300. Um, so yeah. pretty amazing. And then we focused on giving them little special plus ups. Like if you get a dress from us, it's going to come in one of those beautiful like bridal like dress bags. It's not going to be, it's not going to just, you know, be in the, your usual packing material. It's a special box. It's a special experience. Just trying to give them a little something extra. Hmm. Very useful. Excellent. So, Luis, again, just sort of, again, back to you on on the large. So, Aaron gave us a great example of a small company being able to do things very, very quickly, right? It's almost like a fail faster approach. But, I mean, I'm pretty sure when you really use that almost like the wisdom of crowds to rethink the entire process, was it done by a smaller team or how many people were involved and how much of executive leadership support is required to get something done like that? Yeah, the... the... The advantage of being in a large privately held company is lots of entrepreneurship around the buildings. So the idea came up, it was pitched, and leadership was behind it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of a lot of it comes, you know, can you know thank our brand teams and our master distillery team for the you know the insight. And uh, in all honesty, it, it's one of those little bit of art, little bit of science. Um, great idea. Everyone was aligned around it. And it's one of those that was just a, a no brainer. So not one of those difficult decisions that had to go through lots of red tape and up and down for board approvals. It was just a entrepreneurial idea that everybody got behind and made it work. Fantastic. 
Now, let me move on to a, another topic, which I think uh, mm -hmm. would be of interest. So pre and post pandemic, are there specific, uh, almost like consumer behavior shifts in your specific industry or category? that are really prominent. Something similar to what Natalie was mentioning in the, the, the presentation in the morning, that there are certain fundamental shifts which seem to be permanent changes or shifts. Uh, any Anything specific industry that uh, you noticed? Then anyone, I mean, it's just. I think I've already touched on um, just from our consumer's perspective, um, no one was, was wearing, uh, you know, any sort of events dresses or even like fashion, but we do a lot of uh, on trend type of clothing and apparel. Um, and that really wasn't in demand, right? Um, so now we're seeing as everyone is entering back into the world, uh, I was just reading a stat the other day that 80% of people in the US are ready to refresh their closets after the <laughs> pandemic. Um, and we're definitely feeling that increase in demand. Um, so that's something that we're faced with right now post pandemic is again, just trying to scale up. And that's where we're bringing in that technology. We're bringing in um, additional partners, agencies. For example, um, we've always managed influencers in-house. Um, but, you know, at this point in time where, you know, again, with the pandemic, it just made sense to start working with an agency um, because really influencers over the pandemic became our source of content production, right? We couldn't have shoots and we were a business that was heavily <laughs> reliant on shoots to, to show off what we were trying to sell. Um, however, influencers can do that so much more authentically and put in their own ways um, and bring just some some light and like levity to the brand, um, which people really responded to during this time. Um, so in order to scale that up, we, we brought on the agency partner to help with that. So, Christine, you mentioned about sort of introducing a couple of new product lines and so on, right? The loungewear, et cetera. How, how, how are these categories doing? And do you think that these, these will be as important as they were probably last year? Moving so forward I, to the company as well? Yeah, so they were doing great during the pandemic. Right now, they are down. But I think that's another thing that we've innovated on during the pandemic is just our buying model. So with our buying model, we very much take a test and learn approach. Um, so we actually, with new products that we're bringing onto the site, we buy pretty low um, and then we release them on the site. We test that. And then if it sells out within a certain period of time, and also if over that period of time, we don't see a very high um, return rate, um, then we say, okay, this is, this is really um, a rising star for us. So then we'll buy deeper into it and deeper into it. And we continue to track those numbers so that we can stay on top of demand. So really our merch team works very closely with marketing to understand how demand is shifting across um, paid and organic search. Um, also kind of triangulating with Google Trends. We all know that's uh, index search data. So take it with a grain of salt, um, but definitely helps us from a comparison perspective. Um, and then that's how we help inform our partners on the merchandising side. Um, so it's really just been this test and learn approach that's going to continue to stay with this business um, because it's also prevented us from buying too deeply into something and then mm -hmm. having to discount heavily later. Fantastic. Aaron, any shifts in consumer behavior that you're noticing pre and post? Yeah, you know, one interesting one that probably helps Michelle out a little bit um, was that people no longer expect everything in an hour. Um, and especially in the at the bottom of COVID, people were really understanding about shipping delays and everything else. And it, it kind of added a human face uh, to fulfillment and especially to delivery, frankly. And people became thankful for people who were delivering their stuff. And I don't know if that's going to last. I mean, Amazon, I think, walked back their, their fastest delivery, which would be fantastic for the rest of us. Um, but I, I think, you know, setting a little bit more realistic of an expectation of when you're going to receive something that has to travel across the country or across the world was probably a net positive that I'm hopeful will last for mm -hmm. some period of time. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I think that was one change in consumer behavior for the positive for us retailers. Anyway. Fantastic. Thanks. Michelle, anything to add? Yeah, I think what Aaron was saying, we, we started in our research looking looking at that and 
looking at customers' expectations. And I think we've seen a shift that for certain types of products or, or services, um, it doesn't have to be there next day. Uh, they're giving, you know, a little bit of breath, <laughs> if you will, Erin. Um, and I think something else that, I, that I've seen that I don't think will change back is really the expansion of the um, omni-channel, right? Mm -hmm. so for retailers, COVID made you really think about different touch points to get your product to uh, in the hands of the end user. A lot of pickup at store, um, using different access points that, that we do at UPS. I think that that's, we saw that grow. I think that's going to continue to grow and we'll see that. Um, I just remember a, a story of a, a health and beauty store, which is, is fairly big. Um, I remember when COVID hit and all the salons and, and barbershops and everything shut down. And I mean, we all had to do that ourselves. <laughs> and many people were like me, did not have the products at home, right? We were kind of used to going to the salon. So we needed to go to the store and get it. And this, this retail chain, um, they were so used to having their product in distribution. They had an online presence, they had an e-commerce presence, but they had like two or three major distributions. They weren't used to saying buy and pick up that store. Right. And I remember that first couple of weeks they were struggling. I pulled into the driveway and I saw a UPS truck <laughs> outside. And I remember the driver going back and forth trying to help them speed up the process. And they were printing everything on paper. And I just happened to mention to the to the manager, I said, have you considered getting a thermal label printer? <laughs> And she's like, what is that? What can it do for me? You know, different things like that. But I think we're going to continue to see these different stores, even though you have, you know, multiple locations around the U.S., still be able to offer to their consumers pick up at store. And I think that that process is only going to improve. And, you know, that's a bigger trend. And companies like us, we have to be able to adjust. That means, you know, driver routes change, more drivers. Like there's a trickle down effect. But I think you'll continue to see that. Yeah, same same here. Uh, I think restaurants, bars, being able to offer drinks to go with meals, I don't see that going away anytime soon. And then the investment people have made on their home bar setups and learning to yeah. make drinks. <laughs> yes, right? that's, that's here to stay. So uh, we're we're happy to see that. Fantastic, thank you, Michelle. I must say that there was this there was a phase about I think forty five days when we all got sort of locked down mm -hmm. when in our entire community, the only the only visible outside of our house <laughs> site was UPS truck and the person coming in. <laughs> I must say it was very, very refreshing because you didn't see anyone outside. So yeah. that tip to you guys all, the entire UPS team for such Thank tremendous you. service. Tremendous service. Wow. Thank you. And we launched a new initiative, UPS Stories, and you can go to our, our new website. And if you start looking at our social media, it all looks different because it's all about, you know, talking about um, what our drivers have been doing and the appreciation for our drivers. And, you know, it, it, it was a lot. It, 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 was, it was a big change. And even getting PPE for our drivers, you know, at first, you know, that was a, a bit of a, a struggle. We never thought that we'd have to do that, you know. So... But yeah, we're really proud of the effort that all UPSers put in, and we, we appreciate your gratitude as well. Oh, thank you. Uh, my next question, I, I think, to the group would be more about uh, when do you know that this innovation that you have really implemented is not working? And uh, do you have a process for that? And how do you sort of walk away and just say that this is not working? Let us give it up and move on. Uh, I know it's a, a bit of a trick question because sometimes innovations can be very close to our hearts and yeah, it, it's really very difficult specifically for the people who are behind that to say that this is not really working, let us sort of move on. But yeah. anything uh, anything that your company really follows? When is it not working? Yeah. yeah that's so I put a little bit of when it is working. <laughs> uh, I mean, outside of the, outside of the standard you know, you know, ROI metrics and customer yeah. satisfaction metrics, I would say, you know, looking at the consumer, um, did it reduce friction in something they were trying to accomplish? And did it create a spark? Mm -hmm. If those two things weren't there, then it probably is going to go on that we need to watch it and make sure that it's something that's going to be a long term opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I like where Lewis is going with that. Did it create a spark? Because like I said, I was thinking about the opposite. Like, when did we know that the innovation worked? And what came to mind was um, 
acquisition and conversion rates, right? Are you winning new business? Um, customer loyalty, you know, are you retaining what you have? And then are your stakeholders happy, right? And so the opposite of that is, no, we're not. You said the, you know, that ROI, that we're not, we're not gaining the new business that we thought. So that that, that kind of indicates that we need to do a shift. But another perspective on that is the employee morale. So the team that worked so hard to put it together, sometimes it's hard to put on paper, but they have a vision of how they thought that the success should look, right? And when their baby isn't really producing that level of success, you'll see it, you'll feel it. And they'll let you know, you know what, let's let's shift it, let's change it, let's re let's look at something different, or let's just trash it all together. And so we should never, when we're measuring, we should never um, dismiss. That, that project team, those employees, like I think that that's a very valuable asset of success or unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. Adam, Christine, anything? Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say, I think um, for me, uh, another thing just to add to that, because I agree with, with all of that, but I think another thing is just looking at sometimes the time that it takes to manage these. So it might, you know, we all expect new processes take time to implement, take time for the learning curve to take effect and everyone to get used to the new process. And you sort of optimize as you go, as you get new feedback on it. Um, but there have just been processes where all of a sudden we, you know, we think it's a great thing, but then in reality, um, just in talking to some of the people who are managing it day to day, turns out it's, you know, there's some manual piece that we didn't account for or that now has to get um, worked into it. And all of a sudden employees are spending a lot of their time just maintaining this process rather than being able to think strategically um, about the business. And I think that's a, another area where for me, the juice just isn't worth the squeeze and we have to, we have to rethink the process. <laughs> I think one of the things that people don't think about enough when it comes to innovation is setting the right goals and benchmarks. And, and the, the corollary I think of here is the investing world, which is my background. And it's something like 80 or 90 percent of people who buy a stock don't have a plan for when to sell it, which is kind of crazy and probably the wrong thing to do. So whenever you're developing anything, whether it's a process, a new system or a new product, I think you need, you need to always set goals at the outset and a timeline. And if you haven't achieved those goals by the timeline you've set, you just cut and run. So we've introduced a couple of products um, that weren't developed with, you know, kind of best practices, I'll just say, and weren't fully baked or thought out and we just kind of rushed them out. And, you know, within six months, it was clear that we had kind of missed the mark on product market fit and specifically price and cost. And, you know, we were really quick at that point to just cut. And so we just marked them down like crazy until they're gone. Um, and I, you know, I think it's a good point Michelle raised about trying not to hurt the feelings of the people who had a hand in the innovation. Uh, but at the same time, that should never preclude you from cutting and running. Yeah. Um, so always, always have a sell strategy uh, when it comes to business. <laughs> and, and same goes for processes. I mean, we, we implemented a task tracking software uh, that, that wasn't anyone's favorite except for the person who mandated it. And it was clear it wasn't saving us time. And, you know, after a couple months of getting acclimated, it was still clear it wasn't saving us time and we just shut it down and got a new one. So you, you have to have an exit strategy if things aren't working. That wasn't your pick, was it, Aaron? Not my pick. <laughs> no, not your pick. Not my pick. I like yeah, that. It's a fine balance, Aaron and Michelle. I think you sort of mentioned about so it, the last 16 months. I think, uh, or I believe, the businesses have really empowered a lot more, lot more of their employees or team members to really go ahead and do something new, think of something new. And there has to be a fine balance between the business needs or the impact that you are talking about and the the compassion part as well, giving them an opportunity to realize the vision as well. And I think the 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 overall successful innovations which come out would probably be coming from companies which have been able to maintain a balance, right? As to where do you really draw the line and how much how much do you really sort of really take that compassionate, figure it out approach and this is your vision sort of own this approach. So it, it, it's fascinating because one of the things that we keep on thinking about again at Netflix it is, I mean, maybe we have seen only about 1% of all the changes which the COVID actually will lead to in our world. 1% as it really even would fall out. So we are just still at the very, very nascent part. But even that nascent part is so big enough that it has really shaken up the world. And understandably, there are Zooms of the world which have really come up, which is 
of a different level on top. So, so it, it's a very interesting transition. So uh, one question which I would have uh, for all of you individually, I'm pretty sure it has been a tremendous learning experience over the last 16 months for all of you. If there was one, one of the pieces of learning that you want to share with the audience, what would that be? I mean, what has been one of the things that you would really want to share with the audience when it comes to innovation or just sort of running the company or the marketing department, anything? I'm just effectively, what would your, what would your, that, that one thing be? I think for me, it comes down to, to communication and collaboration. Um, so I think a lot of us, you know, we work with so many uh, smart people, but it's, we tend to kind of in a, in a moment where, hey, we have to act fast, we have to act quickly. I think that certain groups could be left out that would have huge insight um, and input into what you're trying to innovate on. Um, so I, I would say like, watch out for for those silos that tend to happen mm -hmm. when we're going quickly. Um, I think that it's really in the cross sharing and being able to cross share a lot of our data. I just know from our experience where uh, some pe I've heard certain people go, oh, well, we don't, you know, we don't have that. We can't measure that. I'm like, no, yeah, we, we do. <laughs> we do and we can. Or, you know, it might not be perfect, but we could take a little bit of this data, a little bit of that. You should talk to so-and-so over there. Um, they've been working on something similar. And then that's how we actually start accelerating and innovating um, and getting more, just, just a better process overall and a better innovation. That's a great point, Christine. And I know as a lot of the companies are sort of moving back to office or maybe a hybrid model somewhere in between, mm -hmm. right? I think one of the things that we think about a lot uh, at Netflix here is how can you really sort of manage when you have three people in the conference room who are in person, mm -hmm. and then there are three people who are joining remote, right? Don't forget about those folks who are sort of remote, right? right. Because normal human tendency is to really focus on as to who's sitting with you. Exactly. So those are the things. And the other part which you mentioned, I think, is extremely important as well. There are those silent ones who, uh, in the normal in-person world, may not really have gotten heard as much. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe the last 16 months, they have been able to really make their presence felt a lot more. So again, great points, Christine. Yeah. Aaron, anything specific? Any, any any big learning that you want to share? Yeah, I, mean, I think people need to uh, either appoint a chief risk officer or dust off the risk management playbook. You know, if, if anything, a pandemic out of nowhere teaches you is that you need to kind of think through where you're exposed, preferably not when you're exposed, but beforehand, and have contingency plans in place, uh, you know, especially when it comes to supply chain, no question but also on the marketing side too. So, you know, if, if Amazon goes down tomorrow and you're 80% Amazon, make sure you have a Shopify site to sell on, you know, uh, just thinking through everywhere that you're exposed and putting into place some kind of a contingency plan, even if it bears some cost is probably worth it. Yeah. Thank you. Michelle, you want to? Yeah, I agree with Christina. The diversity of thought is key. The contingency plan that Aaron talked about is also important. And I would I would so, you know, be careful on complacency. Um, you have to be able to expect the unexpected. And if you're comfortable, you're paralyzing your innovation, right? And I think for so long we ran business, you know, as it was. This is the way we've been doing business. It's been working for us. And when the pandemic came, we were so caught off guard that, you know, a lot of us just couldn't breathe. So just always knowing that, you know, things like a pandemic or other things really could come and shift. And you just need to be able to take that step back, pivot and be willing to roll with it and, and not be so caught up in what we think that we know. That's a fantastic point, Michelle. I mean, I, one of the parts which has been sort of written about a lot is complacency as well as overconfidence as well. Mm -hmm. I got this figured out, right? That means this is the formula. Right. Those are the things which both can be can be quite quite harmful, as as I think the pandemic has really made us all a lot more humble, hopefully. Yes. So, Luis, please. Um, I, I mean, I, I would say maybe um, don't discount completely the anecdotal. Um, there's, there's. I mean, to, to Christine's point, I think there's there's places where. There's small pieces of data or comments or people that are feet on the street where they've seen something or they've heard something or they've had an interaction directly with the consumer 
that may feel anecdotal or one-off, but um, I think in many cases those tend to turn into sometimes trends and eventually an opportunity that could be missed if, if they're always completely discounted. So I would say, especially in, in this ever-changing dynamic uh, environment that we're in today, sometimes those anecdotal things turn into, into opportunities. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I know we have about three, four minutes left still. Uh, any any sort of comments from any one of the panelists to wrap up this session? I mean, we have we still have about a couple of minutes left. <laughs> Aaron, Christine, Louis, and Michelle. It has been a delightful discussion. Yeah. Yeah, I think my, my only other comment is, um, you know, so I think so many of us have been going uh, full speed of ahead uh, during this time nonstop, um, trying to innovate and push our businesses and keep team morale up. And I think that one thing that is very key for innovation is really creating um, the time and space uh, to just recharge and, and be able to think critically and creatively. Um, so that's just something that I've been encouraging my team to do is, you know, like take, use the PTO, take your time off, we're yeah. okay now, you yeah. know, um, and then also setting some time that is meeting free time um, so that they can just, you know, think about their work or yeah. think about um, larger problems. It's a great point, Christine. I mean, I, I so not so one of the practices I personally took up, Aaron, was writing a Sunday CEO note to my entire team. And my last Sunday CEO note essentially was a uh, a new philosophy, probably. Or I don't know if it's a new philosophy which came out, but it was more of a compartmentalization of leadership. Mm -hmm. so typically for the last two months, I mean, as you know, the India has been going through a absolutely horrendous COVID surge, right? So my morning started with just checking if every team member is doing well. How exactly am I sort of going to get them vaccinated? Hoping that they are safe. And then you really have to move into a next meeting, which you really have to have a very different level of conversation when you're talking about what are the overall sales numbers and how it is to go. And then you really have a, so I think that compartmentalization of leadership, one of the things that I have seen is, I mean, uh, as you rightly mentioned, Christine, just taking a pause and uh, telling the team members very clearly that it's fine, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, it's just absolutely okay. And giving them that psychological safety, I think is what you're talking about, right? That a safe space where they feel empowered and confident to really work forward. So, totally. Yeah. Uh, okay. Aaron, Michelle, Louis, any any parting lines? Um, I'd say that um, innovation is usually driven from a need. There, there's a need that comes, and now we're all in the room trying to figure out how to solve that need and come creative. But I also think after we take that pause, that much needed pause that Christine talked about, if you, if you have the time, innovate without a purpose. Mm -hmm. Just have some free innovation, fun, environmental time, you know, take something and start thinking of creative ideas so that when the need comes, you'll have some plans already started that you can build off of. And so don't always wait for a need to come to start saying, hey, let's think innovative about this or about that, because now you kind of have a little bit of tunnel vision mm -hmm. when you're trying to solve that problem. But just start thinking about what do you have and how can we use it differently? And just give it to someone who hasn't used it before and touched it and let them just start molding and shaping it, kind of like child's play. So I think that we should also consider innovating without a purpose to see what comes out of that and start building and having that library of creative ideas. So when the need does arise, you already have something to um, in your back pocket that you can go in and say, hey, what about that idea? What about that idea? So wow. something to think about. Fantastic. Yeah, that actually triggers one for me. One of the best things that I did during this time was rip off Google. Um, <laughs> They, uh, the whole side project, ten, use 10% or 15% of your yeah. time and work on whatever you want to work on side project thing. Yeah. Um, and it, it really did a couple things, I think, especially since, you know, people weren't in the office anymore. A, it made them really appreciate their jobs, mm -hmm. that they had the ability to do this. B, um, I think they were working more hours on average anyway, so it's not like I got reduced productivity anyway. Right. Um, and C, it, it yielded some great innovation per Michelle's point, because th this wasn't innovation we needed. This mm -hmm. was you know, kind of employee-led uh, innovation. And they they entirely, every single one of them, picked projects that, uh, if they worked out, would have very tangible and material benefits to the company. And many of them did. Um, and so, 
uh, you know, it, it accomplished so many things at once from an innovation standpoint. Uh, plus, it, re it resulted in, in employee morale gains. So I, I think empowering your people to innovate, even if that's way outside their job title, mm -hmm. um, is, a, is a great way to go. Fantastic. Luis, any? Um, I, I would say, um, well, the question would be, you know, what are we calling the new norm? Is it the new norm or the return <laughs> to normal or the back to the, back to the good old day? Whatever what it is. It? <laughs> I've heard it's BC and AC. <laughs> well, I, would, I, I would say, you know, there was so much innovation that's happened over the last 18 months, but in all honesty, the roadway right now, starting now for innovation is massive because people are trying to figure out what AC is going to be and the opportunity for us as, you know, leaders and MarTech leaders to be able to kind of help craft and get people to the to the other side of this is is just sitting there waiting for us. So I'd say, you know, we took a deep breath, but now's now's the time to really get those innovation engines going because we're gonna we're gonna see a lot of change over the course of the next year, I think. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well thank you very much. Well thanks Christine, Michelle, Lewis, and Aaron. This was absolutely yeah. a pleasure. Thank you thank so you much for, for your time you. and your yeah. support and good luck with your innovation journey. Thanks a lot. Let me call on Heather to sort of put the closing remarks. Thank you guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everyone. All right, great job, everyone. Thank you, Dane, and thank you to all of our speakers, partners, and attendees for joining the Net Elixir for our second annual Connecting the Dots virtual conference. It has been such an honor to work with such accomplished individuals and a true privilege to be able to plan and execute this inspiring event for you all. With e-commerce reaching all-time highs, I hope that each of us are inspired to continue connecting the dots and begin thinking about what is possible for our brand in the future to come. To help small businesses face and conquer challenges head on, I would like to offer our audience the first glimpse of Net Elixir's Preparing for a Cookieless World ebook. This ebook has just been released today, and it is your guide to succeeding in the cookieless world. So be sure to go to netelixir.com slash connect the dots to download your ebook. Before you go, if you scroll down a little lower to the bottom of this page, there is a survey. I would really appreciate it if you guys complete the quick survey at the bottom to let us know what you thought about today's event. All right, well, that concludes our event. On behalf of Team Netelixer, thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to meeting you in person at future events soon. Marv, is there anything you would like to add? Nothing, nothing pressing, Heather. Thank you. I, I just wanted to echo your points. You know, thank you to all the speakers, the partners, um, the crew at the back end, also just you know hosting this event and everyone that that took part of it today. Um, again, as if as Heather mentioned, you know, feel free to download that ebook. There's a lot of good takeaways from it. But if you need any anything from the Net Elixir team, we are very very open to have conversations with you about it. So with that, thank you again. Take care and, and enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah.